Reincarnation of the Strongest Sword God Chapter 2801 to Chapter 2850 Have fun reading as well as listening. Hey guys! Can I trouble all of you for a moment? Please don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell button so you won't miss new audiobook updates. That's all. Thank you. Chapter 2801, Combating a Tier 4 NPC He killed the NPC. How dare he? Everyone present was taken aback when they saw the head soldier bisected. Even Divine Shadow and Cleansing Flame had their mouths hanging wide open, neither of them having expected Sher Fong to take action. Moreover, not only did Sher Fong take action, but he had even directly killed an NPC soldier. This was simply. This guy is doomed. He's definitely dead. He actually killed one of Dragonheart City's NPC soldiers. This won't end with just a few weeks imprisonment. Dragonheart City was a neutral city. Hence, its management was much stricter than that of NPC cities and kingdoms and empires. Before the major system update took place, players who killed another player or NPC within Dragonheart City would not only be killed on the spot but also be prohibited from logging into the game for a month. And when they could log back into the game, they would lose 10 levels and have their souls placed into a weakened state for 10 days. This penalty would basically cripple a player's account. Now, not only did Shurfong commit murder after the system update, but the person he killed was even an NPC soldier. At this point, everyone no longer dared imagine what kind of punishment he would receive should he be killed or caught. Inkfeather and the other war blood members standing by the entrance were caught off guard by Shurfang's actions. How much courage does he possess? Inkfeather couldn't believe her eyes as she took in Shurfang's casual appearance. Did he lose his mind? She had thought of the possibility of Shurfang resisting the NPC soldiers and escaping. However, the possibility of him killing an NPC soldier had never occurred to her. Yet, Shurfong had executed this feat so decisively. As for Blood Oath, when he saw this scene, he became ecstatic. Good. As expected of the first player to get promoted to Tier 4. Blood Oath sneered. Unfortunately, today will be the day you fall. However, before everyone could recover from the surprise of seeing Shurfong kill the head soldier, Shurfong brandished the Abyssal Blade once more. The next moment, a galaxy of stars appeared around Shurfong and enveloped the 11 NPC soldiers remaining of the squad. Swords Orbit Damages exceeding 50 million appeared above the tier 3 NPC's heads one after another, the 11 NPC soldiers getting killed instantly. A bunch of useless fools. Do you think Dragonheart City's rules have any use against me? Shurfong said as he glanced at the fallen NPC soldiers indifferently. He then sheathed the Abyssal Blade casually as if he hadn't done anything to speak of. If it were before he had entered the Ancient God's Domain, he would still have to be wary of Dragonheart City's rules. However, he no longer had such worries now. At Shurfang's words, a deathly silence momentarily enveloped the surrounding area. He's nuts. He's definitely nuts. Who is this guy? He actually dares slaughter Dragonheart City's NPC soldiers. When the spectators saw Shurfang's actions, some felt crazed, some felt fearful, some felt excited, and some felt awed. One thing was for certain, though Shurfang's feat of killing 11 NPC soldiers in one go would be forever etched in their minds. Without a doubt, Shurfong was the most ruthless player in God's domain. The surrounding players became curious about Shurfang's identity. Meanwhile, when the silver-armored knight Sabred saw this scene, his eyes turned bloodshot, and the intensity of his aura skyrocketed. He no longer suppressed his aura, thoroughly displaying the power of a level 160, tier 4 NPC. His aura was so overbearing that everyone nearby shuddered involuntarily. Outrageous. You dare lay hands on the city defense knight legion. Don't even think of leaving this place alive today. Sabred bellowed as he leaped into the air. Simultaneously, the other NPC soldiers stationed at the entrance also took action, their numbers exceeding 100. We're really doomed this time. Divine Shadow despaired when he saw Sabred taking action. He couldn't understand why Shurfong had acted so rashly. Their group stood no chance against a level 160, tier 4 NPC, even though Shurfong was tier 4. After all, NPCs possessed not only higher basic attributes than players but also superior mana control. Their weapons and equipment were likewise superior to those of players in general. However, while Divine Shadow and Cleansing Flame were despairing over this matter, two voices of complaint entered their ears. Guild leader, you're too fast. That's right. You should have told us in advance if you were going to attack. At least give us some time to prepare. The next moment, both Lifeless Thorn and Solitary Nine took out their weapons in frustration, evidently intending to fight these NPC soldiers. Have they lost their minds, too? Divine Shadow and Cleansing Flame were on the brink of mental collapse at this moment. Shurfong was famous for being an arrogant guild leader, so while his reaction was shocking, it was still within the realm of expectations. However, what was up with the two players following Shurfong? Yuluo, though, did not appear surprised by Lifeless Thorn and Solitary Nine's actions. She, too, grabbed her staff and said quietly to Divine Shadow and Cleansing Flame, Vice Commander, Flame, wait behind us. I'll deal with the NPCs coming at us. IL-11 
Matthew Luo's words, divine shadow, and cleansing flame turned to the cleric in surprise and confusion. What had become of this world? Was this really the same Yuluo they knew? Seeing the two's horrified eyes, Yuluo smiled and consoled, don't worry. Nothing will happen. We're just dealing with a bunch of NPC soldiers. Out of everyone present, she reacted the calmest to Shifeng's actions. As she had reached Tier 4 herself, she understood quite well that Tier 4 powerhouses were no pushovers. Even the NPCs in the Ancient Gods domain didn't dare offend Tier 4 players. Yet, these Tier 3 NPCs in the Modern Gods domain actually dared do so. They were simply tired of living. After all, even the Kings of Kingdoms dared not casually offend Tier 4 powerhouses. She had to admit that while some NPCs had grown smarter after gaining conscious thought, some had grown dumber as well. Either that or pushing around Tier 3 players had become a habit for these Tier 3 NPCs, and they now assumed that the existence known as players were pushovers that didn't know how to retaliate. The fact that players still had the mindset that NPCs shouldn't be provoked had most likely contributed to this misconception as well. However, after experiencing life in the ancient God's domain, Yuluo understood very clearly that God's domain never had any absolute rules. The only absolutes were strength and status. In the ancient God's domain, instances of players killing NPCs occurred frequently. Even killing city lords wouldn't be a problem so long as one could bear the consequences and had the strength necessary to accomplish the feat. Hence, she found it laughable that Warblood thought it could rule over Dragonheart City without fear just because it had gained the support of an NPC force. Warblood was utterly ignorant of the fact that after players reached Tier 4, they would be living in a completely different world from Tier 3 players. At this time, Sabred had already arrived in the air above Shurfeng's group and was looking at Shurfeng with anger in his eyes. This was because even he hadn't expected that Shurfeng would dare kill the soldiers, furthermore, he would be held responsible for their deaths. Unable to hold back his anger, he bellowed, foolish heaven-blessed individual. Do you think nobody can punish you just because you've reached Tier 4? None of you will escape today. After saying so, Sabred unslung the snowy white greatsword he carried on his back and executed a slash at Shurfeng. A sword light shot at Shurfeng, leaving behind a black tear in space that extended hundreds of yards away. The power of this attack could heavily injure even a mythic monster of the same level. Tier 4 skill, Sky Splitting Flash. Well said. Looking at Sabred's approaching attack, Shurfeng said leisurely, however, you provoked the wrong person. After saying so, Shurfeng unsheathed the light of two worlds and brandished it. Chapter 2802, Power of Two Worlds. Swords Orbit. Boom. When the two attacks collided, a powerful shockwave spread to several hundred yards away. Even the nearby Tier 3 experts stumbled a few steps back, while the Tier 2 players went flying several dozen yards. He blocked it. Who is he? The spectating players were stunned when they saw Shurfeng still standing in his original position. Despite going up against a level 160, Tier 4 NPC's Tier 4 skill, Shurfeng was actually an even match, emerging from the exchange and scathed. At this time, let alone the spectators, even Sabred was surprised by this situation. Surprised. Looking at Sabred's slightly bewildered expression, Shurfeng smiled faintly and said, It seems that the vice commander of Dragonheart City City Defense Knight Legion only amounts to this much. However, despite saying such words, Shurfeng dared not be careless around Sabred. The light of two worlds had indeed increased his basic attributes and the power of his sword type skill significantly. Thanks to it and the several other fragmented legendary items he equipped, his basic attributes reached an astonishing level. Although he still wasn't a match for superior mythic monsters of the same level, he wasn't that far off, either. However, Sabred was at level 160, 20 levels higher than Shurfeng. In terms of basic attributes, Shurfeng definitely lost to Sabred by a large margin. Hence, the only way he could beat the NPC was by relying on his powerful mana and superior combat techniques. Boy, you are courting death. Sabred grew even more enraged at Shurfeng's words. Suddenly, the mana within a thousand yard radius began gathering around Sabred in a frenzy. It was evident that the knight had not used his full strength for the previous attack. After the gathered mana reached a critical point, Sabred instantly transformed into several dozen afterimages that surrounded Shurfeng. The NPC was dazzlingly fast. Tier 4 skill, Broken Shadow. At this time, even Shurfeng couldn't tell which of these afterimages was the real Sabred. It felt as if the NPC had truly split into several dozen clones of himself. Before Shurfeng could react, fiery runes appeared on Sabred's snowy white greatsword, the flames the runes gave off incinerating even space itself. Tier 4 Taboo Skill, Starfire Blade. The next moment, every one of Sabred's afterimages executed a slash. Despite the Starfire Blade being effective for only one attack in reality, Sabred had turned it into several dozen attacks. Amazing. As expected of a Knight Legion's Vice Commander. He actually managed to fuse his Tier 4 skills to such an extent. Sure Foam couldn't help being in awe when he saw the several dozen attacks coming at him from all directions. Combining two skills was much more difficult than combining two spells. However, so long as one succeeded, one could dramatically increase the effectiveness of the skills. Disappear. Sabred bellowed, the power that his weapon radiated skyrocketing even further. It was clear he had stopped holding back and planned to slay Shurfeng. 
Seeing the several dozen space-tearing greatswords approaching him, Sherfong held up his sword horizontally before him. Tier 4 Legacy Skill, Blade Domain Immediately, seven magic swords materialized around Sherfong. The magic swords then transformed into innumerable stars in his surroundings. Swords Orbit Boom. 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 A series of explosions and shockwaves blanketed the area in front of Dragonheart City's entrance. After several dozen clashes, the ground under Sherfong cracked, and the space around him shattered. His HP had fallen by more than 5 million as well, his HP bar falling by one-third of its capacity. He didn't die. Inkfeather's eyes widened in shock when she saw the amount of HP Sherfong lost, her mind refusing to believe this outcome. Sabred was a level 160, tier 4 NPC, moreover, he was the vice commander of one of Dragonheart City's Night Legions. His strength was above average even among tier 4 NPCs. With his combination of a tier 4 skill and a tier 4 taboo skill, he could inflict significant damage on superior mythic monsters of the same level. Yet, Sabred's attack had only taken one-third of Sherfang's HP. Amazing. The power of this fusion attack actually reaches the tier 5 basic rank. After taking a look at his remaining HP, Sherfang felt even greater admiration for Sabred. If he hadn't switched to the Light of Two Worlds, which raised all his sword-type skills by one level, he would have had to activate his Berserk skill to repulse Sabred's fusion attack. However, activating his Berserk skill would also mean that he had been pushed to his limits, on the brink of death. After all, Berserk skills weren't unique to players, NPCs had them as well. Boy, it seems you're quite sturdy. Sabred was inwardly astonished when he saw Sherfong still standing. He never imagined that a heaven-blessed individual could be so strong. However, this is the end for you. After saying so, Sabred raised his greatsword into the air. Immediately afterward, a dozen identical greatswords appeared around him, forming a magic array. Tier 4 Skill, Blade's Shadow. Tier 4 Taboo Skill, Sealing Void. The next moment, the dozen greatswords transformed into black holes that shot towards your phone. Upon seeing the black hole spanning several dozen meters, the nearby spectators, both players and NPCs, fell into despair. This was because they could already foresee that once these black holes collided with the ground, the impact would vaporize everything within several hundred yards. Sure enough, Tier 4 NPCs are no pushovers. However, this still isn't enough to get rid of me. Sure Fong smiled when he saw the descending black holes. Let's test this move on you. The next moment, Sure Fong tightened his grip on the light of two worlds and poured half of his mana into the weapon. Suddenly, crimson divine runes lit up all over the sword, releasing a dazzling and mesmerizing brilliance. As this dazzling light bloomed, a deathly silence enveloped the world around Sure Fong. Even time itself seemed to flow significantly slower. Subsequently, Sure Fong swung the light of two worlds at Sabred. World Breaker. Boom. A strange light instantly penetrated the descending black holes like a hot knife through butter before landing on Sabred. When the strange light disappeared, time began flowing normally again. Meanwhile, the black holes in the sky had all disappeared. As for Sabred, he had lost over half his HP from the attack, retaining only around 200 million HP, cracks had also appeared on the armor he wore, and fresh blood flowed out from all over his body. However, before Sabred could react, the slightly pale Sherfong had already arrived before the NPC. Not giving Sabred any time to catch his breath, Sherfong brandished the light of two worlds once more. Spatial Slash Swords Transmigration Although the fusion of skill and combat technique wasn't comparable to the fusion of skill and skill, the combination still increased the effectiveness of his skill significantly. The next moment, six sword lights tore through space and approached Sabred. Reacting quickly, Sabred held his great sword horizontally before him and activated the tier 4 defensive skill, Steel Fortress. The skill created a defensive barrier in front of him and increased his defense by 500% temporarily. One slash. Two slashes. Three slashes. Every one of Sherfang's attacks managed to slice through Sabred's defensive barrier without fail, but the barrier still bought Sabred enough time to defend against the attacks with his great sword. Boom. 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 The next moment, explosions echoed throughout Dragonheart Island one after another. Simultaneously, Sabred's HP fell time after time. When the last sword light collided with Sabred's great sword, the NPC got smashed into the ground at the speed of light, the impact creating a crater over a dozen meters deep. This last attack also zeroed Sabred's HP, and the knight passed away with a reluctant look on his face. Meanwhile, Sherfong, hovering in the air, saw his experience bar filling up rapidly. In no time at all, a golden glow enveloped him as his level rose from level 140 to level 141. However, nobody paid any attention to Sherfong at this time. Instead, everyone had their heads down as they gaped at Sabred's corpse lying in the crater. As if time had stopped moving, a deathly silence enveloped the entrance of Dragonheart City. Chapter 2803, God's Domain Strongest He died. A tier 4 NPC died, just like that. When the spectating players saw Sabred's dead body, they couldn't help doubting their eyes. Some of them even thought that the NPC was only playing dead and hadn't actually been killed. Blood Oath, standing by the entrance, also felt that the scene before him was fake. Sabred was the vice commander of one of Dragonheart City's powerful Night Legions. He stood at the peak among tier 4 existences. 
How could he possibly have been killed by a player? Of the spectating players present, the only ones who remained relatively calm at this situation were Lifeless Thorn, Solitary Nine, and Yu Luo. They didn't find it particularly surprising that Shurfong had killed Sabred. After all, Shurfong had already reached level 140. For tier 4 existences, a 20 level gap wasn't much of a difference. However, the three of them had never imagined that Shurfong would be able to kill Sabred so cleanly. The attack he used to injure Sabred heavily was especially amazing. If not for that attack, the fight between the two would have lasted much longer. Unlike Lifeless Thorn's trio, Divine Shadow, and Cleansing Flame had their mouths fall wide open when they saw this scene. Their minds clearly failed to process what had just happened. While everyone was struggling to accept the scene, reality poured a bucket of cold water over them. The next moment, several items actually appeared around Sabred's corpse. Of them, one was even the great sword Sabred used. The great sword hovered in the air, radiating an unparalleled aura. Upon being subjected to this aura, many of the tier 2 players felt an instinctive fear overwhelming their bodies. Only the tier 3 players fared better. A fragmented legendary weapon. Nobody knew who shouted this sentence. However, it snapped everyone out of their days, and they couldn't help ogling the snowy white weapon with glowing eyes. Some players even had the urge to charge forward and snatch it. However, before anyone could step forward, Shurfong had already arrived beside Sabred's body, the aura he radiated scaring everyone into retreating. The pressure Shurfong gave off was simply too powerful. Even though he had already retracted his mana domain, everyone still felt stifled, none of them daring to look him in the eye. As for the fragmented legendary weapon, none of the players present dared entertain any thoughts of it now. After all, Shurfong had just killed a level 160, tier 4 NPC. A single thought from him was probably more than enough to kill players like themselves. For a time, the tens of thousands of players and NPCs standing in the vicinity quietly watched Shurfong collect the items Saber dropped one after another. If I can become like him one day, my life would be complete. Let alone becoming like him, I can most likely walk around Dragonheart Island fearlessly with even half of his strength. As the adventure team players spectating the fight from the distant port watched Shurfong collect Sabred's loot, a sense of yearning and admiration awoke in their hearts. They also grew excited beyond words. The fact that Shurfong had managed to slay a tier 4 NPC right in front of Dragonheart City, a large neutral city, definitely made him God's domain's strongest player. In fact, most likely, nobody would believe them even if they described this scene to others. Nonetheless, they had managed to witness this miraculous feat how could their blood not boil in this situation. However, amid everyone's excitement, Shurfong suddenly disappeared. Before anyone realized it, Shurfong had already reappeared in front of Blood Oath, catching Blood Oath and the three peak experts protecting him off guard. Commander Blood Oath, we meet again, Shurfong said with a faint smile. I'm sure you know why I came here. Although Shurfong spoke in a calm tone and was even smiling, Blood Oath and the others paled as if they had just seen a ghost. Black Flame. You'd best not mess around. Doing his best to calm his anxious heart, Blood Oath glared at Shurfong and added in a low tone, This is already inside Dragonheart City. Moreover, now that you've killed Sabred, neither Dragonheart City nor Secret Hand will spare you. If you know what's good for you, you'd best leave now. You'll be dead once the City Lord or the City Defense Legion's commander arrives. On Dragonheart Island, players would suffer entirely different penalties depending on whether they had fought inside or outside Dragonheart City. The fight with Sabred had been outside the city. Hence, even though Shurfong had killed Sabred, the penalty he would suffer wouldn't be particularly severe. After all, the area outside the city wasn't subject to the city's protections. Even if a fight took place right outside the city's entrance, the city's NPC soldiers would, at most, move to stop the fight. They wouldn't detain the offenders at all. This was also why Sabred and the other NPC soldiers dared take the initiative to persecute Shurfang's group before. However, Blood Oath's current position was inside Dragonheart City. If Shurfang killed him now, the severity of his crimes would be on a whole other level. Is that so? Smiling, Shurfang unsheathed the Abyssal Blade and brandished it. Three sword lights shot out from his weapon and instantly plundered the lives of the three peak experts standing around Blood Oath. Even when their bodies hit the ground, none of the three had realized what had happened. Shurfong then turned to Blood Oath and asked, What about now? You. How dare you? Blood Oath was thunderstruck when he saw his three subordinates killed. Everyone else in the vicinity also saw the scene without missing a detail. Crap. Awesome. This is awesome. Black Flame. He must be Black Flame, right? He actually killed three of War Blood's peak experts right in front of Blood Oath, and Blood Oath doesn't even dare make any strange moves. Am I dreaming? Everyone felt their blood boil with excitement when they looked at Blood Oath, who dared not move a muscle in front of Shurfong. Their worship of Shurfong rose to a whole new level. Blood Oath was known throughout God's domain. After all, he was a big shot that even the superpowers had to submit to on Dragonheart Island, an existence standing at the peak of Dragonheart Island. Nonetheless, Blood Oath looked no different from an ant in front of Shurfong. This situation was simply crazy. It was so crazy that they couldn't even react to it. However, shortly after the crowd began bubbling with excitement, three figures suddenly descended from the sky and landed at the entrance. Every one of these figures exuded an aura much stronger than that of Sabred. Upon seeing these figures, Blood Oath reacted as if he had seen his savior. 
He looked at your phone and laughed. Black Flame, you are finished. Now that the Vice City Lord and two Knight Commanders have arrived, you shouldn't even think of leaving this place alive. One of the three new arrivals was none other than Cruz, Dragonheart City's Vice City Lord. He was a level 180, tier 4 great wizard, a big shot standing at the top of God's domain. According to rumors, he was only half a step away from tier 5 and could even contend against demon princes of the same level. As for the two other figures, one of them was Shara Viria, the commander of the Holy Star Knight Legion and one of the World Tower's protectors. She was a bona fide level 200, tier 5 great holy knight. The last person was Landrek, the commander of the City Defense Knight Legion. He was a level 180, tier 4 sword emperor. Although he was the weakest among the group of three, he was still significantly stronger than Sabred. This was because Landrek owned Earth and Glory, a genuine legendary spear. With this weapon, he was fully capable of contending with tier 5 existences of the same level. With these three NPCs around, even a tier 5 player wouldn't be able to escape. Chapter 2804, Difference in Status Why did all these big shots show up? The players present gasped when they saw Cruz, Sheraviria, and Landrek at the entrance. They never thought that Shurfang's fight would attract so many NPC powerhouses. After all, players normally couldn't meet even one of these big shots. Nevertheless, three of them now appeared. Protector Sheraviria, in particular, was one of the apex powerhouses of God's domain. In the absence of tier 6 gods, she would be part of the strongest group of existences. This was because not only was Shara Viria a tier 5 NPC, but she even owned two legendary items, the Galaxy Sword and Bulwark of Light. She had slain dozens of demon kings, elven royalty, and void demons before. Even if a tier 5 player existed now, they would simply be seeking death if they tried challenging her. The next moment, Blood Oath walked up to Vice City Lord Cruz's side quickly, then pointed at Shurfong and said respectfully, Lord Vice City Lord, not only did this ruffian kill Vice Commander Sabred, but he even killed my companions inside the city. You must punish this ruffian and protect Dragonheart City's order. Blood Oath spoke in a sonorous and powerful voice, his words echoing throughout the entrance. It sounded as if he was pronouncing the death sentence on Shurfong. Upon seeing the arrival of the three NPCs, Inkfeather breathed out a deep sigh of relief. When she looked at Shurfong again, a hint of glee appeared in her eyes. Let's see how you get out of this situation. When the other players present saw this scene, they couldn't help shaking their heads dejectedly. With three of Dragonheart City's NPC powerhouses here, it was most likely impossible for Shurfong to escape with his life. Just when everyone thought another battle would break out, Cruz, the white-bearded old man standing beside Blood Oath, spoke up. A Dragon Slayer. I never thought I would get to see one in my lifetime, and such a young one at that, Cruz said, a faint smile appearing on his face. It seems times are changing. The Vice City Lord's words rendered everyone present stunned and confused. What Dragon Slayer? Blood Oath was similarly stunned by Cruz's words. He couldn't figure out what the Vice City Lord was getting at. Instead of punishing Shurfong as soon as possible, the NPC brought up the topic of Dragon Slayer out of nowhere. Just what was this NPC trying to do? You overpraise me, Lord Vice City Lord. Turning to look at Cruz, Shurfong said, My friends and I just got lucky to slay a dragon that had yet to enter adulthood. No, no. A dragon is a dragon. Your accomplishment of slaying a tier 4 infant dragon while being a tier 4 yourself is something even Lady Shara never achieved, Cruz countered, shaking his head. If not for you, Lady Shara wouldn't have left the World Tower to come here in person. Cruz's words left Blood Oath dumbfounded. Shara Viria actually came here not because Shurfong had killed Sabred but merely to take a look at Shurfong. At this time, let alone Blood Oath, most of the other players nearby were stupefied as well. What was going on with this situation? When Divine Shadow and Cleansing Flame saw this scene, they were at a complete loss for words. They felt as if they were living in a completely different world from Shurfong. Not only had Shurfong killed the City Defense Legion's Vice Commander, but he also had subsequently killed three of Warblood's peak experts inside the city. Nevertheless, Dragonheart City's Vice City Lord was chatting with him as if none of these offenses had ever occurred. At this time, among the spectating players, only Lifeless Thorn, Solitary Nine, and Yuluo knew why this was happening. The Dragon Slayer title wasn't just a title. It symbolized the accomplishment of a legendary feat in God's domain. With this title, no matter which NPC City one visited, one would enjoy a status close to that of the City Lord. For someone with such a status, killing a couple of provocateurs wouldn't be a problem at all. The only reason Sabred had dared act rudely to Shurfong was his low standard, which prevented him from seeing through the Black Cloak's concealment effects. Otherwise, let alone provoking Shurfong, he wouldn't even have dared speak casually around Shurfong, knowing that Shurfong was a dragon slayer. After glancing at Lifeless Thorn and the other two Tier 4 players standing at a distance, Shara Viria turned to Shurfong and asked softly, Young Dragon Slayer, are you and your companions willing to serve as the Holy Star Legion's honorary knights? Honorary knights? The Holy Knight's words caught Shurfong slightly off guard. However, a moment later, he replied without hesitation, It is our honor. In an NPC Knight Legion, the position of Honorary Knight was second only to the position of Commander. In the absence of the Commander, an Honorary Knight even had the authority to mobilize the Legion. Moreover, despite not being bound to the Knight Legion, an Honorary Knight would still enjoy various privileges and benefits from the Knight Legion. Meanwhile, the Holy Star Knight Legion was the Knight Legion tasked with protecting the World Tower. 
Compared to other Knight Legions, one could gain even more benefits as an honorary Knight of the Holy Star Knight Legion. In the past, countless Tier 4 and Tier 5 experts had sought to join the Holy Star Legion. However, due to the Legion's strict requirements, less than 10% of the Tier 4 experts had gotten chosen and become an official member of the Legion, let alone becoming an honorary Knight. Hence, the fact that Sheraviria was offering to let them become honorary Knights greatly exceeded Sherfang's expectations. Good. You are now members of the Holy Star Knight Legion. Fight to protect the rules of the World Tower. Sheraviria nodded approvingly as she looked at Sherfang. You can head to the World Tower to collect your honorary badge afterward. As soon as Sheraviria finished speaking, she vanished from everyone's sight. This. Blood Oath was dumbfounded by this situation. He never thought that Sheraviria had come here just to meet your phone. Moreover, she hadn't even mentioned a single word about Sabred, as if Sabred was merely an insignificant insect. Before Blood Oath could snap out of his daze, Vice City Lord Cruz walked up to your phone. Congratulations, young dragon slayer, Cruz said happily. It has been 50 years since Lady Shara last conferred the Holy Star Legion's honorary knight position to anyone. Even Commander Landrek is still challenging for that position. Upon seeing Cruz speaking with Sherfong so amicably, the surrounding players felt their worldviews fragmenting. They simply couldn't figure out what exactly Sherfong had done to garner the appreciation of these NPC powerhouses, so much so that they even ignored the killing of Sabred, the City Defense Legion's vice commander. The next moment, just as Blood Oath was about to say something, Sherfong cut him off, saying, Lord Cruz, when my companions and I were trying to enter the city before, this person here accused me of being suspicious and instigated Vice Commander Sabred to provoke my group. May I know if it is possible to imprison him as punishment? Black Flame. You're slandering me. Blood Oath panicked at Sherfang's words. Hurriedly, he explained, I have done no such thing. It was Lord Sabred himself who decided to do so. The people around us can testify for me. At this time, Blood Oath already understood that Vice City Lord Cruz had no intention whatsoever of pursuing Sherfang for Sabred's murder. Moreover, now that Sherfang had gained a very high position in Dragonheart City, if Blood Oath did not withdraw from this place immediately, he would definitely suffer. Do you mean that I, an honorary knight of the Holy Star Legion, am lying? Sherfang asked, smiling as he looked at Blood Oath. As soon as Sherfong finished speaking, Cruz nodded and looked at Blood Oath. He then said sternly, regardless of whether your words are true or false, you have slandered one of the Holy Star Legion's honorary knights. For this offense, you will be imprisoned for 15 days as punishment. No. This is unfair. He clearly attacked first. Blood Oath was startled by this turn of events. He never thought that Sherfong would play such a hand. However, it was useless to resist. Glaring at Sherfong, he bellowed, Black Flame, I'll make you pay for this. The Secret Hand Association won't let you off, either. Get out of prison first, then talk. Smiling nonchalantly, Sherfong said, Rest assured, once you get out, everything outside would have already ended. The Secret Hand Association indeed possessed a lot of Tier 4 NPCs. On the other hand, he was no pushover, either. This was especially true now that he was an honorary knight of the Holy Star Knight Legion. The association would have to think twice before they tried anything against him. The Holy Star Knight Legion was both the manager and protector of the World Tower. The Secret Hand Association would be suicidal to attack him inside the World Tower. As for Dragonheart Island's surrounding sea zones, he rarely visited these areas normally. At most, he would be sailing by. Moreover, once the seal on Dragonheart Island was lifted, he could outright teleport to and from the island. Before Blood Oath could say anything more, a squad of level 160 soldiers came and escorted him away. How ruthless. Is this the status and influence Tier 4 powerhouses possess? Tier 4. I must get promoted to Tier 4. So, this is Zero Wing's Black Flame. He's even more amazing than the rumors. I wonder if Zero Wing is recruiting Tier 2 players. If I can join such a guild, I won't have to worry about anything in Dragonheart City. When the surrounding players saw NPC soldiers bundling off Dragonheart Island's most feared man, they were taken aback by Sherfang's capabilities. They also understood why Sherfang had not killed Blood Oath outright. Compared to the penalty of dying once, the consequences of getting imprisoned for 15 days were much more severe. This was especially true now that Sherfang had gained such a high status in Dragonheart City. For him, 15 days was more than enough to bring down the Warblood Adventurer team. Meanwhile, all Blood Oath could do was watch as all of this happened. At this time, everyone present could already foresee Zero Wing standing at the peak of Dragonheart Island. Our problem has been resolved. After watching Blood Oath getting taken away, Sherfong returned to Divine Shadow and the others. Smiling, he said, we can enter Dragonheart City now. In response, Divine Shadow and Cleansing Flame nodded their heads stiffly. Even now, they still found it difficult to believe what had happened. Just a moment ago, War Blood had been at the apex of its power. Yet, with only a few words from Sherfong, it now faced the threat of dissolution. Meanwhile, news of this situation spread like wildfire. In only a matter of minutes, it entered the ears of everyone in Dragonheart City. The news caused an especially large commotion among the city's various guilds and adventurer teams. Chapter 2805, Fame Shakes Dragonheart City, What Did You Say? Black Flame killed a Tier 4 NPC and even got Blood Oath imprisoned for 15 days. 
When the various guilds and adventure teams operating in Dragonheart City heard of Shurfang's miraculous feat, they were thunderstruck. They repeatedly pressed the reporting personnel for confirmation regarding the validity of this information. As if having expected such a reaction, the reporting personnel promptly sent a battle video of Shurfang killing Saber to their respective superiors, as well as videos of Shurfang killing three of Warblood's peak experts right in front of Blood Oath and of NPC soldiers dragging Blood Oath off to prison. Dragonheart City, Bloodstone Bar A group of level 123 plus, tier 3 experts had gathered in this bar. Of the group, even the weakest person was at the refinement realm standard. There were also more than a dozen peak experts and four apex experts. Meanwhile, seated at the head of this group was none other than Elder Wu, one of Thirteen Thrones' founders. Thousand, are you sure this information is correct? Elder Wu couldn't help feeling skeptical as he read the report from a woman shrouded in a layer of black mist. This was because Thousand Lives' report was simply too astonishing. After all, the reason their group was currently operating so secretively was Warblood. Nevertheless, Elder Wu was being told that Warblood was finished. Moreover, its destruction was due entirely to Zero Wing's guild leader, Black Flame. How could he possibly believe this? It is 100% true. Many powers already have designs on Warblood's territory. If not for Warblood still retaining some contact with Secret Hand, they would have most likely taken action already, Thousand Lives insisted in a determined tone. Moreover, according to the information I collected, Heaven's Blade appears to have formed a close relationship with Black Flame. If Zero Wing has Heaven's Blade's full support, I'm afraid it won't be long before Zero Wing occupies a significant portion of Dragonheart City's various resources. What is Black Flame thinking? He actually has the leisure to come to Dragonheart City. Is he not worried about the deteriorating situation over at the Twin Towers Kingdom? Elder Wu, who wore a somewhat haggard expression, was surprised by Thousand Lives' words. Simultaneously, he was confused as to how Shurfong had grown so terrifying this rapidly. The fact that Shurfong had killed a Tier 4 NPC without any repercussions and imprisoned Blood Oath with just a few words proved that he already stood at the top of Dragonheart City in terms of status. He was now in existence that Dragonheart City's various powers had to look up to. Yet, according to Elder Wu's information, Zero Wing's operations over at the Twin Towers Kingdom were in dire straits. At this stage of the game, complete Tier 3 legacies were of utmost importance to the various superpowers. These legacies would allow them to go up against the NPC forces. Hence, over 20 superpowers were currently harassing Zero Wing's operations in the Twin Towers Kingdom with peak experts every day. While these superpowers were going up against the Alliance of Zero Wing, Unyielding Soul, and Crimson Emperor at Sky Spring City, they had also dispatched many members to head to the Secret Covenant Tower from the neighboring NPC cities. To prevent these players from flooding into the Secret Covenant Tower, Zero Wing's Alliance had stationed a large number of personnel on the routes to the tower. Thus far, battles between both sides involving over 100,000 players had already occurred five times, while battles involving several tens of thousands of players had occurred more than 20 times. In the most recent battle, Starlink and Miracle had even joined in the fray and dispatched a total of four Tier 4 experts. Fortunately, Zero Wing's side had dispatched three Tier 4 experts to counter. One of them was the commander of Zero Wing's main force, Fire Dance, one was Unyielding Soul's Vice Guild Leader Unyielding Heart, and one was Crimson Emperor's Vice Guild Leader Illusory Words. As for Black Flame, he was nowhere to be seen. In regard to this situation, everyone was confused as to why Black Flame sat out this battle. This battle had thoroughly shaken the entire God's Domain. It was the first one involving multiple Tier 4 experts since God's Domain's launch. By the end of this battle, a large portion of the Glacial Lake Plain, where the conflict took place, had been reduced to a barren wasteland. Although the fight had ended in Zero Wing's victory, if not for Zero Wing's powerful war weapons, such as the Crimson Dragon flying ships, combat puppets, and advanced barriers, the outcome would have been different. Moreover, the increasing rampancy of NPC forces had forced the various superpowers to conserve a significant portion of their forces. However, Zero Wing, Unyielding Soul, and Crimson Emperor were no longer in a good state. The three guilds had suffered tremendous losses due to the protracted war. This was especially true for Zero Wing. After all, unlike Unyielding Soul and Crimson Emperor, Zero Wing had no background to rely on whatsoever. Knowing this, the various superpowers had also put in a lot of effort to whittle Zero Wing to death as quickly as possible. The actions the various superpowers took included poaching Zero Wing's experts and cutting off Zero Wing's income sources. Zero Wing's loss of income sources in the real world had put the guild in an especially difficult position. Most importantly, the various superpowers had also blocked Zero Wing's equipment and material sources. Although it wasn't a complete embargo, the various superpowers had jacked up the prices of equipment and materials to absurd levels. Now, just producing a piece of level 120 mysterious iron equipment cost 30 gold coins. If it were before, 30 gold would already have been more than enough to produce a piece of level 120 secret silver equipment. In addition, the various superpowers also purchased all of the level 110 plus secret silver equipment and above from the market, leaving nothing for Zero Wing, Unyielding Soul, and Crimson Emperor. After the many battles fought, the equipment stockpile of the three guilds should already be bottoming out. Meanwhile, without good weapons and equipment, how were their members supposed to fight? A player fully equipped in secret silver equipment would have more than a 20% advantage in basic attributes over a player fully equipped in mysterious iron equipment. Needless to say, the gap with players fully equipped in fine gold equipment would be even greater. Moreover, without proper weapons and equipment, the three guilds members would also have more difficulty grinding in the secret covenant tower. 
At this time, Thousand Lives suddenly received a message from one of her subordinates. After reading it, she said, I just received insider information from War Blood. It seems Black Flame's actions have affected even Secret Hand's control over the World Tower, so Secret Hand plans to teach Black Flame a lesson. However, since Secret Hand can't do anything against him on Dragonheart Island, it plans on partnering with Starlink to wipe out Zero Wing's forces in the Twin Towers Kingdom. Interesting. Black Flame really knows how to cause trouble. However, this is also a good opportunity for Thirteen Thrones. A good opportunity. Thousand Lives parroted, confused by Elder Wu's words. Looking at Thousand Lives and the male ranger standing beside her, Elder Wu said, Thousand, Rain, you two follow me. Everyone else, continue resting here and wait for our return. Yes, sir, everyone responded respectfully. Afterward, Elder Wu secretly left the Bloodstone Bar together with Thousand Lives and Modern Rain. Elder Wu, where are we going? Shouldn't we be heading to the fourth underground floor as planned? Thousand Lives asked curiously as she looked at the pleasantly smiling Elder Wu. We won't be going there for now. We have something more important to do, Elder Wu replied. Something more important. Having thought of something, Thousand Lives asked in surprise, are we going to partner with Zero Wing? Partner. Shaking his head, Elder Wu said, we don't need to partner with Zero Wing. We will just be giving Zero Wing an opportunity to defend the Secret Covenant Tower. Defend the Secret Covenant Tower? How is that possible? Thousand Lives couldn't help doubting Elder Wu's words. It might be fine if Starlink and the various superpowers were the only ones targeting Zero Wing. However, the situation was different now that the Secret Hand Association had joined the fray. At that time, who knew how many Tier 4 NPCs the Association would send to deal with Zero Wing? With the forces Zero Wing currently had in the Twin Towers Kingdom, defending the Secret Covenant Tower would be utterly impossible. Seeing Thousand Lives as doubt, Elder Wu smiled and asked, but what if Zero Wing has a city building order? Elder Wu, do you plan on selling that city building order to Zero Wing? Realization immediately dawned upon Thousand Lives. The city building order was an incredibly rare item. Thus far, even Thirteen Thrones had managed to acquire only two. And as the guild had already used one of these two orders, it only had one left. With the city building order, players could construct a guild city in any kingdom or empire they wished. If Zero Wing could establish a guild city right beside the Secret Covenant Tower, then its ability to control the tower would increase significantly. Combined with its Tier 4 combatants, Zero Wing would have a much better chance of defending the tower. Whether I sell it or not will depend on Zero Wing's sincerity. Elder Wu said, smiling. Upon hearing Elder Wu's words, Thousand Lives shook her head and smiled. At the same time, she also pitted Sher Feng slightly. Since Elder Wu grasped Zero Wing's lifeline, he would definitely take a huge bite out of Zero Wing. This was especially true now that Sher Feng stood at the apex of Dragonheart City. Elder Wu, according to our investigation, Black Flame is currently inside that wanderer's shop, Modern Rain said as he pointed at a tattered, three-story shop some distance ahead. Good. We'll go meet with guild leader Black Flame now. Elder Wu nodded. He then made his way to the Wanderer's shop together with Thousand Lives and Modern Rain. Chapter 2806, The Astonishing Zero Wing Dragonheart City, Wanderer's Shop When Elder Wu's group of three entered the shop, a magnificent sight instantly entered their eyes. The scenery within the shop was a stark contrast to its dilapidated facade. What's going on here? Thousand Lives was astonished as she inspected the space within the building. This place looks completely different from the last time I visited. On her previous visits to the Wanderer's shop, the building's interior had looked as dilapidated as its exterior. And while the shop sold excellent items, everything here was absurdly priced. If one weren't in a hurry to obtain a specific item, one wouldn't come here to shop. Now, not only had the shop's interior become splendid, but the shop's area had also expanded from a cramped room to half a basketball court. The number of items on display had doubled, and the item quality was drastically better. Now, almost everything on display was a precious treasure. Tier 3 Magic Scrolls Master Potions Alchemy Gold the alchemy gold, in particular, was a treasure of alchemy. It could increase not only the success rate of forging by 15% but also the basic attributes of the forged item by 10%. Moreover, it was even effective in the production of epic weapons and equipment. However, alchemy gold was impossible to find on the market. Players could obtain it only from ancient ruins, alchemy gold was even rarer than epic items. Nevertheless, the wanderer's shop had a total of 10 ingots of alchemy gold for sale. Moreover, they were only on the first floor right now. The Wanderer's shop had three floors, and the value of the products sold in the shop increased with each subsequent floor. In other words, the products on the first floor were the lowest in quality. Rain, take a look around afterward. If you see anything we need, buy it. Elder Wu instructed Modern Rain. When he saw the items sold in the shop, even he was moved. The items sold here were indeed exceedingly expensive, with the cheapest item priced at 20 ancient gold and valuable items like the alchemy gold priced at 1000 ancient gold. However, most of the items sold here were nigh impossible to purchase in the outside world. Besides, Thirteen Thrones was in urgent need of items such as Alchemy Gold. After the major system update, monsters became much more difficult to deal with. Previously, Tier 3 teams could cope with Grand Lord ranked monsters, even with just fine gold weapons and equipment. 
Now, however, Tier 3 teams needed to be fully equipped in Dark Gold weapons and equipment. Moreover, the team's MT would need to have two or three pieces of epic equipment. Otherwise, tanking a Grand Lord would be incredibly tough without help. Needless to say, the requirements for raiding mythic monsters were even higher. Players could no longer rely on just their combat standards to defeat powerful monsters. They also needed epic weapons and equipment to support them. Otherwise, the benefits of exploring level 120 plus maps weren't worth the cost. Meanwhile, Alchemy Gold increased the success rate of producing epic weapons and equipment. In the hands of an advanced master forger, success was almost guaranteed. Moreover, the produced item would also have a 10% boost to its basic attributes. Yes, sir. Modern Rain nodded after snapping out of his daze. Elder Wu's group proceeded to the second floor. And upon seeing the items displayed there, Modern Rain very nearly drooled. This was because the second floor actually sold epic items. Although these epic items weren't weapons or equipment, they were still incredibly rare and useful. Confinement Crystal, Epic Consumable Seals a 2000 yard radius and lowers the basic attributes of all enemies within the magic array by 40%, 25% for tier 4, for 2 hours. Wind Manipulating Rope, Epic Item Increases the movement speed of land mounts by 15% and flying mounts by 25%. The display of epic items was simply dizzying. With a single glance, they discovered at least 60 epic items. What rendered them speechless were the prices. Even the cheapest epic item cost 1500 ancient gold. However, they had to admit that these epic items were all things the various powers desired. Aside from epic items, all sorts of excellent tools required by lifestyle players were also available, such as a set of dark gold alchemy tools. The only problem was that the set cost 5000 ancient gold. After Elder Wu and the others browsed through the items sold on the second floor, they felt as if they had just walked into a treasure house. Every item on sale here moved their hearts. Unfortunately, the more astonishing an item was, the more astonishing its price was. With just the 60,000 ancient gold they had on hand, they could purchase only a few items from this floor. Just as Elder Wu's group was about to head to the third floor to take a look, a lithe figure suddenly blocked their way. The frightening aura this person exuded instantly subjected Elder Wu and the others to powerful pressure. No outsiders are allowed beyond this point, Yu Luo said softly to Elder Wu's group. If you wish to shop here, you can do so only on the first and second floors. When Thousand Lives and Modern Rain saw Yu Luo, they couldn't help doubting their eyes. Tier 4 A bona fide Tier 4 Cleric both Thousand Lives and Modern Rain recognized Yu Luo. After all, Yu Luo had been one of Heaven's Blade's team leaders. Simultaneously, she was one of the few peak experts operating on Dragonheart Island. Only, they never thought that Yu Luo would get promoted to Tier 4 already. After all, anyone capable of getting promoted to Tier 4 at this stage of the game had the full support of an entire guild. Yet, Yu Luo, a cleric who had gone missing one month ago, had actually reappeared now as a Tier 4 cleric. This was simply unbelievable. Little Missy, may I know if you are the one running this wanderer's shop? Elder Wu couldn't help asking the question on his mind. No, this shop is run by guild leader Black Flame. I am only managing this place on his behalf, Yu Luo said, shaking her head. Black Flame runs this place. Elder Wu was stunned. In its current magnificent state, the Wanderer's shop was most likely worth a million ancient gold or more. Elder Wu might have believed it if Heaven's Blade owned this place. After all, Heaven's Blade had been operating on Dragonheart Island for a long time now. However, he was told that Shifeng actually owned this shop. How could he swallow such a tale? While Elder Wu was stunned, Thousand Lives quickly reacted, asking, We are from Thirteen Thrones. We are acquainted with guild leader Black Flame, and we currently have business to discuss with him. Can we meet him now? I'm afraid you will have to wait a while, Yu Luo said, shaking her head. Over a dozen of Dragonheart Island's powers are currently discussing business with guild leader Black Flame, so it isn't appropriate for you to enter now. However, you won't have to wait too long, either. I believe they will be done in another dozen minutes or so. Over a dozen powers. Elder Wu was slightly surprised. He never thought that so many of Dragonheart Island's powers had already made a move. All right. We'll wait. Elder Wu had expected that some of Dragonheart Island's powers would try to meet with Shifeng since Shifeng was basically the overlord of Dragonheart Island now. It was only natural for guilds and adventurer teams to try to partner with Zero Wing. However, Elder Wu wasn't too worried about these other guilds and adventurer teams. After all, unlike them, Thirteen Thrones had the city building order, something Zero Wing urgently needed, as a bargaining chip. After waiting for around a dozen minutes, Elder Wu's group saw more of Dragonheart Island's local powers arrive and join them waiting on the second floor. Among these powers was the Four Saints Society, a super guild that was equal in strength to Thirteen Thrones, represented by its first vice guild leader, Intoxicated Drunkard. He was a monster with the title of Strongest Shield of the Sea. Unlike other superpowers, though, the Four Saints Society had focused its development entirely on the sea. Its naval strength now rivaled that of the five great super guilds. Intoxicated Drunkard's arrival surprised even Elder Wu. 
However, as the various powers observed each other, Yu Luo, who had been quietly standing guard by the staircase, suddenly said, Guild leader Black Flame just finished his discussions with the first batch of powers. You may now go upstairs. Will everyone be going together? Thousand Lives asked. They wanted to negotiate with Sure Foam in private. A group negotiation was out of the question. That's right. There are too many powers seeking to meet with Guild leader Black Flame. Holding private discussions would take too long. Yu Luo nodded. If you wish to meet with Guild leader Black Flame privately, you can return a few days later. You people. Thousand Lives grew a little angry at Yu Luo's words. They were representatives of 13 thrones, a super guild. They had already shown plenty of respect by waiting here for over a dozen minutes. Yet, their treatment was no different from what the other powers here received. Thousand, it doesn't matter. We'll enter together if we have to, Elder Wu said, chuckling. He then continued in a whisper, Black Flame really knows how to play his cards. He knows the various powers are bringing various partnership offers and business deals to him, so he's basically having everyone compete with each other. At the same time, he gets to choose the best deal. Unfortunately, our proposal is something Black Flame will not be able to refuse. After giving the matter some thought, Thousand Lives nodded in agreement. In any case, Sherfone would still have to beg them for help. It wouldn't matter whether they negotiated privately or in a group. In this situation, the Four Saints Society's group remained silent. It was evident that they were also confident in their proposal. Meanwhile, upon seeing the situation, Yuluo smiled and said, Please enter. After Yuluo finished speaking, the representatives of the dozen or so powers present made their way up to the Wanderer's shop's third floor. However, upon arriving on the third floor and seeing the items displayed here, everyone nearly had their eyes fall out of their sockets. Level 120 to level 130 Dark Gold Set Equipment Designs Level 100 plus Epic Equipment Designs Advanced Magic Array Designs Advanced Shop Construction Design Advanced Hotel Construction Design Master Ice Fire Bomb Design Each and every item displayed here was something that couldn't be found easily in the outside world. However, the items were also astonishingly expensive. Even the cheapest cost 6,000 ancient gold enough money to purchase a relatively good plot of land in Dragonheart City. However, while the gathered group was agog over the items available on the third floor, a sense of oppression suddenly enveloped everyone, making them feel incredibly uncomfortable. This sense of oppression originated from the two cloaked men standing beside your phone. Tier 48 Why are there even more Tier 4s? Both Elder Wu's group and Intoxicated Drunkard's group were shocked by the situation. First, it was Heaven's Blade's Yuluo. Now, two more Tier 4 players actually appeared behind Shifone. Moreover, the two men's auras were much stronger than that of any of the Tier 4 players they had come across before. Tier 4 players currently stood at the very top of God's Domain's player hierarchy. Having one Tier 4 player would already allow a player force to gain a stable foothold in the game's currently chaotic state and become an object of fear for the various superpowers. Shifone currently had three Tier 4 players on his side. Including Shifone and Fire Dance, this meant Zero Wing had a total of five Tier 4 players under its command. This caliber of strength was simply maddening. Even the five great super guilds were unlikely to have as many tier 4 players as Zero Wing did. Meanwhile, after scanning the crowd before him, Shifong said calmly, Everyone, if you have something to say, please say it directly. I still have many matters to attend to, so I truly do not have time for beating around the bush. Chapter 2807, Three Star Wanderer's Shop Shifong's statement was like a hammer that struck everyone's mind. For a time, those intent on negotiating with Shifong to maximize their own profits were nonplussed. Even Elder Wu, who had come here brimming with confidence, was momentarily at a loss for words. Shifeng's display of power was simply too astonishing. Zero Wing's strength had severely exceeded Elder Wu's expectations. The four Tier 4 players here in this Wanderer's shop plus the three Tier 4 experts over at the Twin Towers Kingdom meant Zero Wing had a total of seven Tier 4 players on its side. With such strength, even NPC forces would find dealing with Zero Wing tough. While the gathered crowd suspected that Shifeng was trying to instill fear into them by showing off his power, Shifeng himself didn't think he was doing such a thing at all. This was because he was truly busy. Initially, Shifeng planned to contact Heaven's Blade's commander after entering Dragonheart City. However, for some reason, Divine Edge and the others couldn't contact Zvi, not even through offline means. This situation temporarily prevented Zero Wing and Heaven's Blade from furthering their partnership, and it severely affected Shifeng's plans. Fortunately, Divine Shadow had agreed to gather up the remaining Heaven's Blade members and put Heaven's Blade under Zero Wing's banner in the meantime. Now, Heaven's Blade was barely considered an adventurer team subordinated to Zero Wing and had to obey Shifeng's arrangements. Dragonheart Island's various powers had long since split Heaven's Blade's territories inside the World Tower among themselves after the adventurer team disbanded. However, where Blood's Fall granted Dragonheart Island's various powers a new opportunity to gain more territory. Hence, Shifong had tasked Divine Shadow with snatching War Blood's territory first. After all, these territories were important sources of ancient coins. He couldn't keep Heaven's Blade's members fed for free. 
Aside from territories inside the World Tower, Heaven's Blade also had over a dozen shops in key locations inside Dragonheart City. Sure Foam planned on bringing some of Candlelight's products to sell in these shops. As for the land surrounding the World Tower, due to Zvi's absence, Divine Shadow could only delegate one medium-sized land to Zero Wing with his authority. What this land would be used for was entirely up to Sure Foam. However, half of the profits the land generated would have to be split with Heaven's Blade. After all, there were still plenty of people in the adventurer team that needed nurturing. Sure Foam had no opinion in regard to this situation. On the contrary, he was very happy to secure the management rights of a medium-sized land. After all, Zero Wing's members also had to explore the World Tower. The hotel built on a small-sized land was hardly enough for Zero Wing's purposes. A medium-sized hotel would alleviate the guild's pressure. Hence, Sherfone needed to arrange what kind of hotel to construct. Aside from this, Sherfone also received another piece of good news when he entered Dragonheart City. The Wanderer's shop was eligible for promotion to three-star status. Originally, he had only planned to have the Wanderer's shop purchase some epic materials and the precious materials necessary to construct the small mobile fortress. He never thought that in the time he was away, the Wanderer's shop would actually meet the conditions for promotion to three-star status. So long as a Wanderer's shop reached three-star status, it would undergo a qualitative transformation. Hence, Sherfone had decisively spent 30,000 of the ancient gold the Wanderer's shop had earned during his absence, and upgraded the shop to three-star status. However, before he could even check out the three-star Wanderer's shop specifics, Dragonheart City's various powers had come looking for him already. This forced him to push back his schedule and negotiate with these profit-hungry powers seeking a share of Warblood's corpse. Meanwhile, after silence enveloped the room for a short moment, intoxicated drunkard, the Four Saints Society's vice guild leader, stepped forward. Guild leader Black Flame, I understand that Zero Wing is planning to partner with Heaven's Blade to annex all of Warblood's resource spots. However, although Blood Oath is currently imprisoned and Warblood is in chaos, Warblood's backer, the Secret Hand Association, is not to be trifled with. With Secret Hand's presence, annexing the 17 resource spots Warblood holds on the fourth underground floor will be difficult. Of course, I believe that with your strength, annexing those resource spots shouldn't be a problem, however, maintaining them will be. Such a task will require a large number of experts, it can't be done with just a few tier 4 experts. Hence, the Four Saints Society wishes to partner with Zero Wing to go against War Blood and Secret Hand, intoxicated drunkard said confidently. Once we annex all of War Blood's resource spots on the fourth floor, each of our sides will take half. Of course, we won't let Zero Wing give up these resource spots for nothing. After saying so, intoxicated drunkard took out a city building order from his bag. The Four Saints Society understands that Zero Wing is currently having difficulty defending the Secret Covenant Tower. However, with the city building order, Zero Wing can instantly construct a guild city beside the tower. With this guild city to fall back on, Zero Wing should have a much easier time repelling the various superpowers. In addition, the Four Saints Society will also trade various rare materials and level 110 plus secret silver weapons and equipment with Zero Wing. We will sell these items to Zero Wing at market value. May I know what you think of this, Guild Leader Black Flame? When Intoxicated Drunkard took out the city building order, the other powers representatives were dumbfounded. This situation also made many of the powers seeking to partner with Zero Wing despair. The Four Saints Society was a super guild, only a few powers operating on Dragonheart Island could match its resources, manpower, and background. Even setting aside the fact that the Four Saints Society was a super guild, just the city building order alone made it impossible for the various powers present to compete with the Four Saints Society. This was because the city building order was what Zero Wing currently needed the most. At this time, a gloomy expression appeared on Elder Wu's face. He never thought that the Four Saints Society would have a city building order too. This would undoubtedly increase the competition. After the silence in the room had stretched for some time, Sherfone swept a glance at the various powers' representatives. May I know if anyone else has something to say? If not, I will have to ask you to leave. I still have to continue detailed discussions with Vice Guild Leader Drunkard, Sherfone said in a calm tone. However, his interest in the city building order was obvious to everyone present. Upon seeing the situation, intoxicated Drunkard smiled in satisfaction. He was very confident in the success of the partnership this time, as he was certain Zero Wing wouldn't be able to resist the city building order's temptation. Hence, he had paid no heed to having to attend negotiations together with the other powers. What should we do now, Elder Wu? Thousand Lives asked anxiously. The World Tower's fourth underground floor was crucial for them to search for Tier 4 legacy lands. The influence of a Tier 4 player was not something Tier 3 players could hope to match. Every addition of a Tier 4 player could increase a guild's overall strength by a large margin. Simultaneously, Tier 4 players were crucial in resisting the invasion of NPC forces. For the current super guilds, Tier 3 players were no longer the thing they lacked the most. After all, they had the required foundation and resources to nurture a large number of high-caliber experts. Even without complete Tier 3 legacies, it was only a matter of time before these experts reached Tier 3. As proof of this point, not one of the superpowers attempting to wrestle control over the Secret Covenant Tower was a super guild. Only super first-rate guilds, which were lacking in foundation and resources, were contending for the tower. However, the World Tower's fourth underground floor, which could reliably generate Tier 4 legacy lands, was a different story. Moreover, the World Tower still had the fifth underground floor and beyond. The chances of Tier 4 legacy lands appearing in these locations were most likely even higher. 
However, if a power did not possess a base of operations on the fourth underground floor, exploring the even more dangerous fifth underground floor would be utterly impossible for this power. Just as the various powers representatives were about to turn around and leave, a deep voice resounded in the room. Wait a minute. Guild leader Black Flame. Suddenly, Elder Wu said, 13 Thrones plans on partnering with Zero Wing as well. Moreover, the conditions we offer will not be any inferior to the Four Saints Societies. After saying so, Elder Wu also brought out a city building order. Crap. Another city building order. The representatives of the various powers present gasped at this situation. The city building order was an incomparably rare item, no less rare than fragmented legendary items. Meanwhile, it was many times more valuable than fragmented legendary items. After all, there was no way a fragmented legendary item could compare with an entire guild city. When Elder Wu took out a city building order, intoxicated drunkard's complexion darkened slightly. This is interesting. What should have originally been a monopoly has now become a two-sided competition. I wonder how Black Flame will decide. Both parties are super guilds, and neither is weaker than the other. Moreover, both have their own advantages as well. The various powers representatives couldn't help their curiosity as they looked at Elder Wu and intoxicated drunkard. They wondered how Sure Phone would proceed in this situation. By stating that 13 thrones would match the four saints society's offer, Elder Wu was basically hinting to intoxicated drunkard for their two guilds to avoid competing with each other. That way, they could maximize the profits from Zero Wing. Simultaneously, his words also compelled Sure Phone to make a decision. Sure Phone should choose to partner with either 13 thrones or the four saints society. If Sure Phone refused to choose one, then negotiations would not proceed. Naturally, intoxicated drunkard quickly picked up on Elder Wu's intentions. Hence, he remained silent and simply looked at Sure Phone. Evidently, he planned on taking the same stance as Elder Wu. It seems both of you came with sincerity for cooperation. Sure Phone smiled as he looked at the two city building orders before him. Unfortunately, I cannot agree to any of your conditions. Chapter 2808, Sure Fang's Conditions You can't agree. What do you mean by that, Guild Leader Black Flame? Elder Wu and Intoxicated Drunkard were confused when they heard Sure Fang's response. Similarly, the representatives of the other powers present were stunned by Shifeng's words. Originally, they thought that they would see an intense clash between 13 thrones and the Four Saints Society, and Zero Wing would decide how to settle the fight. Yet, Shifeng had outright rejected both guilds. What was going on here? Is Black Flame trying to teach Elder Wu an intoxicated drunkard a lesson for banding together? Probably. After all, Zero Wing isn't faring that well over at the Twin Towers Kingdom. It definitely needs a city building order. If I were in Black Flame's shoes, I would probably do something like this too. After all, that's half of the fourth floor's resource spots as well as fortresses and tier 4 legacy lands. Trading away all these things just for one city building order is simply absurd. Although the two super guilds offered to help garrison the resource spots, that kind of help is inconsequential. With Black Flame's status and deterrence on Dragonheart Island, there's no way anyone would dare have any designs on Warblood's resource spots and fortresses. As the various representatives discussed Shifeng's actions and realized his aim, they couldn't help admiring him for his wisdom. He had thoroughly placed both super guilds in a bind with this move of his. After all, both the Four Saints Society and Thirteen Thrones were incredibly desperate to produce Tier 4 players. This was because a few super first-rate guilds had already produced Tier 4 players, yet these two super guilds had not produced one even now. In terms of top combatants, the two guilds had already fallen way behind their peers. Hence, the two guilds' desperation for Tier 4 players. Otherwise, with the status of these two super guilds, they wouldn't take the initiative to seek cooperation with Zero Wing at all. While the onlookers were discussing quietly among themselves, Sure Phone looked at Elder Wu and Intoxicated Drunkard and said, Please do not misunderstand. I see your sincerity in this matter. However, a city building order isn't particularly urgent for Zero Wing. In fact, you can even say that we don't need it. Don't need it. Elder Wu and Intoxicated Drunkard smiled subconsciously when they heard Sure Feng's words. May we know what you need most now, Guild Leader Black Flame. The two of them felt that Sure Phone was basically treating them like three year old children. If he were the guild leader of any other guild, they might actually believe these words. After all, a guild city would only increase the number of strongholds a guild owned by one. However, with NPC forces currently running rampant, having one additional stronghold meant that a guild would have to spread its forces even thinner, which was indeed an incredibly troublesome matter. In the case of Zero Wing, though, these words were blatant nonsense. However, Elder Wu and Intoxicated Drunkard knew that it wouldn't be appropriate for them to call Sure Fong out on his lie, so they decided to play along with him. Manpower. Ignoring the act the two people before him were putting on, Shifeng laughed and said, You two might not believe me, but what Zero Wing lacks now is only manpower. We do not lack anything else. If your two guilds really wish to partner with Zero Wing and acquire World Tower's fourth underground floor's resource spots, take out some real sincerity. Truth be told, the city building order was something Shifeng could do without. A small mobile fortress was basically half a city. Not to mention, an ordinary guild city wouldn't suffice to let Zero Wing exert complete control over the secret covenant tower. Only a fortress could do that. 
This was because a guild city was more focused on defense than offense. A guild city mainly served as a place for players to rest and trade. At best, it could provide some benefits to the players heading into the Secret Covenant Tower. It couldn't actually prevent other powers from forcing their way into the tower. In the end, Zero Wing would still have to rely on its own strength to accomplish this feat. This just so happened to be something beyond Zero Wing right now. However, it was a different story for a small mobile fortress. Mobile fortresses possessed great defensive capabilities and were top-tier war weapons. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to become the overlords of the sky. Manpower Elder Wu and Intoxicated Drunkard nodded slightly at the same time. Although they found Shifeng's words more agreeable now, they still felt he was putting on an act. The two of them then exchanged looks and came to a tacit understanding. Since Shifeng insisted on acting, they would play along and see how long Shifeng could keep doing so. Smiling, Intoxicated Drunkard asked, May I know how you plan on having our two guilds cooperate with you, Guild Leader Black Flame? Simple. I just need your two guilds to supply me with 300 advanced forgers, 200 advanced alchemists, 500 advanced architects, 100 advanced magicians, and two master magicians. I'll also need 10,000 tier 3 players. Lend these people to me for half a month, Shifeng said, chuckling. If you can agree to that, I will give you two of Warblood's small fortresses. When Shifeng finished speaking, Elder Wu and Intoxicated Drunkard were stunned. They couldn't understand Shifeng's purpose. Not only did he not want their city building orders, but he was even asking for a large number of lifestyle players. Although Shifeng had also asked for 10,000 tier 3 experts, the various superpowers already had around 50,000 tier 3 expert players on average at this stage of the game. Lending 10,000 tier 3 experts wouldn't be a problem for their two super guilds. On the contrary, the conditions Shifeng offered were incredibly advantageous to their two guilds. With a small fortress on the World Tower's fourth underground floor, their two guilds could reside on the fourth floor in the future. Simultaneously, they would have the necessary foundation to explore the fifth underground floor. May I know your thoughts on this? Shifeng asked, smiling. City building order. The fourth underground floor small fortresses. Tier 4 Legacy Lands These things were inconsequential to his present self. So long as he had the small mobile fortress, nobody in God's domain would be able to threaten Zero Wing. Not even Tier 4 players. The only problem was the massive scale of the small mobile fortress's construction, which required a considerable amount of manpower. It wasn't something he could accomplish easily by himself. Initially, he had been considering having all of Candlelight's lifestyle players halt their work and focus on constructing the small mobile fortress. He never imagined that two super guilds would send themselves to his doorsteps. Is what you say true, guild leader Black Flame? Intoxicated drunkard asked skeptically. You can rest assured on this point. We can sign a contract for this. Your two guilds will be free to capture the two promised fortresses, and Zero Wing will not lay a finger on them. I can even stop Secret Hand's NPCs from interfering with your two guilds, Shifeng said with a sincere smile on his face. Upon hearing Shifeng's words of assurance, Elder Wu said without hesitation, In that case, I agree to your offer on behalf of Thirteen Thrones, Guild Leader Black Flame. What super guilds lacked the least was manpower. Even though Shifeng was asking for quite a lot of manpower, it was well within their tolerance. The Four Saints Society has no problem with this arrangement, either. Intoxicated drunkard said, an indescribably happy smile appearing on his face. For the Four Saints Society, being able to gain one of Warblood's small fortresses just by loaning some manpower was an incredibly profitable trade. It was much better than surrendering a precious city-building order. As for the threat of the Secret Hand Association, just one word from Shifeng would most likely prevent any of the Association's Tier 4 NPCs from setting foot in the World Tower. After all, the Holy Star Knight Legion was both the protector and manager of the World Tower. Prohibiting NPCs that attacked players from entering the World Tower would be an easy task for the Knight Legion. Without the Secret Hand Association, the only Tier 4 combatant war blood would have on its side would be Autumn Plant. While he would still pose a problem, the Four Saints Society and Thirteen Thrones could handle him. S was. Upon seeing the situation, the other powers' representatives grew envious. They never thought that Shifeng would offer such loose conditions to the two super guilds. Nonetheless, fulfilling these conditions was still impossible for the other powers. Setting aside the large number of lifestyle players Shifeng sought, just the condition of 10,000 tier 3 experts was already beyond them. Only the superpowers had the ability to do so. Elder Wu and Intoxicated Drunkard signed a contract with Shifeng on behalf of their respective guilds right away. According to the contract, Thirteen Thrones and the Four Saints Society would lend the stated manpower to Shifeng for half a month. Moreover, all operations for this half a month had to be kept a secret. After signing the contract, the two super guilds promptly summoned the necessary manpower to Dragonheart Island. This was because the contract would take effect only after all the required manpower was assembled and transferred to Shifeng. Before that, their two guilds shouldn't even think of capturing Warblood's small fortresses. Having concluded negotiations with the two super guilds, Shifeng finally had some free time to himself. 
Inside the quiet third floor, Shifeng took out the several items he acquired from killing Sabred and began inspecting them. Previously, he had been too busy to inspect Sabred's loot. Now that he had finished his tasks, he could finally take a proper look at them. Sabred had been the vice commander of Dragonheart City City Defense Legion, a level 160, tier 4 NPC, and an executive of the Secret Hand Association. Nobody would believe that he had only one fragmented legendary item on him. Chapter 2809, Half a Step Away Sabred had dropped a total of six items. Aside from the fragmented legendary greatsword Demonic Shadow, the five remaining items looked very ordinary. In fact, they looked so normal that Shifeng was confused when he first stored them in his bag. This was because the five items appeared to be a set. Of the five items, four were mirrors made entirely of crystal. However, unlike the fragmented legendary greatsword, these four mirrors did not radiate a frightening aura. More precisely, they did not even have a hint of aura. They looked ordinary beyond ordinary. As for the fifth item, it was an ink black crystal the size of a basketball. Like the four crystalline mirrors, this crystal ball was similarly indescribably ordinary. It did not radiate even a whiff of mana. Interesting. Realization flashed in Shifeng's eyes as he looked at the ink black crystal ball and four crystalline mirrors placed before him. If I didn't take a closer look at them, I would never have thought these five items actually had a magic disguise. The standard of this disguise is also absurdly high. It is definitely at the half-step Grandmaster standard. In God's domain, apart from special items, players needed to use the appraisal skill on most items to inspect their information. However, there was also another type of item that was outside of this category, and that was magically disguised items. Items that had magic disguise used on them would have their information concealed. Using the appraisal skill on these items would show that they were no different from ordinary garbage. However, applying a magic disguise on an item was a complicated process, and even a master magician would need several hours just to complete a master magic disguise's magic array. Needless to say, placing a half-step grandmaster magic disguise would be even more tedious. And worse, the disguise would disappear whenever the disguised item was used. One would have to apply a new magic disguise to disguise the item again. Thus, magically disguised items were incredibly rare in God's domain. Most players wouldn't even come across one throughout their career in God's domain. And if players did come across such an item, they would often treat it as garbage and dispose of it. However, Sabred was both the vice commander of Dragonheart City City Defense Knight Legion and a level 160, tier 4 NPC. In God's domain, Dragonheart City could be considered a kingdom. In terms of status, the neutral city rivaled imperial capitals. Hence, despite being only the vice commander of one of Dragonheart City's Knight Legions, Sabred's status was higher than even that of magistrates that managed the various kingdoms' main cities. In addition, Sabred was also an executive of the Secret Hand Association, the strongest NPC force on Dragonheart Island. If one were to say that an NPC like Sabred had dropped a bunch of odds and ends, let alone sure phone, even ordinary players wouldn't believe it. Of course, perceiving such a high-level disguise wasn't an easy task. Let alone the standard appraisal skill, even Shifeng's omniscient eyes would allow him to see only the cover information of a disguised item. Only those with great mastery over magic arrays would notice that an item was magically disguised. The five items placed before Shifeng were precisely magically disguised items. On the surface, these five items looked ordinary and unremarkable. If not for Shifeng's in-depth understanding of the operating principles of mana, he wouldn't have noticed anything wrong at all. Thank goodness I'm already an advanced master magician. Otherwise, I really wouldn't have noticed such an exquisite disguise. Looking at the five items, Shifeng couldn't contain his elation as he studied the disguise. While it was possible for one to remove a magic disguise forcibly, that option should only be a last resort because doing so would damage the disguised item. Not to mention, the removal of a magic disguise was a process favored by all magicians. The removal of a magic disguise was an opportunity for a magician to improve their knowledge since the removal process tested a person's knowledge and control over magic arrays. One would have to locate the fixed mana roots and identify the manipulation method of the magic array to remove the disguise. This was why players seeking to improve their knowledge of magic arrays would usually purchase disguised items from magic shops. Only, the more profound a magic disguise was, the greater their price and rarity. Magic disguises at the master rank and above were especially rare. This was partly because master magicians could earn much more money through selling other magic arrays. Moreover, creating these other magic arrays took much less time than the master magic disguises magic array did. Creating master magic disguises simply wasn't cost effective. Subsequently, the seconds and minutes passed by rapidly. While Shurfong attempted to undo the disguise, three hours elapsed in the blink of an eye. He had started with manipulating six independent strands of mana simultaneously to trigger the magic array's mana nodes, then gradually increased that number to twelve. Shurfong had to admit that a half-step Grandmaster magic disguise was truly profound. Even after he had switched to manipulating 16 strands of mana simultaneously, he managed to trigger only 60% of the magic array's mana nodes. This isn't right. There are over a thousand mana nodes on this thing. If I merely follow the predetermined mana roots, I doubt I can trigger every mana node even if I control 32 strands of mana simultaneously. The more Shurfong studied the half-step Grandmaster magic disguise, the more he found it to be amazing. The creation of this thing had already exceeded the limits of the human mind. Although it was only simple mana manipulation, the degree of multitasking required to fully activate it put him in a huge bind. 
He simply couldn't get all of the magic arrays 1000 plus mana nodes running simultaneously with his current standard. Afterward, Sherfone earnestly inspected the magic disguise once more. He had a vague feeling that he had found a pattern, but he couldn't tell what it was exactly. Immediately, he took out a crystal of souls from his bag and consumed it to calm and empty his mind. One hour. Two hours. Four hours. Before Sherfone realized it, he had already spent half a day scrutinizing the magic array's mana nodes. I see. Every several dozen of these nodes form a small magic array, and some of the nodes on these small magic arrays connect with other small magic arrays. If I start my attack from the crucial nodes, I should be able to save myself a lot of trouble. After thinking up to this point, Sherfone began manipulating the magic array's mana once more. This time, though, he started with the mana nodes with the highest repetition rate. Completion rate 20%. 40%. 60%. 80%. 90%. 80%. When the disguise magic array lit up, Sherfone grew ecstatic. However, his joy wasn't just from cracking the magic array. It was also because his understanding of magic arrays had further improved and he finally grasped the difference between advanced master magicians and half-step grandmaster magicians. The sound of glass shattering echoed in the room. Subsequently, the undisguised crystalline mirror made the space within the room incomparably cold and heavy. What powerful mana. Even for Sherfone, this was the first time he had felt such strange and heavy mana. It felt as if the object before him wasn't an item but an ancient god instead. In fact, he even had the misconception that the energy flowing around him was no longer mana but a more terrifying energy that carried great destructive power. If not for him having reached tier 4 already, he might have lost consciousness just from being subjected to this oppressive energy. Crap. Who was this sabred? Sherfone was dumbfounded when the crystalline mirror's statistics appeared in front of him. Chapter 2810, World Mirror Sherfone had considered many possibilities for the item sabred dropped. He had even entertained the possibility that one of the disguised items might be a damaged legendary item. After all, killing a tier 4 NPC inside Dragonheart City was incredibly difficult. Had Sabred not taken the initiative to leave the city's boundaries and stood inside the city instead, the odds of Sherfone killing the NPC would have been zero. This was because Dragonheart City's defensive magic array strengthened all allied NPCs within the city. Unless Sabred violated Dragonheart City's laws, the other NPCs within the city would have immediately come to Sabred's assistance as soon as Sherfone attacked him. In fact, Sheraviria could have saved Sabred as Sherfone was about to land the killing blow. After all, all tier 5 NPCs were capable of world creation. One shouldn't underestimate Sheraviria simply because she arrived at Dragonheart City's entrance by flying to the scene slowly. If she wished, she could have moved from the World Tower to the city's entrance in the blink of an eye. Looking at the crystalline mirror in his hand, Sherfone began speculating about Sabred's identity. This was because this item didn't belong in the hands of a minor character. Turning to the three other crystalline mirrors and the ink black crystal ball, Sherfone smiled involuntarily. According to rumors, only those who succeed in conquering an empire can obtain the world mirror. Yet, I actually got it from a tier 4 NPC. I doubt anybody would believe me if I told them about this. The World Mirror Also known as the Space Mirror, the World Mirror was a treasure passed down since ancient times. It wasn't something the modern gods' domain could produce. This was because the World Mirror originated from ancient gods. Even creating a replica of it was impossible. These items were treated as national heirlooms by the various empires. Without taking control of an empire, players wouldn't be able to obtain a world mirror at all. Of course, the world mirror Sherfone acquired from Sabred wasn't complete. The world mirror was a set of 12 mirrors and one control core. He would have to gather all 13 components to complete it. A complete world mirror could seal the sky, lock the earth, and move space itself. One shouldn't compare the world mirror to a simple sealing barrier, the world mirror was far more than that. It could not only seal a designated space but even transform the sealed space into a world of its own. Even tier 5 existences shouldn't think of breaking out of this miniature world. Within the boundaries of this miniature world, a hostile existence's strength would plummet. Tier 5 existences would be fortunate to exhibit 30% of their strength while subject to the world mirror's suppression, existences below tier 5 would fare even worse. The world mirror possessed an incredible range. Once activated, it would have no problem sealing an area encompassing several large maps. In the past, unless a tier 6 god-ranked expert took to the field, any player forces that possessed a world mirror had been unstoppable within the territory protected by their world mirror. Even tier 6 experts had their combat power weakened significantly under the world mirror's influence. This was also why super guilds with several tier 6 experts had sometimes been helpless against the territories of top-ranking first-rate guilds with only one tier 6 expert defending them. The world mirror Sherfone possessed was incomplete, so it couldn't create a world of its own. Regardless, this incomplete world mirror would still be considered a priceless treasure by any guild. It was far more valuable than even legendary items. This was because even an incomplete world mirror boasted many incredible effects. One example would be its ability to move a guild city to any desired location. Aside from that, if Sherfone bound this incomplete world mirror to the core magic array of a guild city, the said guild city would be immediately promoted to basic main city. A complete world mirror could elevate a guild city to the status of an advanced main city. Most imperial capitals were merely advanced main cities. Holy cities, one level above advanced main cities, numbered less than a handful in the modern gods' domain. 
Meanwhile, a holy city was something that couldn't be conquered without tier 6 gods. Anyone who attacked a holy city without a tier 6 god on their side would only be seeking their own deaths. It wouldn't matter how many tier 5s they had. This was because one of the conditions for promotion to holy city was the world mirror's protection. Even having multiple tier 5 existences garrisoning a city wouldn't suffice to meet a holy city's defensive requirements. Now that Sabred had dropped such a treasure, how could your phone not be shocked and confused? Although I don't know who exactly this NPC is, now that I have the world mirror, I can adjust my development plan. Various thoughts occurred to Shirfong as he looked at the world mirror. Even though this world mirror was incomplete, it could still exhibit astonishing effects. He couldn't create a holy city now, but he could still create a main city. If Zero Wing gained a main guild city at this stage of the game, it would do wonders for the guild. The footprint of a main city was three times that of an advanced city. In terms of defense, a main city could easily withstand the attacks of tier 4 existences. Most importantly, at the main city standard, a guild city would have no problem establishing itself almost anywhere in God's domain, aside from forbidden lands. It wouldn't have to worry about defending against monster tides. While Shirfone was debating which of Zero Wing cities he should bind the world mirror to, he suddenly received a message from Intoxicated Drunkard. Guild leader Black Flame, both our guilds have already gathered the people you require in Dragonheart City. In a slightly eager tone, Intoxicated Drunkard asked, when will you come to receive them? Already. This news surprised Shirfone. Looking at the time, he saw that only half a day had gone by since the contract signing with the two super guilds. With Dragonheart City still sealed, teleporting into the city was impossible, hence, traveling to Dragonheart City would be difficult for players. Needless to say, assembling so many lifestyle players in Dragonheart City would be even more difficult. He had anticipated having to wait at least two days, yet the two super guilds had fulfilled their end of the bargain in just half a day. Their efficiency was truly superb. Of course. Smiling proudly, intoxicated drunkard said, you shouldn't forget that our two guilds have focused on maritime development, guild leader Black Flame. This much is still within our capabilities. Okay. I'll head over right away. Nodding, Shirfong stored the world mirror and promptly left the wanderer's shop to receive the two super guilds people. A group of 20,000 tier 3 experts and several thousand lifestyle players would attract anyone's attention. However, as Elder Wu and intoxicated drunkard understood Shirfang's thoughts very well, they did not conduct the handover in Dragonheart City. Instead, they chose to do it outside the city. This way, the transaction would be sub Rosa, and Shirfong wouldn't have to worry about his intentions getting exposed. Guild leader Black Flame, all of the manpower you requested is here. These people will follow your command for the next half month. Moreover, they have also signed a contract that prohibits them from leaking information on the task they have to do, intoxicated drunkard said, smiling as he pointed at the tens of thousands of players standing in the valley behind him. Now that we've fulfilled our end of the contract, may we know when our two guilds can head to the World Tower. Their two guilds urgently needed the fourth underground floor small fortresses. After all, the sooner they occupied the fortresses, the sooner they could start searching for tier 4 legacy lands. Otherwise, they wouldn't have expended so much effort to bring all these people to Dragonheart City in such a short time. Looking at the anxious expressions of intoxicated drunkard and thousand lives, Shirfong chuckled and said, you can begin capturing the fortresses now. I have already notified Yuluo about it. She is also an honorary knight, and she will keep an eye out for war blood and secret hand inside the world tower. If secret hand dares to try anything, they won't get away with it. So, you can do as you wish inside the tower. In that case, thank you, guild leader Black Flame. Intoxicated drunkard's eyes glowed brightly when he heard Shirfang's reply. I still have matters to attend to, so I'll take my leave first. Thousand Lives similarly departed in a hurry after thanking Shirfong. After the two guild executives left, the remaining members of the two super guilds looked at Shirfong in a daze, wondering what Shirfong planned on having them do afterward. Everyone, follow me. I'm afraid you'll be very busy for the upcoming period. After glancing at the tens of thousands of players in the valley, Shirfong nodded and led them to a nearby island. He then set up a ceiling barrier there to prevent anyone on the island from contacting the outside world. This barrier also prevented players from going offline. Anyone who wished to log out of the game would have to leave the barrier first. Three days later, on a barren island nearby Dragonheart Island. With a face full of excitement, Solitary Nine flew up to Shirfong, who was drawing a magic array inside a humongous steel fortress. Commander, I just received news from Dragonheart City. Starlink and Miracle have begun taking action. Should we head over now? After completing the core magic array, Shirfong breathed out a deep sigh. Those guys sure moved quickly, Shirfong said, chuckling. Fine. I'm done here as well. Have Thorn get ready on his side. We're returning to the eastern continent now. Yes, sir. Solitary Nine nodded, his eyes shining with excitement. Chapter 2811, Changes to Sky Spring City. Twin Towers Kingdom, Sky Spring City. Accompanied by several bright flashes, three cloaked figures appeared in the city's teleportation hall. These three figures belonged to none other than Shirfone, Lifeless Thorn, and Solitary Nine. The sight of a massive crowd of players greeted the trio upon arrival. At a glance, they could estimate that the building held over 10,000 players. The place looked much more prosperous than even the teleportation hall of the Twin Towers Kingdom's royal capital. 
The majority of the players present were Tier 3 and sported guild emblems belonging to various guilds. These players all radiated a cold killing intent, which created a strange atmosphere inside the teleportation hall. Why are there so many guild experts here? Solitary 9 was surprised as he took in the surroundings. Even Dragonheart City's teleportation hall is far from comparable to this place. From what Solitary 9 could tell, quite a few of these Tier 3 experts were at the Refinement Realm standard. Even among the superpowers, Refinement Realm experts were treated as core members. However, he counted more than 500 Refinement Realm experts just in the teleportation hall alone around the number of Refinement Realm experts an average superpower possessed. Friends, you must have just arrived in the Twin Towers Kingdom, right? I'll have you know that this day might very well go down in the history books of God's Domain, a robust, Tier 3 Berserker said, smiling as he walked out of the teleportation array. This Tier 3 Berserker had reached level 122. He was fully equipped in level 120 fine gold equipment and carried a level 120 dark gold axe on his back. Based on equipment alone, he could rank among the top of Tier 3 players. Moreover, this Berserker did not wear a guild emblem. This meant he was an independent expert. Being able to secure himself such high-quality equipment was a testament to his capabilities. The dozen or so players following after the Berserker possessed similar equipment standards. Since everyone in the group had a white lion symbol marking their equipment, they evidently were members of the same adventure team. Go down in God's domain's history. Stunned by these words, Solitary 9 asked curiously, Friend, we have indeed just arrived in this kingdom. Do you mind telling us what's going to happen here today? Our White Lion Adventure team just received news of this as well. It seems that Starlink somehow managed to recruit the help of some Tier 4 NPCs, and these NPCs captured around a dozen guild executives from Zero Wing, Unyielding Soul, and Crimson Emperor during a fight at a blockade. These guild executives are currently imprisoned in Starlink's residence, the robust Berserker said. Starlink has announced a crusade against Zero Wing's blockade at the Secret Covenant Tower and is calling for all powers to gather in Sky Spring City. Starlink is also demanding the three guilds remove the seal on Sky Spring City. Otherwise, it's going to use the captured executives as a sacrifice as an opening gambit. I heard that besides Zero Wing's alluring Summer and Shadow Sword, even Unyielding Soul's Vice Guild leader Mu Lingsha and Crimson Emperor's up-and-coming talent Blue Gown were captured. If the three guilds don't concede, Starlink will have the Tier 4 NPCs kill these people using a method that will harm their souls. Not only will these people suffer increased death penalties, but they will also enter a weakened state for a long period. There's even a possibility that their accounts will get crippled. Upon hearing the Berserker's words, Sher Fong frowned slightly. He never thought that the Secret Hand Association's Tier 4 NPCs would actually interfere in this matter. How bold of Starlink! It dares wag its tail in Zero Wing's territory and even use the three guilds' executives as a sacrifice. Sher Fong sneered. I know, right. But you have to admit that Starlink is no longer the same as before. Rumors have it that Starlink has three Tier 4 players, as well as several superpowers backing it. Now, it even has an NPC force supporting it. In terms of influence on the Eastern Continent, even the five great super guilds can't compare to Starlink now. The robust Berserker nodded. As our White Lion adventurer team is quite well known in the Twin Towers Kingdom, we received an invitation to take part in the Crusade. Hence, we decided to come to expand our horizons. Moreover, I heard that the three guilds' executives would be making an appearance as well. If negotiations sour, it will definitely lead to the biggest battle in God's Domain's history. I see. Sher Fong nodded. After listening to the Berserker, Sher Fong roughly understood what Starlink was planning. Simply put, Starlink was trying to show off its strength with this operation. One of its reasons for doing so was to deal with Zero Wing, Unyielding Soul, and Crimson Emperor. Another reason was to present itself as an existence rivaling the five great super guilds. Hence, it had invited so many powers to take part and witness the operation. Friends, Sky Spring City is a mess right now. If you're trying to enter that rumored Secret Covenant Tower, I'm afraid you visited the wrong city. Moreover, many superpowers are keeping a close eye on the tower right now. If independent players like ourselves are not careful, we might get treated as one of the three guilds members. If that happens, things will get troublesome. Looking at Sher Feng's group of three, the robust Berserker cautioned, you might get killed, if you're lucky, or captured, if you're unlucky. So, it's best to be careful. Thank you for the warning, Sher Feng said. After Sher Feng finished speaking, he left the teleportation hall with Lifeless Thorn and Solitary Nine. After Sher Feng's group departed, a male youth from the Silver Lion Adventure team looked at the robust Berserker in confusion and asked, Boss, why did you start talking to those strangers all of a sudden? It's nothing. I just thought that those three felt extraordinary. The more friends you have, the more options you have in life. It hasn't been easy for our adventure team to grow to its current state. If we manage to befriend some experts, it will only benefit us, the robust Berserker replied, chuckling as he looked at the departing figures of Sherfang's group. Also, that cloak swordsman looks quite familiar, though I can't remember who he is at the moment. Extraordinary. Familiar. Snickering, the youth said, Boss, everyone who visits Sky Spring City is at Tier 3. Which one of them isn't an expert? It's also normal to think that you've met someone familiar. After all, everyone looks mostly the same while wearing a black cloak. Honestly, I doubt that those three are anything amazing. After all, they came here without even knowing about the crusade. They also didn't receive an invitation from Starlink. They are probably experts from some backwater city. Experts were a dime a dozen in God's domain nowadays. However, only a small portion of these experts could make a name for themselves. 
Meanwhile, any of such experts operating in the Twin Towers Kingdom and the neighboring countries would have received an invitation from Starlink. The fact that Sherfang's group didn't prove that they were only ordinary experts unworthy of the White Lion Adventurer team's attention. Meanwhile, outside the teleportation hall. Commander, are we going there now? Lifeless Thorn asked when he saw that Sherfang wasn't heading for Zero Wing's residence. Starlink has invited experts from all over for a crusade and is even planning on using Zero Wing's executives as sacrifices. How can I not go there to congratulate it? Sherfang said, rolling his eyes at Lifeless Thorn. Sherfang made his way to Starlink's magnificent and luxurious residence that stood on the city's main street. Chapter 2812, Storm Brewing at the Residence Sky Spring City, Starlink's Residence At this time, Tier 3 experts were thronging to Starlink's residence, which occupied an area equivalent to two sports stadiums. Before Sherfang's group of three could arrive at the entrance of Starlink's residence, they saw the players crowding the main street stepping aside and opening a path for a 100-man team. All the members of this 100-man team were at least a level 125, Tier 3 expert. They were also equipped with level 120 dark gold equipment and two or three pieces of epic equipment. The two people walking in the head of this team were even more eye-catching. Not only were they equipped with six or more pieces of epic equipment each, but both of them were actually tier 4 players. One of them was a level 129 berserker emperor, while the other was a level 130 sword emperor. Just seeing their gear, levels, and tier made the surrounding players sigh in fascination. Crap. Who are these people? Why haven't I seen that guild emblem before? You don't know. They're from a guild called Hundred Ghosts, an incredibly mysterious guild that appeared recently. I heard that it has an incredible origin. Although the guild has very few members, every one of them is an expert at tier 3 or higher. That's right. That man and woman you see leading them are especially amazing. Before they got promoted to tier 4, they secretly challenged the various superpowers monsters and won 49 out of 49 challenges. I never thought that those two would get promoted to tier 4 after disappearing from the public eye for some time. If they already had an undefeated record before reaching tier 4, doesn't this make them nigh invincible now that they've reached tier 4? The surrounding players held heated discussions over 100 ghosts as 100 men team. Simultaneously, they couldn't help admiring Starlink. Hundred Ghosts was a guild that did as it pleased. It did not show respect to any superpower, yet it had actually accepted the invitation to participate in Starlink's crusade. Hundred Ghosts. Sherfone was slightly surprised when he overheard the surrounding players' conversations. In the past, he had heard a little of the guild known as Hundred Ghosts. The guild had been an incredibly mysterious existence even back then. Moreover, it had revealed itself to the public three years after the game's launch, shortly after the first major system update. The moment this guild made its existence known to the world, it had shaken the entire god's domain. This was because Hundred Ghosts had actually had over 30 tier 4 experts at the time. Back then, even the superpowers only had around 30 tier 4 experts, with stronger ones having around 40. In addition, after Hundred Ghosts made its public appearance, the guild's tier 4 experts began frenziedly challenging the various superpowers and took the continent by storm. However, for some reason, after Hundred Ghosts had finished challenging the various superpowers and proving its strength, it suddenly went silent. The next time it appeared, the guild already had tier 5 experts and began challenging the 5 great super guilds. Despite having the ability to challenge the 5 great super guilds, 100 ghosts did not possess even a single guild residence on the main continent. The guild did not compete for resources, either. The only thing the guild did was do combat. This situation had given the 5 great super guilds headaches back then. After all, the 100 ghosts guild was simply too mysterious. It did not have any roots, so it was impossible to target the guild's base of operations. On the other hand, the number of tier 5 experts the guild had was not the slightest bit inferior to the 5 great super guilds. In this life, God's Domain's first major system update had taken place two years ahead of time. And 100 ghosts had also appeared two years ahead of time. This situation put Sherfong in a reverie. Could they be a guild from an interstellar continent? If it were before he had visited the ancient God's Domain, he probably wouldn't have any idea how such a strange guild could appear out of nowhere. However, after visiting the ancient era, he understood that God's domain housed players not just from Earth but from the several interstellar continents as well. Just like, like the ancient God's domain, hundred ghosts could be from another version of God's domain, only this version of God's domain overlapped with the modern God's domain much more closely than the ancient God's domain. Hence, hundred ghosts could bring so many players to the modern God's domain. In fact, Sherfone even suspected that the mysterious area Lifeless Thorn and the others fell into previously was hundred ghosts' home world. However, Lifeless Thorn and the others had been repatriated to the modern God's Domain before they could learn much about this other version of God's Domain. This would also explain why Hundred Ghosts' members gave off a similar, but more subdued, sense of abnormality as the ancient God's Domain's players. Another thing that surprised Sherfang was that Starlink had actually managed to connect with Hundred Ghosts. This never happened in Sherfang's previous life. Now that so many powers are gathered, I'm afraid Zero Wing will have it tough later. I know, right? The experts from Starlink, Miracle, and the other superpowers aside, just the number of experts gathered here is still more than enough to make Zero Wing suffer. I wonder if Zero Wing even dares come. Starlink has obviously set up a trap. I doubt it will. Since this is Starlink's residence, even if Starlink's experts take action inside, the city's NPC soldiers won't care at all. 
Zero Wings experts can only rely on themselves. The players on the main street couldn't help worrying for Zero Wing, Unyielding Soul, and Crimson Emperor as they watched the various powers experts enter Starlink's residence one after another. Although Zero Wing had the home ground advantage in Sky Spring City, how could the three guilds possibly beat more than 20 superpowers when it came to expert count? Not to mention, a bunch of experts from the various major powers had also come to support Starlink. If it came down to a fight, the three guilds wouldn't stand a chance at all. So long as the three guilds' experts dared show up, only death would await them. Yet, if the three guilds did not show up, their reputation would most likely go down the drain. After all, if news of this matter spread, everyone would definitely think that the three guilds have grown timid. If the three guilds didn't even dare accept a challenge, their aim of becoming titans in God's domain was an utter joke. While the rubberneckers were conversing among themselves, a team of several dozen players suddenly appeared on one end of the main street, their arrival startling the gathered crowd. This was because these players were members of the three guilds. Leading this team of players were none other than Fire Dance, Unyielding Soul, and Illusory Words. Moreover, aside from these three, there was actually another Tier 4 expert with them. The aura this fourth Tier 4 player released was so terrifying that the gathered crowd gasped reflexively. What? Another person from Zero Wing reached Tier 4. That person should be Violet Cloud, right? The feeling she is giving off is completely different from before. Everyone fell into a daze as they looked at the lithe figure standing at the head of the three guilds team. Violet Cloud wore a mage's robe that resembled the starry night sky, and she had her hair tied into a ponytail with a matching ribbon. She looked nothing like a sacred cleric but more like a wise and pure goddess. Her level had even reached 131, which was higher than any other tier 4 player they had seen thus far. Shortly afterward, Violet Cloud and the other members of the three guilds arrived at the entrance of Starlink's residence. As if expecting their arrival, Lu Xing Lua and his entourage appeared at the entrance at this time. Compared to Zero Wing's group, Lu Xing Lua had five tier 4 players on his side, of which two were from Miracle, that was one more tier 4 player than his side had previously. The new addition was Miracle Sword Freak, Miracle Dragon. At this time, Miracle Dragon had already reached level 130, and the oppressive aura he exuded was not much inferior to Violet Clouds. Looking at Lu Xing Lua, illusory words said coldly. Lu Xing Lua, we've come. You can let them go now. Your courage is praiseworthy, Vice Guild Leader Illusory. However, I've changed my mind. Smiling nonchalantly, Lu Xing Lua said, we went to great lengths to capture these people. If we just let them go so easily, wouldn't we superpowers suffer a hit to our reputations? How about we have a match in the residence? If you win, you can take them and leave. If you lose, all of you stay here. Do you three guilds dare accept this challenge? Chapter 2813, Powerful Showdown Lu Xing Lua spoke in a low tone, but his words echoed throughout the area. Everyone turned reflexively to look at Fire Dance and the others from the three guilds. A match. This is going to be interesting. I wonder if Zero Wing will accept it. If they don't, they'll embarrass themselves in front of the various powers Starlink invited. Although Zero Wing had arrived with great momentum, Starlink's side came prepared as well. Just by looking at the five tier four players on Starlink's side, one could tell that Zero Wing held no advantage in this situation at all. Not to mention, the two sides had clashed with each other many times now and suffered severe losses. Zero Wing, Unyielding Soul, and Crimson Emperor had already begun living off their past gains. Their stockpile of weapons and equipment was dwindling, and they were starting to have difficulty compensating their members for their losses. Simply put, only morale was keeping the three guilds alive now. However, if the three guilds refused or lost in the match, morale in the three guilds would plummet. At that time, the performance of the three guilds' members would definitely be affected greatly. Upon realizing the situation, the spectating crowd was in awe of Lu Xing Lua's clever move. Originally, everyone thought Starlink was merely trying to get Zero Wing to remove the seal on Sky Spring City. However, if Starlink got the three guilds' top combatants to remain in Starlink by winning a match, Sky Spring City seal would no longer be a problem. While the spectators were having a quiet discussion among themselves, Fire Dance, Violet Cloud, Unyielding Heart, and Illusory Words briefly exchanged glances. Fine. Fire Dance answered as she looked at Lu Xing Luo. What kind of match do you have in mind, Guild Leader Xing Luo? Their original plan was to break into Starlink's residence and rescue their captured members. However, now that Starlink had gained another Tier 4 combatant, the risk of their plan had undoubtedly increased. Not to mention, the Secret Hand Association's NPCs might be hiding inside the residence. At that time, they would have to go up against not only those NPCs but also five Tier 4 combatants. This would truly put them in a tough spot. After all, anyone capable of reaching Tier 4 was no pushover. In fact, they were among the best in God's domain when it came to combat standards, weapons, equipment, legacies, etc. Simple. Both sides will each select one person for a duel, and we will decide the winner in one match. Lu Xing Lua said, smiling. What do you think of this, Commander Fire Dance? Fine. Fire Dance agreed without hesitation. Good. After hearing Fire Dance's response, Lu Xing Lua turned to Miracle Dragon and said, Our side will have Miracle Dragon represent us. At Lu Xing Luo's words, Miracle Dragon leaped into the air and hovered above Starlink's residence. He then looked down quietly at the Zero Wing contingent, evidently prepared for a fight. 
Big Sis Fire, let me take him on, Violet Cloud volunteered. I haven't gotten a chance to fight against other tier 4s ever since I reached tier 4. I don't want to miss out on this. Fire Dance and the others exchanged looks at Violet Cloud's words, hesitation appearing on their faces. The fact that Lu Xinghua dared let Miracle Dragon represent Starlink's side meant that he was confident of victory. Otherwise, he would have had a veteran tier 4 player take to the field instead. Of course, Lu Xinghua could have made such a decision because the other tier 4 players had long since exposed their cards during the past few battles. In contrast, Miracle Dragon had only gotten promoted to tier 4 recently, so the moves he possessed were still unknown to Zero Wing's side. Alright, but be careful. In the end, Fire Dance still nodded and consented to Violet Cloud's request. Their side couldn't afford to lose this battle. However, Zero Wing's veteran tier 4s faced a similar problem to Starlink's veteran tier 4s. On the other hand, Violet Cloud was not the slightest bit inferior to the three of them in combat standards. Now that she had gotten promoted to tier 4 as well, it went without saying her strength rivaled theirs. Hence, letting Violet Cloud represent Zero Wing's side wasn't exactly a bad decision. Unyielding Heart and Crimson Emperor did not oppose Fire Dance's decision. Instead, they warned Violet Cloud to stay out of melee range from Miracle Dragon. Otherwise, Miracle Dragon's lightning quick attacks would devastate a magical class player like Violet Cloud. Afterward, Violet Cloud similarly leaped into the air and hovered 100 yards away from Miracle Dragon. I lost to Gentle Snow last time because of my basic attributes, but you won't be as lucky as Gentle Snow. Miracle Dragon said as he looked at Violet Cloud with a cold and arrogant gaze. Because I will come at you seriously this time. After Miracle Dragon finished speaking, energy rippled out from his body and instantly enveloped the vicinity. Meanwhile, those caught within his mana domain immediately felt their bodies become incomparably heavy, even tier 3 players found it difficult to move their bodies. A super gravity domain. Fire Dance frowned subconsciously when she experienced Miracle Dragon's mana domain. This was the first time she had experienced such a powerful mana domain. Although this supergravity domain didn't affect the basic attributes of players, the increased gravity would affect the player's mobility significantly. In fact, Fire Dance estimated that her mobility would be halved because of this mana domain. Needless to say, magical class players that didn't possess much strength would fare even worse in this mana domain. Before Fire Dance and the others could recover from their shock, Miracle Dragon unsheathed the silver greatsword he carried. Immediately, not only did the intensity of the aura he exuded skyrocket, but another ripple of energy spread out from his body. Unlike the earlier energy ripple, this one caused the flowing mana in the air to stagnate. Impossible. Unyielding Heart couldn't help doubting his eyes as he looked at Miracle Dragon. Two domains. It was already incredibly difficult for a tier 4 player to obtain even one mana domain. Hence, any tier 4 player that succeeded in doing so would become a force to be reckoned with even among other tier 4 players. Now, Miracle Dragon revealed that he actually possessed two mana domains. This completely shattered Unyielding Heart's understanding of mana domains. Meanwhile, Lu Xinglua and the others on Starlink's side who were standing at the residence's entrance, smiled when they saw the reactions of Fire Dance and the others from the three guilds. Commander Fire Dance, get ready to lose. Miracle Dragon has the Super Gravity Domain and the Space Freezing Domain. He is the absolute bane of magical classes, Lu Xinglua said, smiling calmly as he looked at Fire Dance. Of course, the outcome won't change even if you have someone else take to the field. Under the effects of these two mana domains, nobody can defeat Miracle Dragon in single combat. A dual domain wasn't just a simple addition of two mana domains. Instead, the effects of the two mana domains would overlap and generate exponentially greater results. When Miracle Dragon activated both of his mana domains, he could take on two of Starlink's veteran tier 4s simultaneously and still hold his ground. Meanwhile, the spectators also stirred at this scene. They never thought a person could have two mana domains. As expected of the Sword Freak. Even Black Flame will most likely have trouble going up against Miracle Dragon. I know, right? Black Flame only managed to stand out because he was lucky to reach tier 4 before everyone else. But in a situation where both sides are at tier 4, nobody can tell who is truly the best at the sword without a fight. How can the secret pavilion just arbitrarily label Black Flame the strongest? The Rubberneckers were astonished by Miracle Dragon's abilities. After all, this was the first time any of them had seen a dual domain. One could also easily determine the dual domain's effects just by looking at the tier 3 players enveloped within it. At this time, these tier 3 players were already kneeling on the street from the overbearing pressure. This result was much greater than that of the mana domain Sure Foam had displayed previously. Commander, should we intervene now? Lifeless Thorn asked as he looked at Sure Foam. This dual domain is going to be a tough nut to crack. If it's just Violet alone, I'm afraid. No, we'll continue watching, Sure Foam replied, shaking his head and smiling. If we take action now, everyone's going to think that Zero Wing has no capable people to rely on. But that space freezing domain prevents the use of instantaneous movement. Miracle Dragon is also known for his speed and strength. Her chances of victory are really slim, Lifeless Thorn argued. While he understood what Sure Foam was trying to say, Miracle Dragon's dual domain was a perfect counter for magical class players. Relax. Chuckling, Sherfoam looked at Violet Cloud and said, having more mana domains isn't necessarily an advantage. Moreover, Violet's strength is no longer the same as before. As soon as Sherfoam finished speaking, they saw Violet Cloud take out Death Sigh. However, compared to before, the current Death Sigh released a much more terrifying aura. 
The instant violet cloud wielded it, an aura of death instantly spread into the surroundings. A dual domain might be amazing, but a lone mana domain isn't necessarily inferior. After saying so, Violet Cloud operated her mana body at maximum capacity. The next moment, energy rippled out from her body, instantly pushing back Miracle Dragon's dual domain and preventing it from extending more than 30 yards from Miracle Dragon. The difference between the mana domains of both sides was instantly determined. Chapter 2814, Astromancer's Might What's going on? Why did a dual domain lose to a single domain? The various experts looking up at the sky were bewildered when they saw Miracle Dragon's dual domain getting suppressed. They couldn't understand how a single domain could win against a dual domain. After all, the mana and pressure Violet Cloud's mana domain radiated were both weaker than those of Miracle Dragon's dual domain. This is interesting. This little beauty has actually surpassed Miracle Dragon in knowledge and control over mana by a large margin, a handsome youth wearing Hundred Ghosts' guild emblem said, a faint smile appearing on his face as he looked at Violet Cloud. I never thought there would be such a talent in Zero Wing. Oomph. The people here think that just having high basic attributes is sufficient, they don't know that what's most important for tier 4 players aren't attributes or combat standards but control and understanding over mana, sneered the beautiful woman with short, blue hair standing beside the handsome youth. A mana domain is the result of making an area's mana into one's own. Miracle Dragon can operate the mana of his two mana domains only at a basic standard. How can he possibly win against someone with better control over mana? Looking at Violet Cloud with fascination, the handsome youth said, but this little beauty is quite the genius. We can have her join us and become one of our outer supporting members. Abyss. Don't go acting on your old habits again. Don't forget why we came to this continent, the short-haired woman warned. Relax. I know what I'm doing. Nobody on this continent is a match for me. Zero Wings Alliance will crumble for certain this time. Nothing will change even if that black flame shows up. If this little lady wants to protect Zero Wing, she'll have no choice but to beg me. She'll definitely take the bait at that time, the handsome youth said, smiling. The short-haired beauty carrying a battle axe did not refute the youth's statement. After all, it was indeed true that they could keep Zero Wing alive with just a word. While the pair from Hundred Ghosts were conversing, Miracle Dragon had taken action. Unfazed by the fact that his dual domain had been suppressed, he flew within 50 yards of Violet Cloud and brandished his great sword. 9 Extreme Slashes Tier 4 Legacy Skill, Light Shatterer 9 sword lights tore through space and instantly appeared around Violet Cloud. Moreover, as if to prove that Miracle Dragon had reached the domain realm already, the 9 sword lights moved around Violet Cloud like a bunch of lively monkeys, their attack trajectories unpredictable. Facing this tricky move, Violet Cloud flicked her staff and activated Blink, instantly appearing 30 yards away and dodging the nine sword lights in the nick of time. Boom. A moment after Violet Cloud used Blink, the nine sword lights converged on her original location and exploded, transforming the area within a 20-yard radius into an empty void. The power of this attack practically rivaled that of superior mythic monsters of the same level. However, before Violet Cloud could catch her breath, several more sword lights appeared around her, to which she responded by using Blink again. This process repeated itself over and over, the sword lights hounding Violet Cloud like her shadow. This scene dumbfounded the spectating crowd. After all, at this time, Miracle Dragon looked more like a ranged player than a melee player. Every time he brandished his great sword, several sword lights would appear around Violet Cloud. Despite the distance between the two players, it was as if Miracle Dragon were right beside Violet Cloud. Miracle Dragon really isn't holding back. Thousand Miles, who was standing at the entrance, burst into laughter as he watched the fight in the sky. At this rate, the fight will end in less than 10 seconds. Miracle Dragon was a magic swordsman. His class perfectly combined magic with the sword. The class was proficient in melee combat as well as ranged combat. While it was indeed amazing that Violet Cloud managed to render Miracle Dragon's dual domain useless, thanks to the Light Shatterer's skill, Miracle Dragon could still thoroughly exhibit the might of his godly fast attacks. You might have a lot of movement skills, but while my Light Shatterer's skill is active, it won't matter where you run to, so just surrender obediently. Miracle Dragon said, smirking as he watched Violet Cloud constantly dodging his attacks. Most people might expect him to be at a disadvantage when going up against magical class players, but he was a magic swordsman. It didn't matter whether he fought at close quarters or range. He was proficient in both forms of combat. Meanwhile, Light Shatterer had a three-minute duration. Even if Violet Cloud had many movement skills, she definitely wouldn't have enough to last three minutes. And once she ran out of movement skills, all she could do was wait for death. Thank you for your warning. Looking at the arrogant magic swordsman, Violet Cloud smiled faintly and said, I might not be able to dodge them if I'm alone, but what if there are multiple copies of myself? After saying so, Violet Cloud swung her staff and summoned several dozen identical copies of herself within her vast starry domain. Then, the figures of Violet Cloud and her copies turned blurry, becoming indistinguishable from one another. Doppelgangers. Miracle Dragon was momentarily startled. No, their auras are too weak to be doppelgangers. They should only be illusions, and there should only be one physical body. Watch me break this move of yours. Miracle Dragon began brandishing his greatsword wildly. Unlike before, his sword lights no longer converged on a single point. Instead, they scattered all around Violet Cloud's starry domain, leaving empty voids wherever they passed and turning the starry domain into a place of death. After 
With a series of rampant attacks, black voids filled the starry domain, which covered a 300-yard radius, this outcome thoroughly demonstrating the power of a tier 4 magic swordsman. You refuse to come out even in death. Miracle Dragon was puzzled as he looked at the dark void before him. His attacks had left no corner untouched. While tier 4 players could indeed survive inside the empty void, they could do so only for a short period. They would still die if they lingered. As soon as Miracle Dragon finished speaking, however, Violet Cloud came strolling out of the black void entirely unscathed. It was evident that Miracle Dragon's rampant assault just now did not affect her. She avoided everything. Miracle Dragon was surprised by this scene. He knew the speed of his attacks very well. Only by using skills like Blink could magical class players dodge them, relying solely on physical movements for evasion was impossible. Tanking his attacks would also be utterly foolish, and he would be more than glad to see Violet Cloud try. After all, her defense was bound to slip up against his swift and violent attacks. Nevertheless, Violet Cloud remained unscathed. Even her robe was intact. This proved that Violet Cloud had actually dodged all his sword lights. Amazing. I didn't even have time to cast my spells while dealing with those fast attacks. Thankfully, my starry domain just so happens to counter you. Otherwise, this really would be a tough fight. Violet Cloud sighed ruefully as she looked at the dark space around her. While the doppelganger she summoned might seem like illusions, they were, in a certain sense, real. This was because she could freely shuttle her real body between these doppelgangers. This ability was much stronger than her blink skill. Moreover, while this ability cost concentration and mana to use, it didn't have a cooldown. And once her control over this ability improved, she could potentially summon thousands of copies of herself within her starry domain. Little girl, you're as arrogant as your guild leader. I refuse to believe you can dodge my attacks forever. Miracle Dragon said. He then held up his great sword in preparation for another round of attacks. However, before Miracle Dragon could brandish his weapon, Shadow Blades emerged from the dark void behind Violet Cloud, numbering 600. Miracle Dragon, did you think I was hiding in the void just to dodge your attacks? Chuckling softly, Violet Cloud said, I spent a long time preparing to deal with you. Now, let me see how you block these 600 Shadow Blades. As soon as Violet Cloud finished speaking, the 600 Shadow Blades carrying devastating power began raining down on Miracle Dragon like a hail of bullets. Miracle Dragon knew that there was no way he could dodge them all. Immediately, he activated his Berserk skill, drastically increasing his basic attributes and doubling his attack speed. The next moment, he brandished his great sword, blocking the Shadow Blades one after another in rapid succession. Boom. 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 A Shadow Blade would get sent flying away every time Miracle Dragon swung his great sword. However, under Violet Cloud's control, these Shadow Blades would quickly correct their trajectories and attack him once more. The space above Starlink's residence transformed into a dark void, the shockwaves of the battle spreading throughout Sky Spring City. Rather than a clash between players, the duel between Violet Cloud and Miracle Dragon looked more like a clash between monsters. From watching this battle, the Tier 3 players present thoroughly understood how insignificant they were in front of Tier 4 players. Despite Miracle Dragon's best efforts, there were just too many Shadow Blades. Moreover, Violet Cloud was also constantly making subtle adjustments to her attack patterns. As a result, roughly 20 seconds later, Miracle Dragon finally slipped up, and one Shadow Blade penetrated his defense. Just one hit took away one quarter of Miracle Dragon's HP. Moreover, within a few more seconds, he slipped up three more times. The next moment, the clash in midair came to an abrupt halt, and Miracle Dragon's eyes closed reluctantly as his body fell into the compound of Starlink's residence. Only Violet Cloud and her 600 Shadow Blades remained hovering in the air, the frightening aura they released instilling fear into everyone. Guild Leader Lu Xinghua, you can release our people now. Chapter 2815, How Bold of You At Violet Cloud's words, Lu Xinghua's complexion turned ashen. Never did Lu Xinghua think that Miracle Dragon would lose. Moreover, the man had lost so miserably. Now, not only did Lu Xinghua fail to humiliate Zero Wing, but the morale on his side had even suffered a hit. This situation put him at a loss as to how to respond to Violet Cloud. Lu Xinghua wasn't the only one taken aback by this outcome. The various major powers were similarly stunned beyond belief. Everyone present could clearly tell that Miracle Dragon was monstrously powerful, yet Violet Cloud had actually displayed even greater strength. At this time, they even started to think that Violet Cloud could take on two or three tier four experts simultaneously and still hold the upper hand. So, this is Zero Wing's strength. Amazing. With this, Starlink and the various superpowers will have to act more humbly. From how leisurely Violet Cloud had defeated Miracle Dragon, it was evident she still had strength to spare. This meant that even though Zero Wing's side had one tier four expert less than Starlink's side, the latter still wouldn't hold any advantages. Beautifully done. Unyielding heart praised as he looked up at Violet Cloud. Now that Starlink's side has one less tier 4, even if Lu Xinghua goes back on his word, we still have a much greater chance of rescuing our people. Illusory words nodded in agreement with unyielding heart. This duel held great importance for both sides. If Lu Xinghua handled this matter poorly, he would become the laughing stock of God's domain. After all, Lu Xinghua had overreached himself. He had actually planned to rely on this opportunity to elevate Starlink into an existence on par with the five great super guilds. Only, his grand plan had already been foiled right at the very first step. 
If he weren't standing in public right now, Lu Xingluo would have most likely spat out blood already. When everyone thought Lu Xingluo was going to lose his mind, the man actually smiled. Good. Very good. As expected of one of Zero Wing's peak experts. Your strength is truly astonishing, Lu Xingluo said, chuckling as he looked up at Violet Cloud. Fine. We'll let your people go. Guild leader. Sword Demon, who had also reached Tier 4, was stunned by Lu Xingluo's words. He never thought that Lu Xingluo would release Zero Wing's people so decisively. They'll grow even more fearless if we let their people go. It doesn't matter, Lu Xingluo said as he glanced at Sword Demon nonchalantly. Release them. Sword Demon had no choice but to release the three guild's captured members. The next moment, Alluring Summer, Shadow Sword, Mu Lingxia, Blue Gown, and several other players were released from Starlink's guild hall. From the time they emerged from the building until they walked out of the residence's entrance, none of Starlink's or the various superpowers members stopped them. He's releasing them without a fight. Unyielding Heart was stunned when he saw Mu Lingxia and the others free. Honestly, Unyielding Heart didn't believe any of the words Lu Xinglua said before. To his disbelief, Lu Xinglua had actually gone through with his promise and released the captured players without a fight. However, as soon as the bindings on Alluring Summer and the others were removed, Alluring Summer shouted, Run! Commander, you guys need to get away fast. It's a trap. Unfortunately, as soon as Alluring Summer finished speaking, a threefold magic array suddenly appeared in the sky above Starlink's residence. The magic array instantly expanded and covered a 1,000-yard radius. Apart from Starlink's and the various superpowers members, everyone caught within the barrier felt their bodies growing heavier. Even Tier 4 players like Unyielding Heart found their basic attributes falling by 30%. Run. You think you can run away today? Lu Xinglua sneered as he looked at the members of Zero Wing, Unyielding Soul, and Crimson Emperor. I've released your people, so don't say I didn't abide by our agreement. However, whether you can leave this place alive is another matter altogether. Oh, by the way, this magic barrier is a master barrier. Let alone you Tier 4s, even a superior mythic monster can't break out from it. At the same time as Lu Xinglua finished speaking, three NPCs flew out of Starlink's residence and looked down at the three guilds members from the air. With the appearance of these three NPCs, Violet Cloud's starry domain was instantly overwhelmed by a much stronger and violent mana domain. As a result, her starry domain contracted to only 50 yards away from herself. Meanwhile, upon seeing these three NPCs, everyone present gasped involuntarily. Victor Palum, Secret Hand Association Elder, Tier 4 Great Wizard. Level 160. HP 180 million. Claire Savarin, Secret Hand Legion Vice Commander, Tier 4 Sky Knight. Level 160. HP 330 million. Melt Cabra, Secret Hand Legion Commander, Tier 4 Elemental Hunter. Level 162. HP 270 million. Three Tier 4 NPCs. How is this possible? The various major powers members gaped in shock at these three NPCs. Although they... They knew that Starlink had worked together with the Secret Hand Association to capture the three guild's executives, they had thought that only one Tier 4 NPC was aiding Starlink. Now, three Tier 4 NPCs had appeared. Their combined combat power was enough to destroy even Sky Spring City. Melt Cabra, an elderly man apparently in his fifties who carried a crystalline bow, turned to Lu Xinglua and said, Guild Leader Xinglua, you've done well this time. Our association will help you take control of the Secret Covenant Tower as agreed. Thank you, Commander Melt. Lu Xinglua beamed at Melt Cabra's words. Lu Xinglua's goal since the very beginning had been the three guilds tier 4 members. The main reason he had Miracle Dragon partake in a duel was to create a distraction while the Secret Hand Association set up a magic barrier. After all, setting up such a powerful barrier would create powerful mana fluctuations. Only a duel between two tier 4 players could conceal these mana fluctuations. Hence, Lu Xinglua never really cared whether Miracle Dragon won or lost the duel. How vicious of Lu Xinglua. He was planning to wipe out the three guilds top combatants all along. It seems Zero Wing's side is finished. A force of three tier four NPCs is basically unstoppable in the Twin Towers Kingdom. At this time, everyone already understood that this was a trap Starlink set up for the three guilds. So long as the three guilds' top combatants got annihilated here, the three guilds would be finished. They would no longer have the ability to resist Starlink and the various superpowers. The complexions of the three guilds' members darkened when they saw this situation. How is this possible? How did Lu Xingluo recruit the help of so many tier four NPCs? Unyielding Heart couldn't help despairing as he looked at the three tier four NPCs in the air. According to the information they obtained, only one Tier 4 NPC had been present when Mu Lingxia and the others were captured. They had originally planned for him and Illusory Words to work together to pin down this Tier 4 NPC, while Violet Cloud and Fire Dance went up against Starlink's Tier 4 players. Now, the number of Tier 4 NPCs they had to face had tripled. Moreover, they were even caught inside a Master Barrier. They couldn't escape even if they wanted to. While the three guilds members were at a loss as to what to do, Melt Cabra glanced at them. Capture Zero Wings members. Kill everyone else using soul attacks. I want to let Black Flame know the consequences of provoking the Secret Hand Association. Melt Cabra commanded the two people beside him. In response, Elder Victor Palum chuckled and said, Rest assured, Commander Melt, none of Zero Wing's members will escape today. 
Melt Cabra's words stunned the spectating crowd. These NPCs are here for Zero Wing. Crap. What did Zero Wing do to have an NPC force aim for their lives? At this time, let alone the various major powers, even Unyielding Heart and Illusory Words were stunned. An NPC force had actually mobilized such a powerful party just to take revenge on Shurfone. However, before Unyielding Heart and Illusory Words could react to this piece of information, the three NPCs made their move, splitting up and charging at Violet Cloud and Fire Dance. Zero Wing. This is the consequence of your sins. Lu Xingluo burst into maniacal laughter when he saw the three NPCs taking action. I didn't even do anything this time. Previously, Lu Xingluo had still felt quite troubled by the three guilds' resistance. However, Shifeng had offended the Secret Hand Association on Dragonheart Island, which, in turn, prompted the association to seek a partnership with Lu Xingluo. He had nearly gone crazy from joy back then. Now that three of the association's tier 4 NPCs were taking action, there was no way Zero Wing's members could escape. Now, all he had to do was wait for Zero Wing's destruction and take over Zero Wing's possessions. However, just as the three NPCs were about to reach Fire Dance and her companions, who were prepared to fight to the death, a sword light suddenly appeared out of nowhere on the battlefield. This lightning fast sword light cut straight at Melt Cabra, who led the charge against Zero Wing's members. However, Melt Cabra was no ordinary tier 4 NPC. Quickly responding to the attack, he used his crystalline bow as a melee weapon and struck the approaching sword light. Boom. An explosion occurred, and space within a radius of several dozen yards shattered. The elemental hunter went flying over a hundred yards away, a damage exceeding one million appearing above his head. Secret Hand Association, how bold of you. I didn't bother picking a fight with you in Dragonheart City, yet you actually have the gall to come and pick a fight in my territory. It seems you people are tired of living, just like Sabred. Before anyone could react to the sudden attack, a cold voice echoed throughout the battlefield. Everyone turned to the voice's origin, curious to find out who had sent Melt Cabra flying. The next moment, what entered everyone's eyes was a cloaked man walking out of the crowd. The man wielded a golden sword decorated with crimson runes, and his frightening aura made them feel as if the god of death had descended onto the battlefield. Black Flame Chapter 2816, Nobody is Leaving Everyone couldn't help doubting their eyes when they saw the cloaked man. After all, Melt Cabra was a level 162, tier 4 NPC. Although he was only a tier 4 ranger, which wasn't a strength-oriented class, he still possessed a massive advantage in terms of levels. He simply wasn't an existence current players could go up against. Nevertheless, Shurfone had sent the elemental hunter flying with one hit. How frightening was his strength? He's actually the Black Flame. Standing in the spectating crowd, the robust man from the Silver Lion Adventurer team was astonished when he discovered Shurfeng's identity. His team members were similarly stunned. They never imagined that the stranger their commander decided to befriend would actually be a big shot. Moreover, it was even a big shot capable of shaking the entire god's domain. Guild Leader Fire Dance and the others were also surprised when they saw Shurfong approaching them. They hadn't thought that Shurfong had already returned. Brother Black Flame, you've really made us wait. Unyielding Heart revealed a bitter smile when he saw Shurfong. Although not much time had passed since they parted ways at the ruined mountain range, it felt like months and years had gone by on their side as the pressure they faced from the various superpowers increased by the day. Fortunately, their peak experts had found several Tier 4 legacy lands while exploring level 130 maps. As a result, their three guilds managed to produce three Tier 4 players quickly, instantly alleviating the pressure they faced at the Twin Towers Kingdom by a large margin. They were also continuously obtaining complete Tier 3 legacies from the Secret Covenant Tower, which allowed their guilds to produce Tier 3 players rapidly. As a result, their three guilds had managed to last until today, albeit by the skin of their teeth. Shurfang's return had undoubtedly increased their staying power. When Illusory Words saw Shurfang, she, too, heaved a deep sigh of relief. They had been fighting long and hard just to endure until this moment. Meanwhile, Shurfang's appearance also caused a stir among the members of Starlink's faction. None of them had expected Shurfang to reappear in such a sudden and powerful manner. Black Flame, you're finally willing to show yourself. Lu Xingluo laughed as he looked at Shurfang. I've been waiting for a long time. Today, I'll let you see Zero Wing perish before your eyes. Everyone, attack. In truth, Lu Xingluo was slightly surprised by Shurfang's arrival. He never thought that Shurfang would be able to return from the sealed Dragonheart City so quickly. Lu Xingluo had originally planned to use the Annihilation of Fire Dance and the others to force Shurfeng to come forward. Now, he no longer had to trouble himself. As soon as Lu Xingluo finished speaking, Sword Demon, Wind Demon, and Tengu, who had all reached Tier 4, moved to surround Zero Wing's members. Only, shortly after the trio exited the residence's entrance, two figures intercepted them. You'll need to beat the two of us first before you proceed. Lifeless Thorn said as he grabbed the spear slung on his back and swept it at the three enemies before him. At this time, Lifeless Thorn and Solitary Nine stopped concealing their life auras. Two more Tier 4 auras spread across the battlefield, stunning Sword Demon's group. Two more Tier 4s. How many Tier 4s does Zero Wing have? The various major powers exclaimed in surprise when they sensed Lifeless Thorns and Solitary Nine's auras. At this stage of the game, Tier 4 players were still as rare as a phoenix's feather. 
A superpower would be fortunate to have even one tier 4 player. Yet, based on what they could see now, Zero Wing actually had five tier 4 players already. Even the five great super guilds didn't have such a force yet. You people from Zero Wing are indeed capable. After glancing at Lifeless Thorn and Solitary Nine, Lu Xinghua turned to Shifeng and sneered, Unfortunately, all of you are inside a master barrier right now. Even if you have more tier 4s on your side, you still don't have a chance at victory. Upon hearing this, the various onlookers snapped out of their days and very much agreed with Lu Xinghua's words. March, you go as well. Thousand Miles commanded as he looked at Silent March. Make sure Black Flame doesn't leave this place alive. We'll be in trouble afterward, otherwise. Yes, sir. Nodding, Silent March took out her staff and joined Sword Demon's trio. Seeing that Silent March, a tier 4 necromancer, was taking action as well, the spectating players sighed subconsciously. Although Starling's side was still outnumbered, it had the help of a master barrier and three tier 4 NPCs, Zero Wing's side stood no chance at all. However, before Silent March could arrive before Lifeless Thorn and Solitary Nine, Shurfone suddenly slashed at the sky. World Breaker The next moment, a dazzling brilliance shot into the sky and instantly penetrated the magic barrier. Subsequently, the barrier shattered, and the overwhelming pressure Zero Wing's members felt disappeared. What master barrier? Looking at Lu Xinghua, Shurfone asked calmly, do you mean this broken thing? At Shurfeng's words, silence enveloped the entire battlefield. Lu Xinghua, in particular, was utterly thunderstruck as he looked at the dissipating barrier. Impossible. Even a superior mythic monster would have a difficult time breaking this barrier. How could he just? At this time, Lu Xinghua felt as if he was having a nightmare. Either that or the heavens were playing a trick on him. Guild leader, are you, still just a tier 4 player? At this time, let alone Lu Xinghua and the various superpowers members, even Fire Dance and the others gaped in shock at the scene. This was a barrier capable of trapping superior mythic monsters. Yet, Shifeng had destroyed it with one slash. Not good. They can run away now that the barrier is broken. Reacting to the situation quickly, Thousand Miles looked at Lu Xinghua and urged, Guild leader Xinghua, we need to figure out a plan fast. If a tier 4 player wanted to escape, even tier 4 NPCs would have trouble stopping them. Meanwhile, if their faction failed to capture Zero Wings members alive, they would have a much harder time dealing with the three guilds afterward. On the other hand, unyielding heart and illusory words breathed out a sigh of relief at this situation. With the magic barrier gone, so long as they scattered and fled, the three tier 4 NPCs wouldn't be able to capture them. Moreover, they were still inside Sky Spring City. If the three tier 4 NPCs caused a commotion, Sky Spring City's tier 4 magistrate would definitely intervene. At that time, the magistrate would be able to pin down at least one of Secret Hand's NPCs. However, before Lu Xinghua and Thousand Miles could issue commands, Shifeng jumped into the air above Starlink's residence and scanned the crowd beneath him. This situation confused the various spectating players. They couldn't understand why Shifeng had approached Starlink's residence instead of running away. Run away. Looking at Thousand Miles, Shifeng laughed and said, Do you think you're the only ones capable of summoning Tier 4 NPCs? Nobody is leaving today. All of you will stay here. After saying so, Shifeng took out two summon guard scrolls from his bag and activated them. Chapter 2817, Reversal As Shurfone chanted the incantation to activate the Summon Guard Scrolls, two magic arrays appeared before him. One second later, two figures emerged from these magic arrays. Along with the appearance of these two figures, everyone present felt an unprecedented pressure weighing down their body. Tier 4 Personal Guards How did he do it? The various major powers members gasped when they saw the two new figures in the air. Many players own personal guards in God's domain, but those capable of owning tier 4 personal guards at this stage of the game could be counted on one's fingers. This was because NPCs had much more difficulty getting promoted to tier 4 than players. Even fine gold guards had no more than a 25% chance of success. And in the event of failure, these personal guards would have to wait one whole month before they could challenge their promotion quest again. Moreover, the success rate wouldn't change in the slightest. Yet, now, Shurfone had actually summoned two tier 4 personal guards. Meanwhile, these two personal guards were none other than Kite and Anna. As the two NPCs had been busy challenging their tier 4 promotion quests previously, Shurfone had not summoned them for quite some time now. Fortunately, Kite and Anna possessed incredibly high growth potentials. Both of them had successfully gotten promoted to tier 4, and their current levels even surpassed Shurfeng's by a large margin. At this time, Kite had already reached level 146, whereas Anna was at level 149. While their levels were still lower than the Secret Hand Association's three NPCs, the difference was negligible. After reaching Tier 4, the main factors that allowed Tier 4 NPCs to undergo qualitative improvements were fragmented legendary weapons and equipment, control over mana, and the number of Tier 4 skills and spells learned. With Kite and Anna's arrival, even a fool could tell that the tables had turned. Previously, after Starlink and the various superpowers lost the support of their master barrier, their disadvantage in numbers meant they could only rely on the Secret Hand Association's NPCs to overwhelm Zero Wing's side. However, Kite and Anna could fend off at least two of the Association's Tier 4 NPCs. And with the growing commotion, Sky Spring City's Tier 4 Magistrate would most likely come to help soon. Hence, Starlink and the various superpowers no longer had any advantages at this time. 
In fact, they were even at a disadvantage since Zero Wing side had three more Tier 4 players than they did. A difference of three Tier 4 players might not seem like much, but it was already more than enough to elicit despair in Starlink and the various superpowers. This was because even 10,000 Tier 3 players wouldn't be enough to go against three Tier 4 players. That would only result in a one-sided massacre. Moreover, with the seal over Sky Spring City still in effect, the only way players could teleport out of the city was through the teleportation hall. This situation was considerably disadvantageous for Starlink's side. When Lu Xingluo recognized the situation, his complexion turned indescribably ugly. He had never dreamed that Shifeng would be able to reverse the situation and even put him in dire straits. Guild leader Xingluo, what should we do now? If it comes down to a fight, I'm afraid our side. Thousand Miles asked anxiously as he looked at Lu Xingluo. Lu Xingluo had full responsibility for this operation. Miracle and the various superpowers were simply here to show support. After all, Lu Xingluo had repeatedly guaranteed that he would take down Zero Wing this time. Then, the various superpowers would divide the Secret Covenant Tower and the three guilds' territories among themselves. Now, before Miracle even took a cutout of Zero Wing, it had already lost Miracle Dragon. Moreover, at this rate, even Silent March and Thousand Miles himself would most likely perish. I understand. Sighing helplessly, Lu Xingluo said, I originally thought that these means would already be enough to take down Zero Wing. It seems I still have to request their help in the end. Request their help. At Lu Xingluo's words, realization dawned upon Thousand Miles. He then looked at a nearby team of several dozen players and muttered, could it be? Thousand Miles had heard of the mysterious guild known as Hundred Ghosts. This was a guild that showed no respect or fear for even the five great super guilds. He never thought that Lu Xingluo would actually have such a deep connection with Hundred Ghosts. That's right. It's them. Lu Xingluo nodded. He then looked at the handsome youth leading Hundred Ghosts' team and called out, Brother Abyss, I'm afraid I'll have to bother you for help. Once we get out of this predicament, Starlink will agree to all your conditions. Good. I've been waiting a long time for these words, Guild Leader Xingluo. Awakened Abyss smiled when he heard Lu Xingluo's promise. Since you've thought it through already, Hundred Ghosts naturally won't sit back and do nothing. Thank you, Brother Abyss. Lu Xingluo breathed out a sigh of relief. Shifeng had really boxed Lu Xingluo into a corner this time. Since they were inside Sky Spring City, which also happened to be Zero Wing's territory, Starlink's members would all end up jailed if they died or got captured inside the city. Meanwhile, the prison sentence could last anywhere from a few days to over a dozen days. This absolutely wasn't an outcome Lu Xingluo could tolerate. Now that Hundred Ghosts had agreed to intervene, though, Starlink would escape this predicament. Lu Xingluo knew very clearly what kind of power was backing Hundred Ghosts. It simply wasn't something the main continent's superpowers could go up against. The various major powers present overheard the conversation between Lu Xingluo and Awakened Abyss. However, they couldn't understand why Lu Xingluo, Starlink's guild leader, would ask Awakened Abyss for help. Moreover, Lu Xingluo relaxed visibly when he heard the handsome youth's positive response. Who are those people? Lu Xingluo is actually begging them for help. How ignorant are you guys? That's Hundred Ghosts. I never imagined that Starlink would manage to partner up with Hundred Ghosts. Starlink really hit the jackpot this time. I heard that even the five great super guilds have to show respect to Hundred Ghosts. Although the five great super guilds initially sent a lot of famous experts to pick a fight with Hundred Ghosts, none of those experts returned alive. Many of the major powers present were ignorant of Hundred Ghosts' existence. After hearing the explanation of some well-informed people, they quickly understood how extraordinary an existence Hundred Ghosts was. On the other hand, unyielding heart and illusory words couldn't help making ugly expressions. Damn it. Why would Hundred Ghosts partner with Starlink? Frustration filled unyielding heart's eyes when he heard Awakened Abyss agreeing to Lu Xingluo's request. After Hundred Ghosts made its debut on the main continent, his guild leader had received an astonishing secret message. Afterward, his guild leader warned everyone in the guild not to provoke Hundred Ghosts as members. Otherwise, there would be unimaginable consequences. Initially, Unyielding Heart thought that Hundred Ghosts had merely accepted Starlink's invitation so that they could challenge some of the experts here. It never occurred to him that Hundred Ghosts actually planned to partner with Starlink. Illusory words was similarly filled with frustration. After seeing Shifeng summon his personal guards, she thought they would be able to deal a heavy blow to Starlink and the various superpowers. However, now that Hundred Ghosts, an existence that even the five great super guilds feared, had agreed to step in for Starlink, if their three guilds insisted on taking action against Starlink, they would make an enemy of Hundred Ghosts. The next moment, after Awakened Abyss agreed to Lu Xingluo's request, he looked up at Shifeng and said, Guild Leader Black Flame, Hundred Ghosts has some dealings with Starlink. Can you spare Starlink out of respect for Hundred Ghosts? If Zero Wing needs help in the future, I, Awakened Abyss, will definitely lend a helping hand. As soon as Awakened Abyss finished speaking, everyone present turned to Shifeng, who was still hovering in midair. They all wondered how he would answer. Although sparing Starlink here would mean losing an opportunity to deal a heavy blow to Starlink, Zero Wing would gain Hundred Ghosts' favor. This wouldn't necessarily be a losing transaction. After all, Hundred Ghosts was a mysterious guild that even the five great super guilds had to show respect to. Gaining the favor of such an existence could bring many benefits. Respect. Favor. Sure Foam laughed as he looked at Awakened Abyss. When Starlink was pushing our three guilds into a dead end earlier, why didn't I see you standing up for us at that time? 
Yet, now that Starlink is in a desperate situation, you're telling us to let them go. Do you think my respect is so cheap? What will you do if I don't give it to you? Chapter 2818, You Think Too Highly of Yourself When Sher Fong finished speaking, silence enveloped the entire battlefield. Nobody had expected that Sher Fong would show no regard at all for hundred ghosts. A cold glint flashed and awakened Abyss's eyes at Sher Fang's response. Guild leader Black Flame, my suggestion is beneficial for both our sides. If hundred ghosts interferes, setting all else aside, just in terms of number of tier 45, Zero Wing won't have much of an advantage, awakened Abyss said coldly. If you insist on remaining obstinate, I'll have to take it as Zero Wing having hostile intentions toward Hundred Ghosts. After saying so, Awakened Abyss stopped concealing his life aura. Immediately, a life aura rivaling that of the Secret Hand Association's Tier 4 NPC spread across the battlefield. Simultaneously, Awakened Abyss revealed the glow effect of his equipment, the result making the surrounding spectators gasp. This was because Awakened Abyss was actually fully geared in epic equipment. Moreover, apart from a full set of epic equipment, Awakened Abyss's longsword was also extraordinary, sporting six gleaming gemstones inlaid into it. And although the longsword looked old-fashioned, the aura it exuded was much stronger than that of the epic equipment he wore by a large margin. Meanwhile, the short-haired woman standing beside Awakened Abyss also stopped concealing her life aura and equipment. And like Awakened Abyss, she was fully geared in epic equipment and carried a battle axe that rivaled Awakened Abyss's longsword. Aren't those two a little too well-equipped? No wonder even the five great super guilds are wary of hundred ghosts. Even Starlink and the various superpowers can't afford to arm their members to the teeth with such excellent items. When the various major powers saw the dazzling glow enveloping Awakened Abyss and the short-haired beauty, they were startled. Everyone present had seen epic weapons and equipment before. However, trying to fully gear a player with epic items that suited them was incredibly difficult. Yet, Hundred Ghosts had managed to do so for two players. One could see just how powerful Hundred Ghosts was through this point alone. Hence, it was clearly unwise for Zero Wing to make an enemy of Hundred Ghosts at this time. Hostile intentions. Sure Foam laughed as he looked at Awakened Abyss. You think too highly of yourself. Since you wish to stand on Starlink's side, then die with them. After saying so, Sherfone unsheathed the light of two worlds and executed a downward slash at Awakened Abyss. First sword, Light Shadow. An illusory great sword over a hundred meters long appeared in the sky and descended toward Awakened Abyss and the short-haired woman. Space ruptured in the great sword's wake, and Awakened Abyss and the woman suddenly found themselves having difficulty moving. How dare he? When Lu Xinglua and the various superpowers executives saw the scene, they gaped in shock. They never thought that Sherfone sure would even attack Hundred Ghosts as envoys. Crazy bastard. Awakened Abyss revealed a startled expression when he saw the illusory greatsword. He hadn't expected Sherfone sure to take such prompt action. Moreover, he found the power of Sherfang's sure attack stifling. Even the tier 4 NPCs he had faced before couldn't execute such a powerful attack. Almost by instinct, Awakened Abyss took out a crystal and shattered it without hesitation. Two barriers instantly appeared before Awakened Abyss and the short-haired woman, protecting them. Boom. When the illusory greatsword came into contact with the first barrier, the barrier immediately cracked. Only after the first barrier had shattered completely did the illusory greatsword disappear. Awakened Abyss and the short-haired woman stared at this outcome in disbelief. This dual-layered barrier was the product of a Tier 4 curse, a tool they carried for emergencies. Even Tier 4 NPCs couldn't break the generated barriers, yet Sherfone had shattered one layer. In other words, Sherfone needed only one more attack to destroy this Tier 4 defensive curse. We're leaving. Awakened Abyss commanded his team to retreat without hesitation. His mana technique is too powerful. Only the elders can deal with him. We won't be able to stop his third attack. As soon as Awakened Abyss finished speaking, Hundred Ghosts' members promptly scattered and fled. Awakened Abyss and the short-haired woman leaped into the air and made a beeline for Sky Spring City's gate. They dared not try to put up a fight. It seems you're not completely inept, Sherfone commented indifferently as he looked at the remaining barrier before him. He then looked at Awakened Abysses and the short-haired woman's fleeing figures and continued, However, since you dare interfere in Zero Wings matters, I'll have one of you stay behind today to teach you a lesson. After saying so, Sherfone suddenly disappeared from where he hovered. When he reappeared, he was in front of Awakened Abyss. You. Sherfang's appearance shocked Awakened Abyss. Sherfone was too fast. His movement speed in the air practically rivaled the flying mounts. However, before Awakened Abyss could react to the situation, Sherfone swung the light of two worlds once more. It was evident he had chosen Awakened Abyss as his target of detention. Spatial Slash Black Flame Unwilling to take any chances, Awakened Abyss activated his Berserk skill, boosting his basic attributes by a large margin. Now, he could go toe-to-toe -to -toe against a superior mythic monster of the same level. Don't go too far. Awakened Abyss used his full strength to counter Sherfang's attack, his long sword radiating a colorful brilliance as it swung to meet Sherfang's light of two worlds. Now, the power of his attack was not the slightest bit weaker than that of the light shadow Sherfang executed before. Boom. Two sky-splitting spatial tears appeared when the two swords collided. Immediately afterward, Awakened Abyss crashed into the ground below like a cannonball, and his HP plummeted. 
In the blink of an eye, awakened Abyss's HP, which exceeded 20 million, fell to zero, and the youth became deader than dead. Abyss. The short-haired woman was stunned when she saw Awakened Abyss killed. Awakened Abyss was one of the top three experts among Hundred Ghosts' younger generation, yet he actually couldn't withstand even one attack from Shifon. When Lu Xingmua and the others standing inside Starlink's residence saw this scene, they, too, were flabbergasted. They never thought Shifon would actually kill Awakened Abyss without hesitation, showing no fear of Hundred Ghosts whatsoever. Run away. Nobody knew who said these words. However, as soon as they appeared, the tens of thousands of players inside Starlink's residence came to a tacit agreement and began fleeing immediately. Even the Secret Hand Association's NPCs had grim expressions when they saw Shifeng's might. We're leaving. Melt Cabra commanded, understanding that the situation was no longer in their favor. With just the three of them here, they would be helpless against Shifeng. Immediately afterward, the Secret Hand Association's three Tier 4 NPCs turned to flee Sky Spring City. You want to escape? Dream on. Looking at Kite and Anna, Shifeng commanded, kill all of these people. Yes, sir. Kite and Anna, who had remained on standby until now, responded respectfully. They then split up and took independent action. The next moment, Anna set out in pursuit of Melt Cabra's group. As for Kite, he joined Lifeless Thorn and Solitary Nine in dealing with Starlink's Tier 4 players. You think you can stop us by yourself? You must be tired of living. Melt Cabra was incensed when he saw Anna coming to block his group by herself. Although Anna was also a Tier 4 existence, she was merely level 149. She would have trouble stopping even one of them, let alone all three. She was basically insulting their strength by coming at them alone. However, before Melt Cabra could say anything more, Anna unleashed her mana domain. Immediately, Anna's mana domain enveloped the entire Sky Spring City, transforming the city into a world of black and white. Under the effects of her mana domain, Starlinks and the various superpowers Tier 3 players couldn't even budge. As for Melt Cabra's group of three, they felt immense pressure pressing down on them, subjecting the mana within their bodies to a powerful suppression. The three of them could barely extend their own mana domains 20 yards from themselves. The might of Anna's mana domain was simply unbelievable. Before Melt Cabra and the other two could react, countless pitch black chains assaulted them from all directions. Simultaneously, innumerable holy swords appeared in the sky and shot at all three of them. Despite the trio working together and doing their best to fend off the attacks, they actually remained at a complete disadvantage. Anna thoroughly displayed her strength as an epic guard, and it was only a matter of time before she defeated the three hostile NPCs. Lu Xinglua, you should follow your friends as well. Shifeng instantly appeared in front of Lu Xinglua and swung the light of two worlds at him. He gave Lu Xinglua no room to even catch a breather. Damn it. Damn it. Black Flame, I'll make you pay for this. Hundred Ghosts will make you pay for this too. Lu Xinglua gritted his teeth and shattered one of the crystal rings he wore. The next moment, a strange, gray space formed around Lu Xinglua and thoroughly negated Shifeng's attack. However, Lu Xingluo also let out an agonized scream in the gray space. It was evident that getting caught within this gray space wasn't entirely pleasant for Lu Xingluo. A second later, the gray space disappeared together with Lu Xingluo. He sure knows how to run quickly. Shifeng wasn't particularly surprised when Lu Xingluo escaped. After all, Lu Xingluo was Starlink's guild leader. It would be strange if he didn't have a few powerful life-saving items. Fortunately, Shifeng had already achieved his goal in coming here. After today's event, Starlink and the various superpowers would lose tens of thousands of Tier 3 experts and many Tier 4 experts. Moreover, even if these experts died, they would still be detained for several days in Sky Spring City's prison once they respawned. Less than 10 minutes later, with Anna and Kite's assistance, Zero Wings members annihilated the Secret Hand Association's three Tier 4 NPCs and the various superpowers Tier 3 and Tier 4 experts. The spectating powers were awestruck to witness the deaths of the various superpowers experts. None of them had ever dreamed that the superpowers crusade against the Secret Covenant Tower would come to such an end. Zero Wing's hidden strength also exceeded their imagination. The guild simply wasn't an existence the various superpowers could go up against. This astonishing piece of news quickly spread all over the Twin Towers Kingdom. It even reached the neighboring kingdoms and empires, shocking the various player forces there. Chapter 2819, Changes in the Twin Towers Kingdom In a certain border town of the Fire Dragon Empire. At this time, a 3,000-man team of Tier 3 players was resting in two bars on the main street. All the town residents, be they players or NPCs, were extremely afraid of this team. This was because the average level of this team was level 125, three levels higher than the average level of Tier 3 players in the Fire Dragon Empire. Meanwhile, leading this powerful team of Tier 3 players was a long-haired woman with a heroic air. When the players looked at this white-clad woman, their gaze held awe and respect. This woman was none other than the first player in mythology to have gotten promoted to Tier 4, Cold Shadow, who was now mythology's first vice guild leader. In addition, she had even reached level 133, 11 levels higher than the average Tier 3 player. The cold and sharp aura she exuded was so powerful that even Tier 3 players over 100 yards away shuddered involuntarily. Vice Guild Leader, news just came in from the Twin Towers Kingdom, White Feather, who was now a level 130, Tier 4 Guardian Knight, reported to Cold Shadow. Starlink suffered a tragic defeat. 
Moreover, because of Black Flame's sudden appearance, with the exception of Lu Xinglua, none of the various superpowers experts escaped. Nearly 20,000 Tier 3 experts were penalized with 10 days confinement in Sky Spring City's prison. He's finally willing to show himself. Cold Shadow, who was resting quietly with her eyes shut, wasn't the slightest bit surprised when she heard White Feather's report. Unfortunately, although Black Flame dealt a heavy blow to Starlink and the various superpowers, he still let the key person escape. Zero Wing will most likely face a lot of trouble after this. After all, the person standing behind Lu Xinglua isn't some random pushover. That person is also adamant in acquiring the Secret Covenant Tower. According to our insider reports, Black Flame killed 100 Ghosts as Awakened Abyss, White Feather said in a quieter tone. In fact, out of 100 Ghosts' team of several dozen players, only Vice Commander Jade Leaf managed to escape. This bit of news had Cold Shadow opening her eyes in shock. Has Black Flame lost his mind? He actually killed Awakened Abyss. Does he not know Awakened Abyss's identity? Awakened Abyss was a talent 100 Ghosts placed great importance on. The youth was so important that 100 Ghosts had even tasked Jade Leaf, a Tier 4 expert, to accompany him as his bodyguard. Meanwhile, 100 Ghosts was an existence that even the five great super guilds dared not offend. The power this mysterious guild wielded simply defied common sense. At this point, the only thing the five great super guilds could do was form partnerships with 100 Ghosts. They absolutely couldn't afford to make an enemy of the guild. This was something Odin repeatedly emphasized. Hence, everyone in mythology was currently doing their best to avoid 100 Ghosts as people. Yet, Shurfong had done the exact opposite. Not only did he choose to oppose 100 Ghosts, but he had even killed Awakened Abyss. When 100 Ghosts learned of this, the guild would definitely go into a frenzy. In that case, should we take action now? White Feather asked. Zero Wing was a guild that mythology had to destroy, no matter what. Now that Shurfong had dealt a heavy blow to Starlink and the various superpowers, these guilds definitely wouldn't just let the matter lie. In fact, they might even put everything on the line to fight Zero Wing after all, these superpowers had lost so many Tier 3 experts already. If they still couldn't secure the Secret Covenant Tower, recovering from this loss within a short period would be impossible. Not to mention, 100 Ghosts would most likely retaliate against Zero Wing as well. At that time, a spectacular battle would definitely occur at the Secret Covenant Tower, which would be the perfect opportunity for mythology to take action. No, it still isn't time. Cold Shadow shook her head. We have just recently completed that inferior legendary quest and obtained a mana body legacy. We need to digest this legacy first. It wouldn't be too late to take action once we have improved our mana bodies. After all, when it comes to matters regarding the mana body, Black Flame's side has already made significant progress. I doubt we are a match for him in this regard even now. I understand. I'll notify the others about this and have them head to the Divine Cave, White Feather said, nodding. There's no need for us to head to the Divine Cave yet. We are merely learning a legacy. We can learn it anywhere, Cold Shadow said. After reading a message one of her subordinates just sent her, she smiled faintly and continued, Moreover, if we head to the Secret Covenant Tower now, we might get an opportunity to understand 100 Ghosts' strength. 100 Ghosts is taking action already. White Feather was surprised when she heard Cold Shadow's words. The strength Zero Wing had displayed thus far was incredibly terrifying. The guild had not only 5 Tier 4 players but also 2 Tier 4 personal guards, who were far superior to the average Tier 4 NPC. At this stage of the game, even the 5 great super guilds could only resort to a war of attrition with Zero Wing. In a frontal confrontation, their chances of defeating Zero Wing would be zero. Hence, White Feather found it incredible that 100 Ghosts would retaliate against Zero Wing right after losing several dozen of its top combatants. That's not entirely true, Cold Shadow said, chuckling. A hint of anticipation appearing in her eyes, she added, you'll understand once we get there. If Zero Wing doesn't abandon the Secret Covenant Tower this time, it'll most likely be doomed forever. After Cold Shadow finished speaking, White Feather promptly organized a group of peak experts, and they accompanied Cold Shadow to the Secret Covenant Tower. Twin Towers Kingdom, Sky Spring City. Guild leader, we're done compiling the list of items we got, Fire Dance reported as she approached her phone. With an excited look on her face, she continued, we obtained close to 20,000 weapons and equipment from this battle, including over 6,000 level 110 plus fine gold weapons and equipment and over 2,000 level 110 plus dark gold weapons and equipment. The rest are all level 110 plus secret silver weapons and equipment. This harvest will mitigate a significant portion of the losses we suffered previously. Currently, Fire Dance, Yolan, and Melancholic Smile were managing the affairs of the entire guild. Dealing with the guild's weapon stockpile gave Fire Dance massive headaches. Previously, when she had merely been commanding Zero Wing's main force, she hadn't known just how important it was for the guild to have a sufficient stockpile of weapons and equipment. However, after taking over Gentle Snow's and Aqua Rose's responsibilities and repeatedly clashing with the various superpowers, she finally understood what a guild's foundation referred to. Originally, she believed that a guild's foundation referred to the number of experts a guild possessed. However, after the various superpowers began waging war against Zero Wing, she realized that what truly served as a guild's foundation were weapons and equipment. If not for the candlelight trading firm having a sufficiently large number of lifestyle players, Zero Wing would have long since run out of weapons and equipment. And if that happened, members would definitely withdraw from the guild in droves. 
After all, nobody would want to fight for a guild that couldn't even arm them with weapons and equipment. Give half of the weapons and equipment to Crimson Emperor and Unyielding Soul, Shifeng said, smiling. I believe they haven't been faring well recently, either. These weapons and equipment should help them cope with their troubles. Shifeng had a very thorough understanding of the issues involved in guild wars. When he led Shadow in his previous life, there had been instances when the guild's warehouse had only bronze weapons and equipment. Back then, Shadow had only been a small guild. If a superpower were to face a situation where its warehouse had only bronze weapons and equipment, everyone in the guild would have long since quit. After all, even if guild players died and lost levels, so long as they had sufficiently good weapons and equipment, they could quickly recover their levels. However, without weapons and equipment, they might as well be independent players. At the very least, hostile forces wouldn't persecute them. Before Shifeng could issue any more commands, illusory words approached him with a grim look on her face. Guild leader Black Flame, a big problem appeared in Baron Forest City, near the Secret Covenant Tower. Illusory words said anxiously. According to our scouts, over a million faux saint monsters have appeared there and are making their way toward the Secret Covenant Tower. The majority of them are level 135 Great Lords, and there are also roughly 1,000 level 140 plus mythic ranked faux saint monsters. 8,000 mythic monsters. Fire Dance was stunned when she heard what illusory words said. For a moment, she even wondered if her ears were working properly. Normally, it would be incredibly difficult to come across even one mythic monster. Not to mention, monsters had gained the ability to think for themselves after the major system update. This had increased their combat standards by a large margin and improved their capacity for cooperation. Under normal circumstances, a tier 4 expert would have to flee if they came across two or three mythic monsters of the same level simultaneously. And with around 10 mythic monsters, one could even attack towns and cities. Nonetheless, she was being told that their opponent had 1,000 mythic monsters. 8,000. Shurfone was also surprised by this piece of news. The strongest monster tide he had come across out in the fields had only around 100 mythic monsters. That monster tide had successfully destroyed a guild city defended by several tier 4 players. Now, the enemy had 1,000 mythic monsters faux saint monsters possessing above average combat standards. This was undoubtedly a devastating force. That's right. There are at least 1,000 of them. Illusory words nodded, an ugly expression appearing on her face. According to their movement speed, it'll take them around 10 hours to reach the Secret Covenant Tower. We should have enough time if we withdraw from the tower now. They didn't have any hope of defeating a force of 1,000 level 140 plus mythic monsters, even if they had a guild city as support. Without a guild city for protection, their only option was to give up. After all, players killed by those faux saint monsters would suffer heavy penalties. No wonder Lu Xingluo was so confident even while retreating. It turns out he still had such a trump card hidden, Shifeng said in sudden realization. Chuckling, he continued, it seems they are really desperate this time. It would have been a different story if Saint's Hand had mobilized this legion of mythic ranked faux saint monsters in a neutral map, but it was currently moving within the Twin Towers Kingdom's borders. The kingdom would definitely mobilize its army once it noticed the faux saint monsters. A kingdom's army wasn't in existence to be trifled with. This was especially true now that the NPC population in the game had skyrocketed. Once the Twin Towers Kingdom mobilized its army, even a force of 1,000 mythic monsters would meet a tragic end. Meanwhile, this legion of mythic ranked faux saint monsters was probably close to everything Saint's Hand had. The fact that Saint's Hand was willing to go so far probably meant that Lu Xinglua and the various superpowers had paid it an astronomical price. Anxiously, Fire Dance asked, Guild leader, should we withdraw our members from the tower now? No. Sure Feng shook his head. A manic gleam appearing in his eyes, he said, since these people wish to die, we'll fulfill their wish. When illusory words and fire dance heard Shifeng's words, their first thought was that he had truly gone mad. After all, he was actually still planning to engage the enemy in such a situation. A legion with 1,000 mythic ranked faux saint monsters was something only NPCs could handle at present. It simply wasn't a force players could go up against. Guild leader Black Flame. At this time, illusory words suddenly thought of something, and a hint of shock flashed in her eyes. That thing. Have you completed it? MHM. It's completed. Sure Feng nodded. However, I still need to make some final adjustments. For now, I'll have to trouble you two to gather our manpower at the tower as soon as possible. I'll meet you there. After saying so, Shifeng summoned the Thunder Eagle and flew straight to the Secret Covenant Tower. Chapter 2820, Sudden Appearance of the Steel Fortress Barren Forest City, Frostrain Ridge Frostrain Ridge was a level 70 map. Snow blanketed the place all year round, and it was famous for cryolite. In God's Domain, cryolite was one of the rare ores that could be used to manufacture alchemy tools. Hence, it had incredibly high demand. However, as its output was relatively low and the appearance of its deposits was random, its price was constantly high. Currently, one piece of cryolite could sell for 20 silver on the market. Hence, many newcomers in God's domain would choose to grind for levels in the Frostrain Ridge. Doing so earned them EXP and a considerable sum of money. However, the vast Frostrain Ridge was devoid of players and NPCs at this time. 
The entire map had become a land of death due to the invasion of faux saint monsters. Above Frostrain Ridge, a 20-meter-long dark fire crow flew through the sky and stopped before a 200-meter-long ancient demonic serpent hovering in the air. The ancient demonic serpent was like the king of the skies, overlooking all existences. Even the extraordinary ranked dark fire crow was like an infant before the ancient demonic serpent. In fact, despite being at the tier 3 peak standard, the dark fire crow actually bristled in fear when it arrived before the ancient demonic serpent. If not for its master forcing it, the dark fire crow would have tried to stay as far away as possible from the ancient demonic serpent. A total of 300 players rode on the back of the ancient demonic serpent. These players were all at least level 126 and radiated an aura similar to that of tier 4 mythic monsters. They wore black heavy armor, and their eyes gave off a bloody glow. In addition, leading these players were five bona fide tier 4 players. If Sherphone were here, he would recognize one of these five players, the short-haired woman Jade Leaf. At this time, though, she had a respectful and fearful expression on her face as she looked at the elderly man before her. Elder Windshadow, I apologize for the long wait, said Lu Xinglua from the Dark Fire Crow. At this time, Lu Xinglua's appearance had undergone significant changes. If one looked past the gray cloak he wore, one would notice scarlet runes ringing his neck. The pupils in his eyes were now dark gold reverse crosses. Smiling, Lu Xinglua said to the elderly man riding at the head of the ancient demonic serpent, I didn't expect Elder Windshadow to bring the Black Knights here. It seems that you really plan on making Zero Wing disappear. At this point, the various superpowers in God's domain knew very little about the guild known as Hundred Ghosts. However, Lu Xinglua was quite clear about how powerful the guild was. The Black Knight Legion was Hundred Ghosts' trump card legion, and it was much more powerful than even the five great super guilds trump card legions. This was because the members of this legion could no longer be considered human. Not only did every one of them possess a special bloodline, but even the weakest among them was at the flowing water realm standard. Combined, their five senses, raw power, and reaction speed allowed them to surpass even the average tier 4 player. The Black Knight's equipment standard was even more amazing. Every member was geared in tier 3 mana set equipment. With this set, even an ordinary tier 3 expert could hold their ground against tier 4 mythic monsters. Of course, this tier 3 mana set equipment wasn't something just anybody could use. This was because the set had an incredibly high strength requirement, which was already at the tier 4 standard. Even a tier 3 berserker who had invested all their free attribute points into strength couldn't meet this requirement, it was unrelated to the levels of players. Only these monsters the 100 ghosts nurtured could equip this tier 3 mana set equipment while still at tier 3. In addition, mana equipment had a massive flaw. Unlike ordinary equipment, mana equipment couldn't be repaired. Every reduction in durability was permanent. Hence, using this tier 3 mana set equipment was incredibly costly, even an existence like 100 ghosts dared not resort to it frequently. 100 ghosts had 1000 of such monstrous players. Although the guild had dispatched only 300 now, these players could already move across the main continent unhindered. It's nothing. Since Zero Wing thinks we are pushovers, this old man will let everyone know what we are capable of, Wind Shadow said as he looked at Lu Xinglua, who appeared rather inhuman, with indifferent eyes. He then shifted his attention to the man behind Lu Xinglua and asked, Guild leader Xinglua, won't you introduce the expert behind you? If one were to say that Lu Xinglua currently resembled a demonkin, then the mysterious, bandaged man sitting behind Lu Xinglua was a real demon. Although the bandaged man did not reveal his aura, he still made Wind Shadow feel threatened. Oh, right. I nearly forgot. Chuckling, Lu Xinglua said, let me introduce you. This person here is the real owner of Saint's Hand, Guild Leader Beast Emperor. Lu Xinglua's introduction surprised Wind Shadow slightly. I never thought that Saint's Hand would actually be the claws of the evil god's temple. Looking at the faux saint army on the ground below, Wind Shadow said, if that's the case, these faux saint monsters should be special evil beasts in disguise, right? That is incorrect, Elder Wind Shadow. This isn't a disguise but an evolution. Beast Emperor said, smiling. Now that you've witnessed the power of the faux saint army, if you need its help in the future, feel free to contact me through Xinglua, Elder Wind Shadow. That won't be necessary for hundred ghosts. However, it seems you have quite a grudge against Zero Wing, Lord Beast Emperor, Wind Shadow said as he glanced at the 1000 mythic ranked faux saint monsters marching at the front of the faux saint army. Such a large scale operation will definitely attract the attention of the Twin Towers Kingdom's NPC army. If they move, I believe your faux saint army will suffer severe losses. You've misunderstood me, Elder Wind Shadow. I might have a grudge against Zero Wing, but I would very much like to thank Black Flame. If not for his help, I wouldn't have gotten this far. I am here now only to help Xing Luo with his problem, as well as meet with my old friend Black Flame, Beast Emperor retorted nonchalantly. It was as if he placed no importance on the kingdom's army whatsoever. I see. Since that's the case, do you mind leaving Black Flame and Zero Wing's tier 4 experts to us? Wind Shadow asked. No problem. Nodding, Beast Emperor said, I only want their corpses. After Wind Shadow and Beast Emperor reached an agreement, they continued toward the Secret Covenant Tower. While the two powers were traveling to the Secret Covenant Tower, two people riding a blazing dragon were observing their movements from far away using a magic mirror. Amazing. I never thought that Beast Emperor would actually be Saint's Hand's true guild leader. Looking at Wind Shadow's and Beast Emperor's figures displayed on the magic mirror, Cold Shadow smiled and said, with those 300 monsters from 100 ghosts joining in, Zero Wing really is doomed this time. 
Should we still go to the secret covenant tower, then? Whitefeather asked. No. Now that such a large army is heading to the tower, we might get dragged into the fight if we aren't careful, Cold Shadow replied, shaking her head. If Zero Wing doesn't concede the tower this time, it will definitely suffer a heavy loss. Right now, Hundred Ghosts and Beast Emperor pose more of a danger to us. We need to head back now and make the necessary preparations. The War of Worlds will be coming soon. After saying so, Cold Shadow took out a return scroll and teleported back to the Fire Dragon Empire. She had no intention of watching the upcoming fight whatsoever. After all, the fight's outcome was a no-brainer. Rather than watching a walkover, her time would be better spent improving her strength. In the meantime, the members of Zero Wing, Unyielding Soul, and Crimson Emperor who were grinding inside the Secret Covenant Tower had assembled outside the tower at the behest of their guild's executives. After seeing that everyone was gathered, Flying Shadow approached her phone and reported, Guild leader, everyone grinding inside the tower has come out. They are ready to be dispatched at any time. Nodding, Shurfong said, Good. Have everyone get ready. Also, place those at the Advanced Magician Standard and above in a separate group. Yes, sir. Flying Shadow promptly executed Shurfang's instructions. While Flying Shadow was sorting out the assembled players, Shurfong flew several thousand yards away from the Secret Covenant Tower and began chanting an incantation. After he had chanted for 30 seconds, the region suddenly darkened as a gigantic magic array with a radius of several thousand yards suddenly appeared in the sky. This was undoubtedly the largest magic array anyone present had ever seen. However, before anyone could react to this situation, a metal fortress that was as large as a mountain slowly emerged from the magic array. Chapter 2821, Astonishing Mobile Fortress The metal fortress gradually descended from the sky, its whole figure eventually appearing before everyone's eyes. Silence fell over the entire region. From a distance, the metal behemoth several kilometers wide and hundreds of meters tall hovering about a dozen meters above the ground looked like some kind of slumbering island monster. With the appearance of this metal behemoth, the mana within a 10,000 yard radius began converging upon it. Even the players standing several hundred yards away could sense dense mana flowing around them. Everyone's eyes nearly fell out of their sockets. Even Flying Shadow, who had seen many spectacular sights throughout his career in God's Domain, was dumbfounded. Only after a long time had passed did he manage to snap out of his daze. A Sky City? No. This is a fortress. Moreover, it's a sky fortress capable of movement. A sky fortress. I must be dreaming. When the gathered players recovered from their initial shock, exclamations rang out one after another. As everyone gazed at the steel fortress in front of them, their minds churned with excitement, disbelief, and madness unyielding souls and Crimson Emperor's members, in particular, eyed Zero Wing's members with envy. At this time, God's domain had already become something like a real world. For many people, the game was an important part of their lives. Numerous fantastic sceneries that couldn't be found in the real world could be found in God's domain. Moreover, there were still countless unexplored maps and unknown sceneries awaiting discovery. In this wonderful world, everyone had their own dreams. Among these dreams, the biggest one would most likely be to gain the ability to fly freely in the sky. However, flying mounts were incredibly rare in God's domain, not something ordinary experts could get their hands on. Even the various superpowers only had a few flying mounts. Yet in an era where there were hardly any flying mounts, Zero Wing had actually obtained a sky fortress. Who wouldn't grow crazy and envious over this fact? Looking at the assembled players' shocked expressions, Shurfong chuckled and said, All right, I've already granted entry access to everyone. You can now head inside. The magician team, follow me. In reality, even Shurfong harbored a great yearning for the mobile fortress. In the past, he could only look at the various super guilds' mobile fortresses from afar. As these mobile fortresses were generally deployed to strategic locations, such as level 150 plus maps, they were never open to the public. At most, those super guilds would allow their allies to visit their mobile fortresses. Everyone else was barred from entering. Now, he had finally gained a mobile fortress of his own. As soon as Shurfong finished speaking, the gathered crowd promptly jumped into the fortress's open steel gate. The moment everyone entered the fortress, they sustained another shock. This was because the mobile fortress's interior was like a completely different world compared to outside. E. Not only did the fortress's interior have astonishingly dense mana, but it also increased players' affinity with mana. Even those insensitive to mana could feel their affinity with mana improving significantly. The environmental effects of this fortress were far superior to those of any city they had ever visited. Most importantly, when inside the fortress, everyone could feel the foreign energy corroding their bodies vanishing rapidly. After making some rough calculations, they concluded that resting for one hour inside the fortress yielded the same recovery effects as resting for one day in the outside world. This benefit would greatly enhance their leveling speed. Moreover, the boost to concentration recovery in the fortress was at least two or three times stronger than in the various guild cities. Crap. If I can rest and train my skills here, I can probably get twice the results I'd get from training in Stone Forest City's combat rooms. You'd probably get even better results if you train combat techniques here since combat techniques place much greater emphasis on mana control. Meanwhile, the boost to mana affinity this place provides would most likely improve one's mana control by a significant margin. After everyone entered the mobile fortress, they quickly understood its hidden benefits, and their eyes glowed with excitement. 
Resting was an important part of a player's life in God's domain. In fact, resting accounted for around one-third of the time most players spent in the game. Even combat fanatics spent at least one-fifth of their time resting. This was especially true for players grinding in level 100 plus neutral maps, where foreign energies constantly corroded their bodies. After the corrosion reached a certain extent, players would have to rest even if they didn't want to. Otherwise, death would claim them. Hence, rest areas were incredibly important for players. So long as a player had a good place to rest in, their leveling speed and self-improvement speed would both improve significantly. This was especially true for expert players. Peak experts would even pay high prices to visit the capitals of kingdoms and empires just to recover quickly. This was because these cities sold foods and beverages that could greatly enhance recovery rates, as well as offer other buffs. If not for the high price tags of these delicacies, even ordinary experts would fight to buy them. After Sherfone entered the mobile fortress, he led the magician team straight to the fortress lord's mansion. Looking at the 1000 plus advanced magicians before him, Sherfone said, the fortress's magic arrays are fully operational now. What I need you to do is work in shifts of 300 to maintain the normal operation of these magic arrays. Do you have any questions? The mobile fortress was mainly made up of magic crystals, and most of its operations relied on mana. Hence, a lot of manpower was required to operate it. This small mobile fortress needed 300 advanced magicians to keep its magic arrays fully operational. In addition, the mobile fortress consumed a lot more magic crystals than guild cities. Just its normal operation mode cost 50,000 magic crystals per day. If the fortress's offensive and defensive magic arrays were activated as well, this cost would zoom. It was fortunate that Sherfone was incredibly wealthy right now. Even after deducting the magic crystals used in the mobile fortress's construction, he still had 5.8 million magic crystals left. Otherwise, even if he had completed the mobile fortress, he wouldn't have dared activate it. After all, Zero Wing still had many areas it needed magic crystals for. Leave it to us, Guild Leader Black Flame. We will make sure nothing goes wrong with these magic arrays, the advanced magicians responded enthusiastically, none of them dissatisfied at getting assigned the menial task of maintaining magic arrays. This was because the benefits of working in the Fortress Lord's mansion were practically visible to the naked eye. The mana inside the mansion was much denser than the mana outside, and the boost in mana affinity was much stronger as well. This place was not only an excellent rest area but also an excellent training environment for magicians like themselves. They couldn't find such a wonderful environment in the outside world even if they wanted to. Meanwhile, less than half an hour after the mobile fortress appeared, news of its existence spread like wildfire. In no time at all, word of it appeared on the Twin Towers Kingdom's official forums. Sky Fortress appears beside the Secret Covenant Tower. For a time, players throughout the kingdom were in an uproar. Chapter 2822, Pinnacle of God's Domain. A Sky Fortress. What's going on? This is a lie. This is definitely a lie. How can such a thing appear at this stage of the game? There are pictures and videos of it. I heard that the fortress's interior is a paradise for training. It even provides a significant boost to mana affinity. Zero Wing is really on the rise now. When news regarding the small mobile fortress first broke out in the Twin Towers Kingdom, many people refused to believe it. After all, no matter how they thought about it, they simply couldn't see how Zero Wing could come to possess such a mythical fortress. However, the information leak came with photographic and video evidence, even if everyone refused to believe the report, they couldn't change the fact that Zero Wing owned a flying fortress. The leaked video showed a fortress hundreds of meters tall, covered in all kinds of magic runes, hovering in the sky above the secret covenant tower. A faint layer of mist enveloped the fortress. From afar, it looked like a city found in paradise. No words could describe how spectacular the fortress was. This sky fortress looks so cool. The view from up there will definitely be amazing. When will this sky fortress be open to the public? I heard Zero Wing is limiting entry to its members and allies. I doubt anyone else will have the chance to visit the fortress. After all, it isn't particularly large. It should house one or two million people at most. Moreover, it is even being used to garrison the Secret Covenant Tower. Zero Wing isn't letting any outsiders get close to the tower now, let alone the Sky Fortress. I'm joining Zero Wing. I must join Zero Wing. The Twin Towers Kingdom's players, both independent and guild members, couldn't help drooling when they saw the Sky Fortress above the Secret Covenant Tower. Many independent players immediately thought of joining Zero. Wing. The fight in Sky Spring City had already proven that Zero Wing, unyielding soul, and Crimson Emperor's rule over the city and the Secret Covenant Tower was unshakable. Zero Wing even revealed that it had five tier four players, far surpassing the various superpowers. The addition of the Sky Fortress basically solidified Zero Wing's hold over the Secret Covenant Tower. Now, it would be utterly impossible for the various superpowers to compete with Zero Wing when it came to providing their members with an excellent leveling spot. For a time, the number of players visiting Zero Wing's residences to apply for guild membership skyrocketed. The atmosphere within Zero Wing was also boiling, with many members celebrating the fact that they had not rashly quit the guild. Meanwhile, unyielding heart and illusory words arrived in front of the Secret Covenant Tower together with a bunch of Tier 3 experts. When they saw the mobile fortress floating above the tower, despite having long known about the fortress, they were still shocked. After all, the mobile fortress was simply too overwhelming. Tier 3 players might not be able to tell, but as Tier 4 players, the two of them could clearly feel that all the mana within a 10,000 yard radius had converged upon the fortress. This was an unimaginable amount of mana. 
Most importantly, the mobile fortress was capable of movement. Just this point alone made it invincible. After all, if the fortress faced an insurmountable opponent in a certain location, it could simply transfer elsewhere. With this mobile fortress, Zero Wing has truly reached the pinnacle of God's domain, unyielding heart said enviously as he looked at the mobile fortress. He couldn't help sighing ruefully. Back when he first learned of Zero Wing's existence, Zero Wing had only been a small guild. Now, even unyielding soul had to look up to it. Of course, Zero Wing's foundation was still weak. However, so long as the guild could maintain its hold over the secret covenant tower, its rise would be inevitable. Nodding in agreement with unyielding heart's words, illusory words said, although I don't know whether we can successfully defend the secret covenant tower, even if we fail, it wouldn't affect Zero Wing by much. With this mobile fortress, Zero Wing can simply set up shop in a level 130 map. At that time, the leveling speed of its members wouldn't be in any way inferior to grinding in the tower. They just wouldn't be able to produce tier 3 players as quickly as before. Previously, Zero Wing could be described as a ferocious tiger. While it was incredibly strong in one-on-one -on -one combat, it was still vulnerable against multiple strong opponents. However, after gaining the mobile fortress, Zero Wing had become a behemoth that no superpower could threaten. Even economic suppression would no longer be effective against it. Let's hurry inside. Looking at the time, Unyielding Heart said, the Faux Saint army should arrive in just a few more hours. MHM. If we can defend the tower, our two guilds might be able to contest with those super guilds, illusory words said, glancing at the secret covenant tower behind her. She then led her subordinates into the mobile fortress. While the three guilds tier 3 experts were entering the mobile fortress one after another, the distant Faux Saint army was steadily making its way to the secret covenant tower. Throughout its march, the army continuously devoured the players and NPCs it came across, adding to its numbers. Lord Beast Emperor, will we have any problems with the mobile fortress Zero Wing brought out? Lu Xingluo asked worriedly as he looked at Beast Emperor. According to reports, more than 40,000 tier 3 players have also gathered in the fortress. The fight in Sky Spring City had gutted Starlink's combat power, the guild would take a long time to recover from this loss. If he failed to secure the Secret Covenant Tower this time, he would most likely have to lie low for some time. Someone might even replace him as Starlink's guild leader. He had a very good understanding of that old undead's personality. That person definitely wouldn't let him remain as Starlink's guild leader simply because he was the heir of a major corporation. After all, the only reason Hundred Ghosts was even willing to partner with Starlink was that old undead. It had nothing to do with him at all. Meanwhile, the defensive capabilities of a fortress far surpassed those of a guild city. Zero Wing's mobile fortress definitely wouldn't have any problems defending against the attacks of Tier 4 mythic monsters. Relax. This mobile fortress might pose a problem for other people since it is floating in the sky, but you shouldn't forget that mythic ranked Faux Saint monsters can fly. They are walking now only because they need to protect the Great Lords and Grand Lords, Beast Emperor replied nonchalantly. A fortress might be capable of blocking the attacks of mythic monsters, but doing so should still consume a large amount of mana. How long do you think a fortress can last against the bombardment of a thousand mythic monsters? If they had only several dozen mythic monsters, they would indeed be helpless against a fortress. After all, the attacks of mythic monsters couldn't exceed the defensive threshold of a fortress's defensive magic array. However, 1000 mythic monsters would be a different story. The attack of each mythic monster might deplete only a small portion of the defensive magic array's mana, but when multiplied by 1000, even a main city's defensive magic array wouldn't last very long. Yes, you're right. Who can possibly go up against 1000 mythic monsters? Lu Xingluo regained his confidence when he looked at the mythic ranked Faux Saint monsters marching on the ground below. A fortress might be amazing, but there was also strength in numbers. After saying so, Lu Xingluo looked at the giant serpent flying nearby, a cold glint appearing in his eyes. Hundred Ghosts' ancient demonic serpent was an extraordinary existence. Not only was the flying mount itself at the tier 4 mythic standard, but it was also a legendary flying mount, one of the rulers of the sky during ancient times. According to rumors, the strength of the ancient demonic serpent's bloodline was close to rivaling that of dragons. In air combat, the combat power it could display surpassed even that of a flying ship. Hence, their side wouldn't necessarily lose to Zero Wing's mobile fortress in air combat. Time passed quickly. After traveling for another six hours, Lu Xingluo and Beast Emperor saw a gigantic, floating fortress on the distant horizon. So, that is the mobile fortress. Beast Emperor was a little surprised when he first laid eyes on the mobile fortress. Afterward, though, a smirk appeared on his face. Black Flame, I admit that you are indeed capable. However, I wonder if you'll go mad if I destroy this fortress of yours. After saying so, Beast Emperor gestured with his hand. In response, his army's 1,000 mythic-ranked Faux Saint Saboteurs, one, took to the skies and flew straight toward the mobile fortress. Their speed in the air was just slightly inferior to that of flying mounts, and they gave Zero Wing's side no time to react whatsoever. Chapter 2823, Fortress's Abilities The 1,000 Faux Saint Saboteurs flew across the sky with their 10-meter-tall bodies. From the mobile fortress's perspective, they looked like a dark cloud flowing toward it. In addition, over a million Faux Saint monsters marched toward the fortress on the ground. The ground shook with every step these monsters took, the spectacular sight stupefying the players standing guard on the mobile fortress. It seems we can't underestimate this beast emperor, after all. Despite being only a puppet of the evil god, he's actually capable of mobilizing so many mythic monsters. 
With this, even if we don't make a move, Zero Wing probably won't last very long, a five meter tall, middle-aged man atop the ancient demonic serpent said. Laughing, he continued, we won't even get to teach Zero Wing a lesson now. Although this golden armored giant only spoke normally, his deep voice made the surrounding space tremble. If Sure Phone were here, he would definitely be shocked to see this golden armored giant. This middle-aged man was not only a bona fide giant but also a level 133, tier 4 berserker. The surrounding space already grew heavier just from the aura he exuded. That isn't necessarily a bad thing. With this, we can avoid exposing our strength and reduce the Black Knight Legion's expenditure, Wind Shadow said as he looked at the faux saint monsters above and below him. Don't forget that our goal this time is to rescue the good-for-nothing brat from Sky Spring City's prison. Dealing with Zero Wing is secondary. I guess you're right. Let's hope Sky Spring City's magistrate can let me stretch my muscles a little, the Golden Armored Giant said, nodding. While Wind Shadow and the Golden Armored Giant were conversing, Jade Leaf, who sat at a side, dared not utter a word, shame filling her face. Protecting and rescuing Awakened Abyss should have been her job, yet she had to turn to Elder Windshadow and Long Day, the Vice Commander of Hundred Ghosts' main force, for help. This was a severe dereliction of duty on her part. She was very likely to get removed from the priority list for training when she returned to the Guild's headquarters. After all, not only was Awakened Abyss one of Hundred Ghosts' top talents, but his status was one that even Elder Windshadow dared not offend. Inside the mobile fortress, Unyielding Heart and Illusory Words saw the overwhelming army of faux saint monsters and couldn't help gasping in shock. Although they had long since known that their enemy consisted of over a million faux saint monsters and 1,000 faux saint saboteurs, this terrifying scene still frightened them. The faux saint army on the ground aside, just the 1,000 faux saint saboteurs in the air already posed a massive threat. Such a large force of mythic monsters could easily break through even the defensive magic arrays of NPC cities. Generally, fortresses possessed significantly stronger defensive magic arrays than cities. However, the mobile fortress was different from a stationary fortress. To gain the convenience of movement, the mobile fortress sacrificed a portion of its defensive capabilities. Hence, while the mobile fortress was still capable of blocking the attacks of these faux saint saboteurs, it was unknown how long it could continue doing so. Once the defensive barrier broke, these faux saint saboteurs would slaughter the players inside the fortress. Even tier 4 players like themselves wouldn't be able to stop these monsters. After all, the difference in numbers was simply too massive. Everyone, get ready. Attack with everything you've got once these faux saint monsters enter within range. Unyielding heart shouted. Remember. Do not hold back anything. Fight with everything you've got right off the bat. Only by removing these mythic monsters as soon as possible will we have a greater chance of victory. Yes, sir. When the players stationed atop of the fortress walls saw the approaching faux saint saboteurs, they couldn't help gulping nervously. The outcome of the upcoming battle would be decided by whether they managed to finish off these faux saint saboteurs before the latter destroyed the fortress's defensive magic array. This would be a race against the duration of the defensive barrier. Meanwhile, on the fortress lord's mansion's top floor, which was also the highest point in the fortress. Guild leader, they're here, Fire Dance reported. When the faux saint saboteurs were less than 1,000 yards away from the fortress, she asked nervously, should we start attacking now? No, let them come closer, Sherfone said, shaking his head. The mobile fortress had 26 large magic elven cannons and 8 magic charging towers. Its overall firepower exceeded that of guild cities by leaps and bounds. However, this frightening firepower came at an equally frightening cost. Every shot the large magic elven cannons fired cost 6,000 magic crystals, and they had a cooldown of one minute. As for the magic charging towers, they cost 20,000 magic crystals to fire each time and had a cooldown of 3 minutes. Although Sherfone had over 5 million magic crystals on hand, he still couldn't afford to employ these weapons freely. Hence, they had to make the most of every shot. Meanwhile, a distance of 1,000 yards was practically nothing to the mythic ranked faux saint saboteurs. Just 3 seconds later, they appeared before the mobile fortress's defensive barrier. Immediately afterward, all 1,000 faux saint saboteurs raised the various weapons they held and launched a barrage of ruthless attacks on the defensive barrier. The next moment, deafening noises came from outside the mobile fortress. Numerous spatial tears also appeared around the fortress's defensive barrier. The barrier itself trembled violently, and even the players inside the fortress could clearly sense the power of the attacks. Outside the mobile fortress, the thunderous assault was audible even from over 10,000 yards away. What powerful attacks! If it were a guild city's defensive magic array, it would have most likely crumbled at the first wave of attacks, Long Day exclaimed in astonishment. The simultaneous attacks of 1,000 mythic monsters were simply earth-shattering. Even a tier 5 large-scale destruction spell would pale in comparison to this barrage. Jade Leaf also nodded in agreement. Even an NPC main city's defensive magic array would suffer tremendously before this combined attack, let alone a measly mobile fortress. However, when the attacks ended, 100 Ghosts' members and the players standing atop the mobile fortress's walls were all stunned. It's fine. At this time, not only were there no cracks on the defensive barrier, but the magic power oscillation from the barrier also remained frighteningly smooth and steady. It was evident that the faux saint saboteur's attacks failed to reach the barrier's defensive limit. Meanwhile, at the fortress lord's mansion, Fire Dance goggled in shock. Isn't this barrier a little too strong? She had a clear view of the defensive barrier's energy level right now. 
let alone 1%, the barrier barely lost 0.01% of its mana reserves after the faux Saint Saboteur's first wave of attacks. Given a depletion rate of 0.01% per second, the faux Saint Saboteur's would take 166 minutes to break the barrier. However, the barrier's mana reserves could be replenished at intervals of 30 minutes, with each restoration costing 100,000 magic crystals. In other words, so long as they had sufficient magic crystals, the 1,000 mythic monsters before them wouldn't be able to destroy the mobile fortress's defensive magic array, no matter what. Not bad, Sherfong said calmly. Inwardly, though, he, too, was surprised by this outcome. He never thought that the mobile fortress's defensive capabilities were so amazing. No wonder the mobile fortresses I saw in my previous life were capable of blocking the attacks of even tier 5 players. The next moment, Sherfong turned to Fire Dance and said, Have the ones below start testing the power of the magic elven cannons. Chapter 2824, Silent World At Sherfang's command, Fire Dance notified the players stationed at the 26 large magic elven cannons. In response, all 26 cannons in the mobile fortress began gathering and condensing mana from their surroundings. The originally mist-like mana liquefied. The condensed liquid mana then flowed into the cannons. A short moment later, a crimson, threefold magic array appeared before the muzzles of these cannons, the tremendous power these magic arrays carried distorting the surrounding space. The next moment, after the faux Saint Saboteurs completed their third barrage, 26 crimson beams shot into the dusky sky all of a sudden. These beams of light then burst in midair, and numerous smaller beams rained down on the mythic monsters. Even though the faux Saint Saboteurs had reacted quickly to the attack, they were somewhat crowded, so most of them still ended up engulfed by the crimson rain. When the crimson rain ended, what entered everyone's eyes were the faux Saint Saboteurs' battered bodies. Every mythic monster that got caught under the red rain had burn marks modeling their bodies, with some even on fire. Meanwhile, the attacked Faux Saint Saboteur's 7.3 billion HP fell below 5.5 billion, with some even having only around 4 billion HP remaining. Aren't those cannons a little too powerful? Unyielding Heart, who was commanding the battle from the wall, was astonished at this sudden turn of events. Normally, killing mythic monsters was a long and arduous process. Yet, the large elven magic cannons dealt over 200 million damage per attack. Moreover, their AoE covered at least an 800-yard radius. Had the faux Saint Saboteurs positioned themselves more closely together, just one volley from the 26 cannons might have been enough to reduce the HP of these mythic monsters to a critical level, and two volleys would be enough to wipe them out of existence. At this time, let alone the players inside the mobile fortress, even Lu Xing Luo and Beast Emperor were thunderstruck. How is this possible? How can a fortress possess such strong offensive capabilities? Lu Xing Luo felt his brain freezing when he saw that the faux Saint Saboteurs had lost a quarter of their HP from just one volley. He had seen fortresses before. He had also seen fortresses dealing with monster tides before. From what he had seen, fortresses indeed possessed incredible offensive capabilities. Even facing an army of 100,000 monsters and over a dozen mythic monsters, a fortress could easily emerge victorious within an hour. However, what was up with this mobile fortress in front of him? The mobile fortress's cannons had actually reaped a quarter of the faux Saint Saboteur's HP with just one volley. In other words, just four cannon volleys would be enough to annihilate most of the saboteurs. At this time, even hundred ghosts' members, who were watching the fun from afar, were shocked by this outcome. They never thought that the mobile fortress would possess such puissant offensive capabilities. Although they had the means to evade the attacks of these large magic elven cannons, just one mistake would mean an express trip to the afterlife for them. Only the ancient demonic serpent could possibly endure a blow from the cannons. Out of everyone on the battlefield, only Sherfong didn't find this outcome surprising. After all, the mobile fortress was a stronghold capable of resisting tier 5 existences. If it didn't even have the ability to go up against a group of tier 4 monsters, how could it go up against tier 5 monsters? However, Sherfang's heart still ached after this volley. After all, the 26 shots fired cost 156,000 magic crystals in total. Converted to coins, that was 62,400 gold. While Sherfone was feeling distressed, Beast Emperor hurriedly gave out a command to the faux Saint Saboteurs. Spread out and attack from all directions. I refuse to believe they can fire those cannons without limit. The use of any strategic weapon in God's domain came at a great price. Given the effects of the large magic elven cannons, he doubted that Zero Wing could keep on firing those things forever. Following Beast Emperor's command, the faux Saint Saboteurs promptly scattered around the mobile fortress. Now, each cannon fire would hit several dozen saboteurs, at most, simultaneously. In this scenario, it would take several hundred shots from the cannons to annihilate all 1,000 saboteurs. Despite seeing this situation, Sherfong remained unfazed. Start the magic charging towers as well. Yes, sir. Upon hearing Sherfang's command, Fire Dance couldn't help feeling a little excited. If the large magic elven cannon's attack was a fusillade, then the magic charging towers attack was a carpet bombing. Moreover, its power reached the tier 5 threshold. Immediately, the eight magic charging towers scattered across the mobile fortress began accumulating mana, transforming into eight miniature suns that brightly illuminated the entire fortress. Before the faux Saint Saboteurs could react to this development, the eight miniature suns shot into the sky and transformed into eight threefold magic arrays, each covering a 2,000-yard radius. These gigantic magic arrays extended over not only the entirety of the mobile fortress but also everything within a 2,000-yard radius of the fortress. What? 
Have they lost their minds? Lu Xinglua was thunderstruck when he saw the eight gigantic magic arrays in the sky. While he didn't know exactly how powerful these magic arrays were, going by the fact that they had drawn in all mana within a 10,000 yard radius, he could easily imagine how powerful they were. However, these magic arrays didn't cover just the faux saint saboteurs. Even the mobile fortress itself lay within the magic arrays AOE. By deploying these magic arrays, Zero Wing was basically saying it intended to die with the saboteurs. Run. All of you, run away. Seeing the eight magic arrays panicked Beast Emperor into ordering the Faux Saint army to retreat because the Faux Saint saboteurs weren't the only ones caught within the magic arrays AoE. The magic arrays also covered one third of the Faux Saint army on the ground. For a time, the Faux Saint saboteurs in the air and the Faux Saint monsters on the ground all could be seen turning around and fleeing. However, the eight magic arrays in the sky were simply too massive. Before any of the Faux Saint saboteurs could fly more than 1,000 yards away from the mobile fortress, a white light descended from the eight magic arrays. The next moment, everything within a 2,000-yard radius of the mobile fortress transformed into a world of white, the appearance of this white world bringing silence to the entire battlefield. Meanwhile, this white pillar of light was clearly visible even from tens of thousands of yards away. What's happening over there? That place should be where the secret covenant tower is. We can see it all the way from Sky Spring City. Just how big is the coverage of that beam? Most players in Sky Spring City were ignorant of the battle taking place at the secret covenant tower, so they couldn't help growing curious when they saw a white pillar of light suddenly appear in the distance. As for the player forces who knew of the battle, because of their insufficient strength, they could only spectate from a safe distance. Shortly afterward, the light pillar gradually dissipated. The Faux Saint army on the ground had also disappeared, and in their place were craters several dozen meters deep. As for the mythic-ranked Faux Saint saboteurs in the air, they fell to the ground one after another at this time. Although these saboteurs were still alive, every one of them had fallen into a heavily injured state, and their current combat power was nowhere near what they had before. Chapter 2825, All-Encompassing Seal a thousand mythic faux saint monsters got done in, just like that. When Unyielding Heart and the others standing on the mobile fortress's walls looked at the faux saint saboteurs scattered on the ground and saw that these mythic monsters had less than one third of their HPs remaining, they couldn't help gaping in shock. They had all anticipated a bitter fight. They had even prepared themselves to fight day and night and suffer innumerable casualties. After all, the faux saint monsters possessed above average combat standards and cunning minds. Their ability to learn and improve on combat techniques also made them increasingly tougher to fight as the battle went on. Moreover, their high HPs meant these faux saint monsters could stay in battle for long periods. However, with just two rounds of attacks, the mobile fortress had heavily injured the 1,000 mythic-ranked faux saint saboteurs and killed several hundred thousand lower-ranked faux saint monsters. This wasn't a battle but a one-sided massacre. No wonder he never paid any attention to the various superpowers from the very beginning. With this mobile fortress, even the five great super guilds would be helpless against the present Zero Wing. Unyielding Heart smiled bitterly when he looked at the land of death below the fortress. Whether it was Starlink or Hundred Ghosts, neither of them mattered in front of the mobile fortress. Meanwhile, atop the fortress lord's mansion, Sher Feng's heart ached once more. Activating all eight magic charging towers had cost him 160,000 magic crystals. At this stage of the game, even first-rate guilds would have 400,000 magic crystals, at most, in their stockpile. He had burned through nearly half of a first-rate guild's magic crystal stockpile in just one round of attacks. On the other hand, outside the mobile fortress, Hundred Ghosts' members, Lu Xinglua, and Beast Emperor all remained silent for a long time upon seeing the magic charging tower's attacks. Beast Emperor was especially shocked by this outcome. Originally, he thought that with his army of a million faux saint monsters, he could trample over the entire Twin Towers kingdom, that nobody short of the kingdom's NPC army would be a match for his army. Yet, now. As for Hundred Ghosts' members, they also felt pressured by this outcome. After all, the mythic-ranked faux saint saboteurs had survived the mobile fortress's attacks due only to their high HP. If players like themselves were to suffer a hit from one of these attacks, they would die without question. At this time, Jade Leaf turned to Windshadow and said, Elder Windshadow, this mobile fortress is too powerful. If we charge in blindly, I'm afraid our chances are slim. In air combat, the ancient demonic serpent was indeed powerful. It could even go up against a handful of faux saint saboteurs simultaneously and still hold the upper hand. However, even if the ancient demonic serpent could survive the mobile fortress's heaven-defying blow, they, the flying mount's passengers, would most definitely be reduced to ashes. Not to mention, despite the mutually destructive blow, the mobile fortress's defensive barrier remained intact. Such being the case, even the ancient demonic serpent's strongest blow would only exhaust some of the barrier's energy reserves. After hesitating for some time, Wind Shadow announced, We're retreating. The ancient demonic serpent was a tier 4 legendary flying mount. Its strongest blow touched upon the threshold of tier 5 an attack that even an advanced guild city's defensive magic array couldn't withstand. Originally, Wind Shadow believed that, while the mobile fortress's defensive magic array might be strong, destroying it shouldn't be a problem for the ancient demonic serpent, given enough time. However, let alone destroying the barrier, just surviving the purifying light would be a problem. Since it was evident they couldn't do anything against the mobile fortress, they naturally had no reason to remain here. At this time, Wind Shadow wasn't the only person with such thoughts. Beast Emperor similarly commanded his faux saint army to retreat immediately. After ordering a retreat, Beast Emperor looked at Lu Xinglua and said, Let's go. There's no point in staying here anymore. Trying to clash with the mobile fortress now was simply suicidal. 
Their only choice was to retreat and figure out other options to deal with the fortress. Securing the secret Covenant Tower was also no longer possible. So long as the mobile fortress remained in the tower's vicinity, they couldn't do anything about the tower. Lord Beast Emperor, don't you have any way at all? I've bet everything on you. Lu Xinglua said, looking at Beast Emperor with crazed eyes. Starlink had suffered a massive blow from the battle in Sky Spring City. He would be finished if he failed to secure the secret Covenant Tower as well. Xinglua, you might not be able to return to Starlink, but with the Starlene Corporation's financial strength, you can still follow me, Beast Emperor consoled. You've seen for yourself how quickly the Faux Saint army expands. It will only grow stronger from now on. Even that old undead backing you won't be able to go up against the Faux Saint army in the future. As for Zero Wing, I will eventually erase its existence from God's domain. When Beast Emperor mentioned the name Zero Wing, his voice grew cold. If not for Zero Wing's interference, his army would have long since trampled over Star Moon Kingdom and the Black Dragon Empire. He wouldn't have had to resort to creating Saint's Hand, an organization filled with cunning opportunists, to help him. As for the losses he suffered this time, he didn't place much importance on them. After all, for his current self, Faux Saint monsters below Mythic rank were incredibly easy to produce. As for the Mythic rank Faux Saint saboteurs, while they were severely weakened right now, if they focused on fleeing, nobody could stop them. Zero Wing would be able to kill only a few of them at most. In addition, after today's event, he finally understood the reason for Zero Wing's confidence. Now, all he needed to do was wait. He would wait until he produced a Tier 5 Faux Saint monster. So long as a Tier 5 Faux Saint monster appeared, let alone Zero Wing's mobile fortress, even God's domain's various kingdoms and empires would no longer pose a threat to him. However, producing a Tier 5 Faux Saint monster wasn't an easy task. It required a large number of Tier 4 Faux Saint monsters to serve as a base, as well as a large amount of resources. Only after fulfilling these two conditions could he produce a Tier 5 Faux Saint monster. Meanwhile, Lu Xinglua, the heir of the Starlene Corporation, was the perfect cash cow to help him fulfill these requirements. After hearing Beast Emperor's words, Lu Xinglua could only nod in frustration, throwing in his lot with Beast Emperor. From today onward, he would stand against the players of God's domain and acquire the upper zone resources he needed from Beast Emperor. This was also Lu Xinglua's only option. Otherwise, let alone the position of Starlink's guild leader, he might even get replaced as the Starlene Corporation's heir. After all, there were still several reserve heirs in the corporation eagerly waiting to supplant him. Upon seeing the distant dark fire crow and ancient demonic serpent turning around and leaving, Fire Dance smiled and said, Guild leader, it seems they plan to retreat. She found their enemy's decision to retreat reasonable. After all, anyone would lose the will to fight after witnessing that devastating blow. Unfortunately, they couldn't deal any additional damage to the Faux Saint army. Although the mobile fortress possessed incredible offensive capabilities, it had no means to seal its opponents in place. It would also be foolish to leave the safety of the fortress to pursue the Faux Saint monsters. This was most likely what Lu Xinglua and the others hoped to see the most. Leave. Since they're already here, then they shouldn't think of leaving. Sherfong smiled when he saw the retreating figures of Beast Emperor and Hundred Ghosts as members. He then took out 3,000 mana stones he had synthesized beforehand and injected them into the core of the unsealed world mirror. An invisible ripple of energy immediately spread rapidly from the mobile fortress to the surroundings. A moment later, a dense layer of mist formed around the edges of the map of the Secret Covenant Tower. If one looked at the map from the outside, the inside of the map would appear illusory, like it was completely isolated from the outside world. Chapter 2826, Slaughter Time a map seal. Lu Xinglua's complexion darkened when he saw the scenery in the distance blur. The mobile fortress was an unshakable existence at this stage of the game. If they couldn't leave this place now, only death awaited them. How ruthless of Black Flame. He's actually thinking of keeping all of us here. Looking at the dense mist enveloping the entire map, Beast Emperor sneered, however, he must be dreaming if he thinks he can stop us with such a wide seal. In God's domain, the larger the area a magic barrier covered, the weaker it would be. While the map-wide barrier zero wing deployed might seem spectacular, only a fool would think that it could stop a force of 1,000 mythic-ranked Faux Saint saboteurs. After saying so, Beast Emperor had a small number of saboteurs in relatively good condition move ahead of the army and fly straight toward the mist. Meanwhile, sharing similar thoughts with Beast Emperor, Hundred Ghosts' members remained unfazed, even after seeing the whole map getting sealed. They calmly continued flying toward the map's border. Mobile Fortress, Fortress Lord's Mansion Seeing the Faux Saint army and Hundred Ghost members moving farther and farther away, Fire Dance couldn't help growing anxious. Guild leader, why don't we go after them? If we let them reach the barrier's edge, I'm afraid it'll become very difficult to keep them here. A barrier capable of sealing an entire map was indeed amazing. However, such an extensive barrier definitely couldn't rival the mobile fortress's barrier in terms of defensive capabilities. The seal would most likely break after a few attacks from the Faux Saint monsters. Smiling, Sherfong shook his head and said, No, let them run for a while longer. We'll first clean up the nearby Faux Saint saboteurs. Have unyielding heart and illusory words start moving as well. Also, have the elven cannons keep an eye on the Faux Saint army. If those monsters think of coming back, strike them down immediately. Other people might not understand the effects of the world mirror, but he did. Including the two additional crystalline mirrors he had obtained after killing those three NPCs from the Secret Hand Association, he now had six of the twelve mirrors that made up the world mirror. 
Although he still couldn't utilize many of the world mirror's functions since it was incomplete, he could isolate an entire map. Even tier 5 existences would have great difficulty breaking out of this isolated region. While the Faux Saint army indeed possessed great numbers, the quality of its combatants was severely inadequate. It would need over an hour of continuous attacking to deplete the world mirror's energy reserves. One hour was more than enough for Zero Wing to do a lot of things. Moreover, even if they couldn't finish off the Faux Saint army within one hour, he could simply inject another 3000 mana stones to replenish the world mirror's energy. Unlike defensive magic arrays, the world mirror did not have a cooldown for replenishing its energy reserves. The only trade-off was that once the world mirror was activated, it would remain active until it exhausted all its energy. It couldn't be turned off midway the way defensive magic arrays could. Most importantly, he had expended a lot of magic crystals in this battle. If he couldn't earn some EXP from these faux saint monsters, he would eat a huge loss. After all, no matter how many monsters the fortress's static defenses killed, none of the defenders inside the fortress would gain any EXP. At most, the defenders would get to collect the loot of the monsters. However, the faux saint monsters were basically beggars when it came to items. Even if they did drop items, those items would be of inferior quality. Their only saving grace was the above average EXP they provided when killed. After Sherfong finished speaking, he flew out of the mobile fortress and chased the fleeing faux saint saboteurs. Although the incomplete world mirror couldn't reduce the basic attributes of the hostile units trapped within it, it did reduce their movement speed and reaction speed. The movement speed of enemies flying in the air, in particular, was at least 60% slower. Furthermore, all of the faux saint saboteurs had suffered heavy injuries, which meant their flying speed became incredibly slow. After Sherfeng's departure, Fire Dance quickly carried out his commands before leaving the mobile fortress together with Violet Cloud. As for Lifeless Thorn and Solitary Nine, the two of them had long since followed Sherfeng out of the fortress. After all, mythic monsters were incredibly rare in the outside world. This was especially true for level 140 plus mythic monsters. Now that the 1000 Faux Saint Saboteurs before them were heavily injured, these mythic monsters were basically walking sacks of EXP. It would be a huge waste to let them get away. In less than 10 seconds, Sherfeng caught up with a group of several dozen saboteurs. He immediately brandished the light of two worlds. Lightning Edge The next moment, a river of lightning washed over the area ahead of him and extended up to 500 yards away. Damages exceeding 100 million then began appearing above the saboteurs' heads one after another. After the skill's 7 second duration ended, the saboteurs that were originally at critical HPs crumbled into ashes. Subsequently, Sherfang's experience bar rose rapidly. In just one second, he broke through to level 142. Some time later, his experience bar settled at 82% of level 142. The saboteurs were far more generous with EXP than the standard mythic monster. As for the 11 saboteurs that survived his attack, Sherfone used Formless Blade, a tier 4 legacy skill he had spent 110 legacy skill points to learn, on them. The next moment, the 13 sword lights the skill created transformed into innumerable shooting stars that struck down at the critically damaged saboteurs. Every one of these attacks dealt over 200 million damage to the mythic monsters, with critical hits dealing over 400 million damage, killing them on the spot. Immediately afterward, another bright glow enveloped Sherfone as he reached level 143. Meanwhile, following the deaths of these faux saint saboteurs, strands of dark gray mist escaped from their corpses and flowed into Sherfang's mind. Every strand of mist that entered his mind increased his affinity with mana by a small margin, and this bonus could be accumulated continuously. What a magical energy! Although I still got soul marks inflicted on me, like when I killed that faux saint devourer, the effect of this strange energy is completely different from the white mist from before. It is incredibly attractive to mana. Sherfang was surprised when he sensed the changes to his body. At this moment, Sherfang wasn't the only person to notice this benefit. The others who had joined in on the chase likewise noticed the benefit of killing the faux saint saboteurs. These faux saint saboteurs might not drop any loot, but they are truly walking treasure troves. If some of our tier 3 experts get this benefit, they should have a much easier time getting promoted to tier 4. After killing off two faux saint saboteurs, Unyielding Heart was surprised by the benefit he received. Some distance away, Illusory Words also killed a saboteur and noticed the unexpected benefit. Surprised, she exclaimed, these saboteurs are probably of greater help to us tier 4s. If we can continuously boost our mana affinity, we'll understand mana more easily. This will be of great help in breaking through the limits of our mana bodies. After reaching tier 4, improving one's mana body became of utmost importance. Now, these faux saint saboteurs were providing them with a shortcut for doing so. Upon thinking up to this point, the two of them hastened their killing speed. Now, they weren't just killing the saboteurs for EXP but for the sake of further improving themselves. For a time, Sherfone and the others could be seen frenziedly mowing down the fleeing faux saint saboteurs, their levels rising rapidly. Beast Emperor, who had reached the map's border, couldn't help gnashing his teeth angrily. He had gone to great lengths to produce these faux saint saboteurs, only for them to become leveling tools for Sherfong and the others. At this time, he had already lost more than 300 saboteurs. If he weren't afraid of the mobile fortress's offensive capabilities, he definitely would have commanded every surviving saboteur to surround and kill Sherfang's group. Black Flame. I'll make you pay sooner or later. Beast Emperor bellowed, a cold glint flashing in his eyes as he glared at Sherfong, over 10,000 yards away. Meanwhile, Lu Xing Lua, who sat beside Beast Emperor, also resolved to make sure Feng pay, both in God's domain and in the real world, for today's loss. 
Turning to the dense mist before him, Beast Emperor commanded the several hundred foe saint saboteurs around him, Attack! Shatter this damned barrier. Chapter 2827, Surrender and Death Obeying Beast Emperor's command, several hundred foe saint saboteurs swung their weapons at the dense mist before them. Although these saboteurs were heavily damaged, with their extraordinary techniques, they still managed to exhibit power at the mythic standard in their attacks. Boom. Every one of the saboteurs' attacks opened a tear in space upon impact, the spatial tears bringing momentary darkness to the area. When the spatial tears disappeared, though, both Beast Emperor and Lu Xing Luo were thunderstruck. Impossible. Defying expectations, the saboteurs' all-out attacks not only failed to crack the barrier, but the barrier didn't even fluctuate in the slightest. It remained perfectly intact like before. Hundred Ghosts' members were also surprised. Do these saboteurs not have enough power to shatter this barrier after being heavily injured? Jade Leaf wondered when she saw that the layer of mist remained dense despite the saboteurs' attacks. Being able to envelop an entire map and hinder teleportation and communication was already plenty amazing for a magic barrier. Yet, it was now revealed that this barrier could actually withstand the attacks of so many faux saint saboteurs. This was simply unbelievable. Nodding in agreement, Long Day, the Golden Armored Giant, said, they probably don't have enough destructive power. Let's make a move ourselves. It seems that is our only option, Wind Shadow said. Under Wind Shadow's manipulation, the ancient demonic serpent immediately opened its mouth and released a breath of darkness. The power of the breath attack far exceeded that of the foe Saint Saboteur's attacks, the attack eradicating everything in its path. Boom. Upon collision, the space within a several hundred yard radius of the point of impact turned into a dark void. The mist layer at that point also trembled violently, the vibrations extending several thousand yards away. Only after several seconds had passed did the mist layer revert to normal. It's still standing. Like Beast Emperor and Lu Xing Lua, Hundred Ghosts' members now had dumbfounded expressions on their faces. They couldn't believe what had just happened. After the Ancient Demonic Serpent got promoted to Tier 4, its all-out attack had power at the entry level of Tier 5. Even superior mythic monsters of the same level wouldn't dare take this attack head-on. In fact, this attack could one-shot the defensive magic arrays of guild cities. Yet, when this attack struck the barrier enveloping this entire map, it failed to create even a single crack. At this time, let alone Hundred Ghosts' members, even unyielding heart and illusory words, who had just caught up with the rest of the Faux Saint army, were stunned by the scene. Both of them could tell that the Demonic Serpent's attack was on par with the all-out attack of Tadelia the Soul Singer, a realm lord of the Ruined Mountain Range. Nevertheless, the Demonic Serpent's attack had failed to break through the seemingly flimsy layer of mist surrounding the map. The strength of this magic barrier was simply unheard of. Since this magic barrier enveloped the entire map, its withstanding Tier 4 attacks was already unbelievable, all the more Tier 5 attacks. With the combination of this magic barrier and the mobile fortress, Zero Wing was most likely invincible in God's domain already. However, Beast Emperor and Hundred Ghosts' members evidently had no intention of giving up. After snapping out of their daze, they promptly bombarded the Mist Layer in a frenzy. In their opinion, even if their attacks failed to destroy the barrier, their attacks had most likely exhausted a significant portion of the barrier's energy reserves. If they pressed their offensive, the barrier would crumble in no time at all. For a time, the Faux Saint Army and Ancient Demonic Serpent blitzed the magic barrier. Meanwhile, Shifeng's group mowed down the faux saint saboteurs they came across. One minute. Three minutes. Ten minutes. At this time, Shifeng's group had already killed over 600 saboteurs. From the EXP they gained, Shifeng had reached level 146, while Fire Dance, Violet Cloud, Unyielding Heart, and Illusory Words had reached level 141. Lifeless Thorn and Solitary Nine were now at level 143. When Shifeng and the others stood only 500 yards away from the Faux Saint army, Beast Emperor and Hundred Ghosts' members finally snapped out of their trance and stopped assailing the barrier. They then looked at Shifeng's group and the distant mobile fortress warily. It seems we meet again, Shifeng said, smiling as he looked at Beast Emperor and Wind Shadow. Now, will you surrender quietly, or do you want me to send you on your way? Black Flame, don't get too full of yourself. My saboteurs have fully recovered already. Beast Emperor snarled as he glared at Shifeng. Although I only have around 300 left, at this distance, killing you bunch won't be difficult. Beast Emperor's heart was practically bleeding from Shifeng's group killing nearly 700 of his Faux Saint saboteurs. If not for his fear of the mobile fortress, he would have long since had his Faux Saint army surround and kill Shifeng's group already. However, unlike Beast Emperor, Wind Shadow was exceptionally calm. Greetings, Guild Leader Black Flame. I am Wind Shadow, an elder of Hundred Ghosts. After taking a deep breath, Wind Shadow continued slowly, Hundred Ghosts admits defeat this time. We are willing to pay ransom for our release and the release of Awakened Abyss. Elder Wind Shadow. Jade Leaf was taken aback by Wind Shadow's words. Hundred Ghosts was different from the guilds of the main continent. Even the five great super guilds were of no significance to Hundred Ghosts. Yet, their guild was admitting defeat to Zero Wing. Their guild would turn into a laughingstock for the main continent's various superpowers. Moreover, they wouldn't have any way of explaining this humiliation to the guild's higher-ups. Beast Emperor and Lu Xing Luo were also stunned by this situation. They never thought that Wind Shadow would surrender without hesitation. This would undoubtedly reduce their chances of defeating Zero Wing's forces. Elder Windshadow, it seems Hundred Ghosts only amounts to this much. 
To think you are already afraid of Zero Wing before we even start fighting, Beast Emperor ridiculed. Lord Beast Emperor, Hundred Ghosts operates by its own rules. Moreover, Hundred Ghosts doesn't have much of a grudge against Zero Wing, to begin with. Our conflict simply stems from one of our juniors ignorantly offending Zero Wing in Sky Spring City. It is only right that he is punished, Wind Shadow retorted nonchalantly. How righteous of you, Elder Wind Shadow. I am truly in awe. Beast Emperor glared at Wind Shadow. He had never thought that the man would care so little for Hundred Ghost's reputation. It was evident that Wind Shadow was trying to disassociate Hundred Ghost from him in front of Shurfoam. Sneering, Beast Emperor said, Unfortunately, Black Flame won't necessarily spare you. That's right. I doubt Guild Leader Black Flame will let us off the hook so easily. Chuckling, Wind Shadow added, But what if I say Hundred Ghosts is willing to use a Tier 3 mana set equipment forging design as compensation? Have you lost your mind? Beast Emperor exclaimed in shock. Beast Emperor could tell how powerful Tier 3 mana set equipment was just by looking at the Black Knight seated behind Wind Shadow. If not for their lower levels, they could most likely exhibit combat power on par with the Faux Saint Saboteurs. Even without any Tier 4 players, just Hundred Ghosts' possession of this Tier 3 mana set equipment would most likely be enough to deter the five great super guilds from clashing with it. Yet, Wind Shadow was actually using the forging design for this divine equipment as ransom. Let alone Beast Emperor and Lu Xinglua, even Shurfong was stunned by Wind Shadow's offer. Originally, Shurfong had intended to make an exorbitant demand of Wind Shadow. And if Wind Shadow refused his demand, Shurfong would kill Hundred Ghosts' as members. After all, now that he had the mobile fortress, nobody could threaten Zero Wing's existence. Naturally, he wouldn't need to care about making an enemy of Hundred Ghosts. However, Shurfong couldn't help being moved by Wind Shadow's offer. Tier 3 mana set equipment was something he knew plenty about because its existence was recorded in the mana forging notes. However, the volume he owned did not include its production method. Looking at Shurfong, Wind Shadow asked, May I know if you are willing to conduct this transaction, Guild Leader Black Flame? Okay, I agree to your offer, Shurfong said after giving the matter some thought. However, I will need you to cooperate with my side to kill Beast Emperor's group. Also, my people must be the ones to land the killing blows on these saboteurs. Black. Flame. Beast Emperor had the urge to charge forward and kill Shurfong when he heard the latter's words. Just you wait. Sooner or later, I'll. However, before Beast Emperor could finish speaking, Shurfong, who had been standing over 400 yards away, suddenly appeared in front of him. Tier 4 Legacy Skill, Magic Light Assault. Shurfang's attack was so quick that nobody could react to it. By the time anyone realized what was going on, the light of two worlds had already pierced through Beast Emperor's heart. You. SV. Beast Emperor was stupefied when he saw the sword stabbed in his heart. He had never dreamed that Shurfong would take action so decisively, leaving him with no time for any of his life-saving moves. And worse, as he was losing all his HP to one attack, he noticed Shurfong holding a burning, pitch-black scroll. This pitch-black magic scroll was something familiar to dark players like Beast Emperor. It was the Tier 3 Magic Scroll Abyssal Curse. When activated, the scroll would lock onto a target and increase the target's death penalty by 3 to 5 times for 3 minutes. Lu Xinglua was dumbfounded at this scene. He never thought that Shurfong would have such a frightening move up his sleeve. He also never thought that Beast Emperor would die, just like that. The next moment, Shurfong drew his sword from Beast Emperor's corpse and picked up the two items the latter dropped. He then shifted his gaze to Lu Xinglua and smiled calmly. Guild Leader Xinglua, it's time we settled our old debts. Chapter 2828, Skyrocketing Levels in a towering temple built within a gloomy and silent mountain. A black flash suddenly appeared on the altar in the center of the temple. When this black flash disappeared, Beast Emperor's bandaged figure stood in its place. Apart from Beast Emperor's aura being slightly weaker, his level actually remained the same. He was still at level 132, tier 4, despite Shurfong having killed him just a moment ago. Black Flame. You thought you could land a blow on me using the Abyssal Curse. Dream on. I received the Immortal Body Curse from the Evil God. Don't even think you can harm me so easily. When Beast Emperor recalled the moment Shurfong killed him, he sneered. Just you wait. I already have the foundation to evolve a tier 5 foe saint monster. Once I gather enough materials, I'll let your zero wing feel the fear of death. The tier 4 curse immortal body allowed him to get resurrected instantly at his designated evil god's temple without penalty once a day. He could also use the curse to kill himself, and even being under restraints wouldn't stop this curse from activating. This move was the trump card he prepared in case of capture by NPCs. After all, if he got caught by NPCs, particularly the War God's Temple's NPCs, he would be doomed eternally. It was also because of this curse that he no longer had to live in hiding and didn't have to fear capture. It's a pity I didn't manage to rescue Lu Xinglua. With his help, I could produce the Tier 5 Faux Saint monster much sooner. Once again, it seems I have nobody but myself to rely on, Beast Emperor thought to himself. Unlike himself, Lu Xinglua was only at Tier 3. Sure Foam could easily capture Lu Xinglua. Moreover, Lu Xinglua's previous escape from Sky Spring City had tainted his body with evil energy. If Shurfong handed Lu Xinglua over to the War God's Temple, then it would be game over for the latter. Not only would Lu Xinglua have to create a new account, but he would also have to wait over a dozen days before he could do so. But so what if I have to rely on myself? 
Now that I have that great treasure, let alone 1,000 mythic foe saints, I can create even 5,000 mythic foe saints in a short time. After thinking up to this point, Beast Emperor opened his spatial bag to take out the great treasure he obtained recently. Panic surfaced on Beast Emperor's face a moment later. It's gone. After looking through his spatial bag three times, Beast Emperor's mind went blank. It couldn't have. At this thought, Beast Emperor's face turned ashen. Black Flame. I won't rest until you're dead. Beast Emperor bellowed. The deafening roar echoed throughout the silent cavern. At the same time as Beast Emperor got resurrected, near the distant Secret Covenant Tower, Sher Foam restrained Lu Xingluo with a darkness bind and captured him with a mobile prison. He gave Lu Xingluo no opportunity to escape or commit suicide. The entire process of Sher Foam killing Beast Emperor and imprisoning Lu Xingluo took only five seconds, and watching the scene play out made Hundred Ghosts' members break out in a cold sweat. This was because Sher Feng's attack was astonishingly fast. Even Wind Shadow, a Tier 4 Shadow Dancer, had reacted to the attack only when Sher Foam was already standing in front of Beast Emperor. Moreover, the power of Shurfang's attack was equally incredible. Apart from Tier 4 defensive classes, any other Tier 4 player would most likely die instantly if struck. Meanwhile, after Beast Emperor's death, the Faux Saint army fell into chaos, and the remaining hundreds of thousands of Faux Saint monsters began fleeing in all directions. Only the mythic-ranked Faux Saint saboteurs remained relatively calm. Knowing that they couldn't break the barrier sealing the map, the 300-plus saboteurs promptly swarmed toward Shurfang's group in a last-ditch effort. Foolish Resistance Seeing the saboteur's reaction, Shurfone took out the Ring of Gospel, injected 5,000 magic crystals into the ring, and activated Miniature World. Immediately, the space within a 5,000-yard radius of Shurfone froze. Simultaneously, a powerful pressure descended from the sky, increasing the weight of all Faux Saint monsters present and reducing their basic attributes and physique drastically. In the blink of an eye, the Faux Saint monsters had their combat power halved. World Suppression Long Day exclaimed in astonishment when he noticed the Faux Saint saboteur's physique and speed plummeting. How many trump cards does this Black Flame have? Previously, he thought that the remaining 300 plus Faux Saint saboteurs would still bring Zero Wing a lot of trouble. However, seeing the present situation, he found his earlier thoughts laughable. World suppression was different from the suppression effect of ordinary magic barriers. It suppressed a person from all aspects, and even Tier 4 existences with a mana domain couldn't resist it. And if a Tier 4 existence did not possess a mana domain, they couldn't fly within the frozen space. As a result of Shurfang's miniature world, the Faux Saint saboteurs now possessed combat power at only the entry level of Tier 4. Every one of them had also fallen to the ground after losing their ability to fly. At this time, let alone Tier 4 players, even Tier 3 peak experts could put up a fight against these mythic monsters. Ladies and gentlemen from Hundred Ghosts, can you take action now, as per our agreement? Shurfone asked, smiling as he turned to look at Hundred Ghosts' members. Or were your words from before merely a joke? You jest, Guild Leader Black Flame. We will certainly adhere to our agreement, Wind Shadow replied, chuckling. With a wave of his hand, he commanded, you bunch, get moving. Obeying Wind Shadow's command, the Black Knight Legion's members promptly intercepted the Faux Saint Saboteurs. Although these Black Knights were only a Tier 3, they sported Tier 3 mana set equipment. In terms of raw power, they surpassed even the Faux Saint Saboteurs when these monsters were at their peak, let alone now. The next moment, the Saboteurs could be seen getting repulsed after just one exchange. They were no match for the Black Knight Legion at all. After glancing at the Black Knights, Shurfone turned to Fire Dance and said, Fire, have Summer and the others join the fight as well. Everyone should get at least three Saboteur kills. These Faux Saint Saboteurs were absolute treasures. Although they did not drop any loot, the dark gray mist that they released was of incredible value not only to tier 4 players but also tier 3 players. Now that the era of tier 4 had come, it would be best if he helped alluring Summer and the others reach tier 4 as well. Okay, I'll have them come right away. Fire Dance nodded and promptly contacted the mobile fortress. As Fire Dance was summoning alluring Summer and the others, unyielding heart and illusory words suddenly approached your phone. Guild leader Black Flame, is it possible for you to sell us a dozen or so of these saboteurs? Unyielding heart asked in embarrassment. We are willing to pay one complete tier 3 legacy for each of Saboteur. There was no way the two of them wouldn't covet these Faux Saint Saboteurs. With the help of that Grey Mist, they could increase their guild's peak experts' chances of reaching tier 4 by a significant margin. At this stage of the game, the various superpowers were all in urgent need of tier 4 combatants to defend their territories. If their two guilds could gain a few more tier 4 players within a short period, they would survive these difficult times much more easily. Looking at the embarrassed expressions of the two people before him, Sherfone chuckled and said, Say no more. Your guilds have sacrificed a lot in helping Zero Wing resist the superpowers. You can each take 30 saboteurs as compensation. I don't need you to pay anything for them. Truthfully, he felt very grateful to Unyielding Soul and Crimson Emperor. If not for the help of these two guilds, Zero Wing couldn't have held the Secret Covenant Tower until he returned. Thus, he didn't mind giving away a few Faux Saint saboteurs. Not to mention, if the two super first-rate guilds grew stronger, they would be of much greater help to Zero Wing as well. Most importantly, Zero Wing didn't have that many Tier 3 players who could make use of the saboteurs' Grey Mist. The Grey Mist could be described as icing on the cake. Like the Crystal of Souls and Soul Water, the Grey Mist was useful only to players with the potential to reach Tier 4. 
Meanwhile, there were fewer than 20 such players in the present zero wing. It also wouldn't serve any purpose to let these players gain more than one stack of the Grey Mist. The help they could gain for their promotion from one stack would be the same as what they could gain from multiple stacks. Hence, it would be much better to use the additional saboteurs to raise the levels of Fire Dance and the others instead. Thank you, Guild Leader Black Flame. Unyielding heart and illusory words were jubilant upon hearing Shurfang's words. Sixty saboteurs would be more than enough for their two guilds' peak experts. Subsequently, after around an hour of battle, Shurfang and the others annihilated the Faux Saint army. By then, Shurfang's level had risen from 146 to 148, while Fire Dance and the other Tier 4 members of Zero Wing had risen to level 145. As for Alluring Summer and the other Zero Wing executives who were still stuck at Tier 3, they had risen to level 130 and above. Everyone had leveled up remarkably from this battle. After killing the Faux Saint army, Wind Shadow handed a Tier 3 mana set equipment forging design to Shurfang as agreed. And after receiving the forging design, Shurfang released Awakened Abyss from Sky Spring City's prison and let 100 Ghosts as members leave intact once the World Mirror deactivated. With the end of the battle at the Secret Covenant Tower and the disappearance of the World Mirror, news of this battle spread like wildfire. Chapter 2829, Beast Emperor's Loot Fire Dragon Empire, Flame Dragon City The Faux Saint army got annihilated, and 100 Ghosts surrendered. How is that possible? When the various superpowers learned about the outcome of the battle at the Secret Covenant Tower, they were dumbstruck. After all, the forces attacking Zero Wing had included 1,000 mythic rank Faux Saint monsters and the top combatants of 100 Ghosts, a mysterious guild that even the five great super guilds feared. Nevertheless, such a force had actually lost. Moreover, the loss had been an utter rout, a one-sided massacre. The various superpowers were especially shocked when they saw the video of the purifying light vaporizing a large chunk of the Faux Saint army and heavily injuring every one of the Faux Saint saboteurs. They felt as if the system was playing a cruel joke on them when they watched this attack. Meanwhile, inside Frost Heaven's residence. When Mushin read the report her subordinate sent her, she exclaimed in shock, amazing. As expected of Zero Wing. Frost Heaven had considered helping Zero Wing out of its predicament. However, after gaining a reserve spot for the Twelve Great Guilds, Frost Heaven had faced many problems. Sky Dragon House and Pride Empire were especially troublesome. The two super guilds had clashed with Frost Heaven on numerous occasions in the Fire Dragon Empire after the competition. In addition, superpowers like Mythology and Miracle secretly interfered with Frost Heaven's operations. This made it incredibly difficult for Frost Heaven to spread its influence across the Fire Dragon Empire. If not, not for Frost Heaven garrisoning various major NPC cities in the Fire Dragon Empire and gaining a home ground advantage, the guild would have long since gotten torn to shreds. After all, Sky Dragon House and Pride Empire had incredibly deep roots in the Fire Dragon Empire. In fact, some of the Fire Dragon Empire's NPC forces had even allied with the two super guilds. Fortunately, Frost Heaven had also occupied the Snow Lion Kingdom, a coastal country. The kingdom provided Frost Heaven with a continuous supply of resources and funds, allowing the guild to keep fighting in the Fire Dragon Empire. A mobile fortress, is it? Hong Xin Yuan also couldn't help feeling a little envious when he read the information regarding the small mobile fortress. I wonder when we will be able to obtain one of our own. According to the reports, with the offensive and defensive capabilities of the mobile fortress, it could survive in a level 140 plus neutral map. This made it a dream facility of all superpowers at this stage of the game. Not only did level 140 plus neutral maps allow players to level up much more quickly, but they also held various rare resources, legacies, ancient ruins, and even seven luminaries crystals. Originally, players could acquire seven luminaries crystals from only a few specific maps. However, all maps above level 140 had a considerable chance of spawning seven luminaries crystals. This was because the random team dungeons and time-limited regional dungeons that appeared in these maps all had a small chance of dropping seven luminaries crystals. However, level 140 plus maps were incredibly dangerous. Not only did foreign energies that would rapidly corrode a player's body permeate these maps, but powerful monsters were also rife in them. Although level 140 plus maps were not as dangerous as Forbidden Lands, beast tides frequently occurred there, regardless of night and day. Even tier 4 experts would perish if they accidentally came across one of these beast tides and got surrounded. Most importantly, level 140 plus maps were the main hunting ground of NPCs. Now that Zero Wing had the mobile fortress, Hong Xin Yuan could already imagine just how much of an advantage the guild would have in the future. In fact, its complete control over the Secret Covenant Tower already provided an advantage not even super guilds possessed. At this point, all Zero Wing needed to do was wait until it had a sufficiently large number of tier 3 players. With ample strength, the guild could begin occupying various resource spots and NPC cities in God's domain. Eventually, Zero Wing might even become an existence rivaling the five great super guilds. At the same time, Cold Shadow, in the distant Apocalypse Empire, also received this shocking piece of news. Interesting. Even the Faux Saint army and Hundred Ghosts are helpless against them. Cold Shadow revealed a rare smile on her face when she read the report her subordinate sent her. After suffering such a miserable loss, Lu Xing Luo will most likely lose his position as heir. What should we do now, Vice Guild Leader? White Feather asked worriedly. The Guild Leader sent us here to lay a solid foundation on the Eastern Continent so that we can dominate both continents in the future. Yet, Zero Wing is growing stronger while Miracle has half a foot in the grave. Don't worry. 
So long as we complete the task Lord Odin gave us, mythology will no longer face any hindrances on the eastern continent, Cold Shadow said with a faint smile. If we're lucky, we might even get to take over Zero Wing cities. After all, the eastern continent's various powers don't have much time left. Not much time left. White Feather was slightly surprised to hear Cold Shadow's words. However, she quickly recalled something and asked, has Lord Odin succeeded on his side already? MHM. The eastern continent will become the first battlefield. Cold Shadow nodded. When that time comes, the eastern continent's various powers can only watch as they gradually perish. Even Zero Wing with its mobile fortress won't be spared. Twin Towers Kingdom, Sky Spring City. Because of Zero Wing's landslide victory, the various superpowers that had forcibly occupied Sky Spring City fell into dismay. They never thought that all their efforts would end up being for naught. Unlike the superpowers members, though, the members of Zero Wing, Unyielding Soul, and Crimson Emperor cheered and celebrated like maniacs. After all, the battle at the Secret Covenant Tower had left their three guilds with complete ownership of the tower. Meanwhile, with the Tier 3 legacies the tower produced, the number of Tier 3 experts in their three guilds would skyrocket. Eventually, even super guilds would be no match for them. In fact, given enough time, their three guilds wouldn't even have to worry about NPC forces anymore. Elder Windshadow, why did you give the Tier 3 mana set equipment forging design to Zero Wing? That will just make Zero Wing even stronger and drastically affect our plans. The guild leader will definitely reprimand us once we return, asked Awakened Abyss, who had just been released from Sky Spring City's prison. He had been rendered speechless when he heard of Windshadow's actions. The Tier 3 mana set equipment could allow Tier 3 players to combat Tier 4 players. Any guild that could mass-produce this set would become a huge threat in the game. In fact, the set's forging design could even be considered more valuable than the Mobile Fortress. After all, the Mobile Fortress could secure only one location at a time. In comparison, having multiple Tier 4 combatants allowed a guild to secure multiple positions simultaneously. Abyss, do you still not understand Elder Windshadow's personality? Long Day suddenly asked, smiling. Do you really think he would let Zero Wing take advantage of him? What do you mean? Awakened Abyss asked in wonder. With how powerful the Tier 3 mana set equipment is, do you think Zero Wing can mass-produce it just by having its forging design? Chuckling, Long Day explained, the minimum requirement to forge the set is an advanced master forger. In addition, the forger in question has to be at the advanced magician standard. Most importantly, the set needs incredibly rare materials to produce. Mana adamantite is hardly available even on our side, let alone here. And even if we assume Zero Wing can actually manufacture the set, there is still the Tier 4 strength requirement for equipping it. If Zero Wing can't fulfill even one of these points, that forging design will be no better than a piece of scrap paper. Upon listening to Long Day's explanation, Awakened Abyss immediately came to a realization. Smiling, he said, in other words, what Zero Wing got is merely a piece of scrap. Paper. That's right. That Black Flame thinks that he made a huge profit, but that's far from being the case in reality, Long Day said, nodding. However, we should leave this place quickly. The guild leader notified us that this continent is soon to be doomed. Once we finish our tasks here, we need to return as soon as possible. It would be bad if we got dragged into the mess. I understand. I'll go complete the tasks the guild leader gave me together with Jade Leaf, Awakened Abyss said, growing even more excited after hearing Long Day's subsequent words. Previously, he had still been entertaining thoughts of revenge on Zero Wing. However, they now seemed superfluous. While Hundred Ghosts' members were preparing to leave Sky Spring City, inside the distant mobile fortress, Sherfoam was shocked when he inspected the items Beast Emperor dropped. How did this thing end up in his hands? For a time, Sherfoam couldn't help doubting his eyes. This was because both items Beast Emperor dropped were extraordinary. One of them was even something Sherfoam had been searching for all this time. The Treasure of Fire, Purification Crown. Chapter 2830, Treasure of Fire. Sherfoam couldn't help growing ecstatic as he looked at the Purification Crown. Finding the seven treasures wasn't easy. Even though he could use the golden stigma to detect skill to locate the seven treasures, the skill had a limited range. Moreover, there were many ways one could block the effects of the skill. Take the purification crown in his hands, for example. Neither detects active or passive detection effects were reacting to it at all. Hence, obtaining the treasure of fire from killing Beast Emperor came as an absolute surprise to Sherfoam. He tapped his finger on the purification crown and called up its attribute panel, curious about the functions of this legendary treasure of fire. Purification Crown, Fragmented Legendary Rank Item A fragment of the Treasure of Fire. However, due to being sealed by the Evil God, the fragment is incapable of exhibiting its true power. Skill 1 Seed of Flame, can control and transform all flames into seeds of flame. Upon absorbing the Seed of Flame, the user will be able to manipulate the flame used to create the Seed of Flame. Can transform up to Tier 4 Flames. Cooldown, 3 days. Skill 2 Purification Fire, expend 300 fire attributed magic crystals to produce a purification fire. The purification fire has a 20% chance of elevating a creature's life rating and an 80% chance of thoroughly extinguishing a creature. Skill 3 Divine Purification, expend god crystals to purify the purification crown. A total of 20 god crystals are required to purify the purification crown. 
Current number of absorbed god crystals, zero. This item is corroded by the evil god's power. The golden stigmata can purify the evil energy corroding this item with the help of god crystals. Cannot be destroyed. Has a chance of dropping on death. No wonder Beast Emperor was able to create so many mythic foe saints. He's been relying on this crown's ability. Realization dawned upon Shurfone when he finished reading the purification crown's attributes. He had to admit that every one of the seven treasures was heaven-defying. The purification crown's purification fire skill was an absolute treasure when it came to elevating a creature's potential. Its only flaw was the 80% chance of causing the death of the target creature. Unless one had already exhausted their latent potential and were still seeking further improvement, making use of the purification fire should be their last resort. Only someone like Beast Emperor, who could mass-produce foe saint monsters easily, could use the purification crown without worries. So long as he managed to produce even one mythic-ranked foe saint monster, it wouldn't matter even if he expended hundreds of Grand Lord-ranked foe saint monsters in the process. After all, producing Grand Lord-ranked foe saint monsters was an incredibly simple process. The only real problem Beast Emperor had was finding the necessary fire-attributed magic crystals. If the purification fire skill required ordinary magic crystals instead, Beast Emperor would have most likely had tens or even hundreds of thousands of mythic-ranked foe saint monsters. This also explained why Beast Emperor had created an organization like Saint's Hand to support him. This purification fire really is a gem. Even though its success rate is only 20%, the possibility of elevating a creature's life rating makes the risk completely worthwhile, Shifong sighed ruefully as he looked at the effects of the purification fire. The term creature did not refer to just foe saint monsters. It encompassed mounts and NPCs. In fact, the purification fire worked on players as well, only with significantly diminished effects. At most, it could raise a player's basic attributes and physique. It couldn't help players in getting promoted to tier 4 or above. However, it was a different story for mounts and NPCs. For mounts and NPCs, improving their life ratings would significantly increase their chances of completing their promotions. At this time, though, Sherfone dared not experiment with the purification fire. At the very least, he wouldn't do so while the skill's success rate was only at 20%. After all, flying mounts and personal guards with high growth potential were not easy to find. If he got unlucky and ended up burning one out of existence, he would definitely die of regret. Subsequently, Sherfone set his sights on the purification crown's first skill. This seed of flame is good stuff. A powerful flame might be meaningless for ordinary players, but it was a divine tool for lifestyle players, particularly forgers and alchemists. Having a powerful flame would increase their production success rate considerably. This was especially true for mysterious flames. Even a tier 1 mysterious flame would be of significant help to players. The only problem was that absorbing a mysterious flame was an excruciatingly painful process, something not just anyone could endure. Moreover, the stronger the mysterious flame, the more painful the absorption process would be. Previously, when Sherfone had bound the tier 3 purple thunder flame, he had suffered immensely. Given the level of pain he experienced, he doubted that specialized lifestyle players could absorb a tier 3 mysterious flame. After all, unlike himself, specialized lifestyle players tended to have less tolerance for pain. However, the seed of flame skill could dampen this excruciating absorption process by transforming flames into seeds of flame. Absorbing a seed of flame was significantly less painful than absorbing a flame directly. Players would have an easier time taking control over a flame. Of course, the best part about the Seed of Flame skill wasn't the fact that it could turn mysterious flames into Seeds of Flame. The skill's description clearly stated that it could transform all flames into Seeds of Flame. Flames didn't refer to just mysterious flames, there were other types of flames, such as the flames spat out by monsters and naturally occurring flames. In other words, the Seed of Flame skill was a heaven-defying skill capable of creating mysterious flames. All sure foam needed to do was search for powerful flames and convert them into mysterious flames. However, as the purification crown was sealed, the most it could create were tier 4 mysterious flames. Even so, this was already an incomparably precious ability. In God's domain, the rarity of tier 3 mysterious flames was on par with that of fragmented legendary items. As for tier 4 mysterious flames, they were basically the stuff of legends. Nevertheless, the purification crown was actually capable of creating tier 4 mysterious flames. One could see just how heaven-defying this ability was. Of course, finding a flame that could be converted into a tier 4 mysterious flame wouldn't be an easy task. After all, existences capable of producing such powerful flames weren't a dime a dozen. However, Sherfone would be satisfied so long as he could produce a couple of Tier 3 Mysterious Flames. For the candlelight trading firm's lifestyle players, being able to own a Tier 3 Mysterious Flame was something that only happened in their dreams. Sherfone took out the Tier 4 Hellfire, an excited expression appearing on his face. I initially planned to wait a little while longer before absorbing this, but I think I can give it a try now. He had been looking forward to absorbing the Hellfire for a long time now. However, he also understood that taking control of a tier 4 mysterious flame would be unimaginably difficult. The process would have an extremely high demand on his concentration and pain tolerance. If he failed to absorb the hellfire, he might even suffer a backlash. Hence, after obtaining the hellfire, he did not dare casually absorb it. Moreover, after he had reached tier 4, his soul had been strengthened significantly, which allowed him to resist the soul chain's threat for a much longer period. There had been no need for him to take such a risk. 
However, now that he had the purification crown, he wouldn't have to worry about the risks of absorbing the hellfire. Subsequently, Shirfone used the purification crown on the hellfire. The crown immediately released a dazzling radiance, and a golden mist enveloped the hellfire. Upon sensing the threat from the purification crown, the hellfire began resisting violently, its aura flaring until it rivaled that of superior mythic monsters. However, the purification crown was one of the seven treasures, an item carefully crafted by the goddess of space, an ancient god. Even if it was only a fragment of the original treasure of fire, its power wasn't something a tier 4 mysterious flame could resist. Twenty seconds later, the purification crown devoured the hellfire completely and transformed it into a dark gray seed of flame. In its current form, the hellfire's power was drastically suppressed. System, do you wish to absorb the seed of hellfire? Absorb. Upon seeing the system prompt, Shirfone chose to absorb the tier 4 seed of flame without hesitation. Chapter 2831, Tier 4 Mysterious Flames Effects As soon as Shirfone chose to absorb the seed of flame, the dark gray seed in his palm turned into streaks of light that merged with his body. Immediately afterward, Shirfone couldn't help gritting his teeth. It hurt so much. The pain he currently felt was far beyond what he had felt when he absorbed the Tier 3 Purple Thunder Flame. It was like his blood was boiling and millions of ants were nibbling at his bones. If not for the recent breakthrough in his concentration, he would have most likely failed to endure this pain. The next moment, a loading bar showing his fusion progress with the Seed of Hellfire appeared before him. The loading bar filled up at a snail's pace, increasing by only 1% every dozen seconds or so. The pain is already so unbearable even with the help of a Seed of Flame. It's no wonder so few players managed to control a Tier 4 Mysterious Flame in the past. Realization dawned upon Shurfone as he looked at the slowly rising fusion bar. Any normal person would lose their mind if they had to endure this pain for even a second, yet this pain was only the result of absorbing a Tier 4 Seed of Flame. He couldn't even begin to imagine how much pain directly absorbing a Tier 4 Mysterious Flame would involve. At this point, Shirfone suspected that the people who had successfully absorbed Tier 4 Mysterious Flames in his previous life had done so using special means like he did. After all, he had honed his pain tolerance for 10 years in the game. In this life, he had even developed his concentration beyond what he had in his previous life. Despite that, he still found absorbing even a weakened Tier 4 Mysterious Flame unbearable. What would it take to absorb an unaltered Tier 4 Mysterious Flame? 3% 10% 30%. Hold on. I must hold on. At this point, Shirfone was gritting his teeth, and his eyes were bloodshot. His complexion was also unprecedentedly pale. And worse, as the fusion progressed, its rate of increment gradually slowed down. Even after two whole hours had gone by, the fusion bar had reached only 73%. In addition, when the fusion crossed 60%, the seed of flame within him began radiating powerful mental assaults every second, battering his sea of consciousness. The subsequent mental assault that hit him at 74% nearly made him collapse. His consciousness began blurring, and he felt as if he was about to lose control of his body. This won't do. I need to think of a way to resist these mental assaults. Otherwise, I won't last until the end. While fusing with a mysterious flame, players had to remain conscious throughout the process. Otherwise, the fusion would be deemed a failure. Upon thinking up to this point, Shirfone began applying his mental defense technique against the Seed of Flame's mental assaults, gathering his focus into a single point and stealing his mind. While this technique worked wonders initially, after the fusion progress reached 80%, the Seed of Flame seemingly noticed his trick. Immediately afterward, the Seed began releasing mental assaults at a much higher rate, going from once per second to twice per second, then even increasing to three, four, five times per second. The frequency of the mental assaults continuously escalated, the Seed of Flame adamant in breaking Shurfeng's mind. It can even play such a move. Shurfeng was stupefied by this situation. Faced with these high-frequency mental assaults, Shurfeng dared not relax for even a moment. However, maintaining his mental defense technique also made him feel indescribably uncomfortable. This technique was akin to a person flexing their muscles. While one could harden one's muscles by flexing them, it would be exhausting to keep one's muscles flexed for long periods. Likewise, Shirfone couldn't keep his focus condensed for long periods. Moreover, as his mental defense technique was much more complex than the flexing one's muscles, the time he could maintain it was even shorter. 83% 87% 92% The more frequent the mental assaults were, the less time he had to breathe. At some point, his mind even began feeling suffocated. Is it still not done? Looking at the fusion bar, Shirfone felt as if he was on the brink of collapse. At this time, his body pains already felt insignificant compared to the mental suffocation. In fact, his body was already ignoring the burning pain the seed of flame inflicted. Now, the only thing his mind could think of was finding an opportunity to catch a breath. Just when Shirfone felt as if he would die from suffocation, the system's indifferent voice entered his ears. System, the Hellfire's fusion is complete. The Hellfire is now bound as player Yifeng's personal property. System, congratulations. You have been tempered by the Hellfire. 
All basic attributes increased by 300 points, all basic attributes increased by 10%, physique improved by 20%, reaction speed improved by 20%, mental control improved by 40%, fire and ice resistances plus 150, and control over fire type mana improved by 20%. Sherfong inhaled deeply upon hearing the system notification. When air filled his lungs again, he felt revived. After relaxing his mind, he could feel the hellfire's energy spreading throughout his body. His originally depleted concentration also began recovering crazily. So, this is the power of a tier 4 mysterious flame. At this moment, Sherfong felt reborn. His basic attributes might not have increased by much after absorbing the hellfire, but his acuity of the world of God's domain had undergone a drastic change. He felt as if he had stepped into a whole new world. His concentration standard, in particular, had gone from the tier 4 intermediate standard to the tier 4 peak standard. Aside from the improvements to his mind and body, the hellfire's active power was similarly astonishing. Hellfire, tier 4 mysterious flame. When activated, improves destructive power by 100% and effects of fire type skills and spells by 100%, grants attacks a 150% mental assault modifier, and increases the success rate of forging, alchemy, and cooking by 25%. Upon reading the Tier 4 Hellfire's active effects, Sherfong finally understood why Tier 4 Mysterious Flames were regarded as legends in God's domain. The Tier 4 Hellfire was a heaven-defying tool for both combat and lifestyle players. The Hellfire's ability to add mental assaults to attacks was especially amazing, far more amazing than purely physical or magical attacks. After all, there was no clear attribute for mental assaults in God's domain. Likewise, there were no in-game methods for resisting mental assaults. Players could only rely on their own minds to withstand such assaults. Players lacking in mental fortitude could lose control over their bodies after suffering just one strike. And even if they didn't, they would still feel disoriented and their bodies uncomfortable. Now that Sherfong had the Hellfire in his possession, he dared to confront even superior mythic monsters of the same level directly. However, rather than the combat bonuses the Hellfire provided, what Sherfong paid more attention to were its supportive effects. The Hellfire's 25% increase to production success rate was something even Grandmaster Forgers would desire greatly. The higher the quality of an item, the lower its production success rate. Normally, the theoretical production success rate provided by the system was the highest success rate achievable. However, even after reaching the Grandmaster standard, players still wouldn't be capable of reaching this upper limit, and this was after high-quality tools were included in the equation. Not to mention, tools that increased production success rates were less effective the higher the quality of the item being produced was. However, Mysterious Flames were an exception. Their effects remained the same regardless of the quality of the item being produced. With the Tier 4 Hellfire, I can probably produce epic weapons at a 30% success rate now. Sure Foam felt indescribably excited. When he obtained the Tier 3 Mana Set Equipment Forging design, he had decided to set it aside temporarily. One of the reasons for doing so was his disinclination to waste precious materials. After all, Mana Adamantite was incredibly precious. In the modern god's domain, its rarity almost rivaled that of seven luminaries crystals. Secondly, he wished to use Mana Iron Ore as a replacement. However, he needed mana iron ingots of considerably high purity to accomplish this. Although the tier 3 purple thunder flame possessed excellent smelting capabilities, it still couldn't smelt mana iron or into special ranked mana iron ingots, producing only advanced mana iron ingots at best. Only a tier 4 mysterious flame could accomplish such a feat. Of course, using special mana iron ingots to produce the tier 3 mana set equipment would degrade the set slightly. However, the end result would still let tier 3 players hold their ground against mythic monsters. As Sherfong was contemplating how to mass-produce the Tier 3 mana set equipment, he suddenly received a call from Fire Dance. After accepting the call request, Sherfong asked, did something happen over at Sky Spring City? News of the battle at the Secret Covenant Tower had shaken the entire god's domain. At this point, it was no exaggeration to say that no player forces in the Twin Towers Kingdom would dare go against Zero Wing. Logically, there shouldn't be any problems there. No. It's just that there are too many people applying to join Zero Wing right now, Fire Dance replied with a bitter smile. We gained over 500,000 new members after just half a day, including over 10,000 tier 3 players. All of the top tier weapons and equipment we got from the battle in Sky Spring City before have already been exchanged. If we don't replenish the warehouse, we won't be able to expand our forces further even if we want to. I understand. Sherfong smiled at Fire Dance's words and said, I still have some epic items as well as a bunch of level 130 plus weapons and equipment. They should be enough to tide us over for now. I'll figure out a follow-up solution later. Fire Dance simply responded with a helpless nod. With the number of guild members waiting to exchange for weapons and equipment, a few hundred pieces of level 130 plus weapons and equipment wouldn't make much of a difference. They would most likely be gone in half an hour. However, as she was pondering how the guild could acquire more weapons and equipment, a massive batch of weapons and equipment suddenly appeared in Zero Wing's guild warehouse. These weapons and equipment were none other than the epic weapons and equipment Sherfong had purchased in the Ancient God's Domain. There were also the various weapons and equipment he got from grinding at the Anti-Magic Volcano, which numbered over 6,000, with even the most inferior piece being level 130 bronze equipment. Chapter 2832 Popular Warehouse Sky Spring City, Zero Wings Residence 
Boss, now that we've joined Zero Wing, I get the feeling that Zero Wing isn't so amazing after all. A level 121, tier 3 summoner commented to the red-haired woman standing beside him. Looking at a few tier 3 players walking some distance away, he continued, these core members of Zero Wing aren't even as well equipped as the members of our Crimson Wolf adventurer team. Most of the tier 3 core members in the guild residence were equipped with level 110 secret silver equipment, with only a few with level 120 fine gold equipment. In comparison, of the several hundred Crimson Wolf members who had joined Zero Wing, even the most inferior were geared in a mix of level 120 secret silver and fine gold equipment. Their weapons were also level 120 fine gold weapons or better. Their commander even sported level 120 dark gold equipment, two pieces of epic equipment, and one epic weapon. Although these three epic items had a maximum level of level 120, they were still far stronger than level 120 dark gold items. That's normal. Zero Wing just finished a fight with the various superpowers. From what I heard, every one of Zero Wing's tier 3 experts died at least 2 or 3 times, with some dying up to 6 times. It's only natural to have subpar equipment standards after suffering so many deaths, the red-haired woman clad in fiery red light armor said. Chuckling, she continued, also, we didn't join Zero Wing because of its weapons and equipment but for the sake of grinding in the secret covenant tower and training in the mobile fortress. At this stage of the game, the various superpowers were mostly equal in their stockpiles of weapons and equipment. Not to mention, how could the importance of weapons and equipment possibly beat the importance of getting promoted to tier 4? She had been looking forward to getting promoted to tier 4 for a long time now, all the more after witnessing the battle in Sky Spring City. That battle had driven home how insignificant tier 3 existences were before tier 4 existences. Despite being one of the top-ranking peak experts in the Twin Towers Kingdom, she doubted she could last more than one hit from a tier 4 player. However, getting promoted to tier 4 was incredibly difficult. Even if she could find a tier 4 legacy land, completing her promotion quest would still be a struggle with her present technical standards. Meanwhile, the quickest way she could develop her techniques to an adequate standard was by joining Zero Wing. This was also the case for everyone else in the Crimson Wolf Adventurer team. Presently, it was already public knowledge that the mobile fortress boasted incredibly dense mana. Moreover, the environment inside the fortress also enhanced one's sensitivity to mana. This would be of great help not only when practicing their skills and spells but also for understanding the operating principles of mana. Since more and more players were reaching Tier 4 in God's Domain, information about the Tier 4 promotion quest had also leaked to the public. According to the leaks, a part of the quest required players to learn a Tier 4 skill or spell within a limited period. Thus, to complete this challenge, players needed to have a considerable understanding of and control over mana. Otherwise, even if one managed to find a Tier 4 legacy land, one still wouldn't reach Tier 4. While Crimson Wolf's members were conversing, a commotion suddenly entered their ears, catching their attention. I remember that's where the guild warehouse is, the summoner youth said as he looked in the direction of the commotion curiously. Did Zero Wing's warehouse go empty? No, those people appear excited, the crimson-haired woman said, shaking her head. However, as soon as Crimson Wolf's commander finished speaking, a few excited voices reached them. Crap. Isn't the guild being too generous? They're actually letting us exchange for level 150 epic weapons and equipment. I heard that the other superpowers have only several dozen level 120 epic weapons and equipment in their guild warehouses, yet there are over a hundred level 150 epic weapons and equipment here. Did the guild executives make a mistake? That's very possible. Even so, our guild is simply amazing. Other guilds barely have any level 130 equipment in their warehouses, yet we have over 6,000. I even saw quite a few level 140 secret silver weapons and equipment in the warehouse. With this, we won't have to worry about finding replacement gear after reaching level 130. The veteran members and new members of Zero Wing standing in front of the guild warehouse's exchange counters all had excited looks on their faces. For most players in God's Domain, nothing was more important than weapons and equipment, especially top-tier weapons and equipment. Those were items countless players dreamed of obtaining. At this time, Zero Wing had actually put over 100 level 150 epic weapons and equipment up for exchange. No other superpower had ever shown such generosity before. In any other guild, a level 150 epic weapon or equipment would have been immediately monopolized by the guild executives. Normal members of the guild would never have a chance with these items. Of course, exchanging for Zero Wing's level 150 epic weapons and equipment wasn't easy, either. Firstly, one had to be an elite member or above. Secondly, one needed an astronomical number of guild contribution points. This was because even the cheapest piece of level 150 epic equipment cost 3 million GCPs. According to Zero Wing's internal market, 1 GCP was worth 20 copper coins, thus, 3 million GCPs would be worth 6,000 gold coins. Although 6,000 gold was an astronomical price even for level 150 epic equipment, it was nigh impossible to find level 150 epic equipment on the market right now. Guild executives were monopolizing every piece of level 150 epic equipment available. Nevertheless, Zero Wing was allowing even its elite members to exchange for these items. This was undoubtedly a great benefit. Boss, I take back what I just said. Zero Wing's foundation is insane. If we can exchange for a full set of these epic weapons and equipment, we'll be unstoppable. Crimson Wolf Summoner Youth said. When he saw the large number of level 150 epic weapons and equipment in the guild warehouse, he was similarly astonished. Even the eyes of Crimson Wolf's red-haired commander blazed with passion as she looked at the exchange list before her. Fire, notify everyone in the team immediately. 
Have everyone start accumulating as many GCPs as possible. We need to secure a few of these epic items before the other adventurer teams clear them out, the red-haired woman said to the summoner youth. Okay. I'll notify them right away. The urgency of the situation spurred the summoner youth to contact the other Crimson Wolf members who had joined Zero Wing as fast as possible. For a time, many of the new members bustled about, every one of these tier 3 experts adamant in getting a share of those level 150 epic weapons and equipment. Some of the adventure teams that joined Zero Wing recently even exchanged their level 110 to level 120 top tier equipment for GCPs. Since the guild purchased weapons and equipment at 10% to 15% below market value, nobody would normally be willing to trade in their old weapons and equipment for GCPs. They would rather slowly accumulate GCPs through guild quests. However, the current situation was different. There were only so many level 150 epic weapons and equipment available for exchange. If they did not secure these items as soon as possible, other people would do so. Meanwhile, trading in weapons and equipment was undoubtedly the quickest way to accumulate several million GCPs. As a result, in just half an hour after Zero Wing's warehouse was updated, it had gained an additional 2,000 level 120 top tier equipment and 7,000 level 110 top tier equipment. The guild's equipment crisis got resolved in the blink of an eye. Guild leader, this move of yours worked wonders. With all these adventure teams contributing their weapons and equipment to us, we should be able to last for a few more days, Fire Dance said joyfully. It's still too soon to celebrate. Looking at Fire Dance's excited expression, Sherfong smiled and said, Notify everyone in the guild that the guild will no longer restrict their activity to just the guild cities and secret covenant towers vicinities. Everyone can move freely now. We're lifting the restriction now. Fire Dance was surprised by Sherfang's words. Currently, NPC forces were running rampant in the fields, robbing and attacking even the superpowers. Previously, to avoid these predicaments, Zero Wing had chosen to restrict its members' movement to just the guild cities and secret covenant towers vicinities. Removing this restriction now would undoubtedly increase the guild's expenditure. MHM. Nodding, Sherfong said, we have fallen behind the other superpowers in raiding dungeons and acquiring resources. Letting this situation continue will only be detrimental to the guild. Now that the various superpowers no longer dare have designs on the secret covenant tower, there's naturally no need for us to continue hiding. I understand. I'll make the necessary preparations right away, Fire Dance said. After giving the matter some thought, she found Sherfang's words reasonable. Now that Zero Wing's existence was unshakable, they indeed didn't have to lie low anymore. Meanwhile, as Fire Dance was drafting this announcement, Sherfong finished installing the sixth mirror of the world mirror into the distant Zero Wing City City Lord's Mansion. System, do you wish to bind the world mirror with Zero Wing City? Bind, Sherfong answered without hesitation. System, world mirror bound successfully. System, congratulations. Zero Wing City has reached the requirement to become a basic main city. Do you wish to upgrade it? Chapter 2833, Promotion to Main City Seeing the system prompt, Sherfong chose to upgrade Zero Wing City without hesitation. System, Main City upgrade will cost 500,000 gold coins and 200,000 magic crystals. Do you wish to proceed? Proceed. Sherfong was not at all surprised by the upgrade cost, he had long since prepared the necessary funds. The next moment, 500,000 gold coins and 200,000 magic crystals disappeared from his bag. He then received another system notification. System, payment completed. All players within Zero Wing City will be teleported out of the city in three minutes. Upgrade is estimated to take two hours. Zero Wing City Region System Announcement, Zero Wing City will commence upgrading into a basic main city. All players within Zero Wing City will be teleported out of the city in three minutes. Players within the city are advised to make the necessary preparations. After the regional announcement's appearance, the several hundred thousand players that populated Zero Wing City promptly broke out in doubt and exclamations. What's going on? Zero Wing City is getting upgraded into a main city. Zero Wing City isn't even an advanced city yet. How can it get promoted into a main city? What did Zero Wing do? The independent players and guild players operating in Zero Wing City were thunderstruck by this unexpected piece of news. This was especially true for the various guild players. They felt as if the system was playing a bad joke on them. Ordinary players might not understand the significance of a main city, but guild players like themselves knew just how difficult it was to raise a guild city status to main city. In fact, even upgrading a guild city into an intermediate city was already incredibly difficult for guilds at this stage of the game. After all, guilds needed to ensure the constant development of their guild city's popularity and security standards, and fulfilling these requirements required a lot of manpower and resources. However, after Zero Wing had prohibited NPCs from entering its guild cities and increased the entrance fees the cities charged, Zero Wing City's prosperity and popularity had plummeted. At this point, let alone getting promoted into a main city, even getting promoted to an intermediate city should be impossible. Yet, the system was now telling them that Zero Wing City was already getting upgraded into a main city. This defied credence. However, no matter how much the players inside Zero Wing City refused to believe the system announcement, the system's timer continued counting down the seconds. Eventually, after three whole minutes elapsed, every player in the city was teleported out of the city. 
Only after finding themselves standing outside the city walls did everyone understand that Zero Wing City's promotion was real. This astonishing piece of news quickly reached the ears of Star Moon Kingdom's various powers, and all of these powers were inevitably shocked. In an era where most superpowers did not even possess a single intermediate guild city, Zero Wing had already secured itself a main guild city. This situation was simply unbelievable. When Liang Jing, who was working in Silver Wing City, heard about Zero Wing City's promotion, she hurriedly contacted Shi Feng and asked, Guild leader, what did you do? How did Zero Wing City get promoted into a main city? Currently, even the popular Silver Wing City was still a long ways from becoming an advanced city. She found it simply incredible that Zero Wing City, which was drastically inferior in terms of popularity, could become a main city ahead of Silver Wing City. However, while Liang Jing was confused by this unexpected development, she couldn't help growing excited over it as well. After all, Zero Wing's present situation wasn't as rosy as everyone thought. Although the various superpowers had given up on cornering Zero Wing after the battle at the Secret Covenant Tower, they continued to suppress Zero Wing economically. Although Zero Wing indeed possessed combat power surpassing even that of the five great super guilds, it was still limited to passive self-defense, the guild couldn't actively wage war against the various superpowers. Not to mention, due to the war of attrition with the various superpowers, Zero Wing was now severely lacking in weapons and equipment. To make matters worse, the income Zero Wing generated from its guild cities continued to decline. After the major system update, maintenance costs for NPCs had increased. Moreover, guilds were now required to pay upkeep for buildings and magic arrays. And although there was the teleportation hall in Silverwing City, most adventurer teams dared not enter Silverwing City at all, due to the pressure from the various superpowers. At this point, if not for the huge sum of funds from Crimson Emperor and Unyielding Soul, Zero Wing would have long since gone bankrupt and crumbled. Gaining a main city now would undoubtedly solve Zero Wing's financial problems. This was because a main guild city was much more amazing than an ordinary guild city. First and foremost, a main city was much larger than an ordinary guild city. Even a basic main city could easily accommodate more than 10 million inhabitants. Secondly, there were some high-end buildings that could be constructed only in main cities. Thirdly, a main city could recruit up to 30,000 NPC soldiers. With so many NPC soldiers, the main city security system would be much less vulnerable than ordinary guild cities. Lastly, a main city had the authority to govern a region. With this authority, a city could dispatch up to 20,000 of its soldiers to fight outside the city. In other words, the entire map the city was located in would be under the city's control. If Zero Wing City really did become a main city, the guild could afford to open the city to NPCs, and none of the various NPC forces would dare make trouble in the city. It's a secret, Sherfone replied, chuckling. However, you should get ready on your side. Once Zero Wing City's upgrade is complete, I plan to open the city to the public and construct a teleportation hall in the city that will connect it with Sky Spring City. At that time, I'll need you to manage Zero Wing City. As for Silver Wing City's management, leave that to Melancholic. You're having me manage Zero Wing City. Liang Jing was confused. But isn't Melancholic working in White River City? Wouldn't it be more convenient to have her manage Zero Wing City? Shaking his head, Shi Feng said, no. After Zero Wing City's upgrade, I plan to transfer it to a neutral map far away from Star Moon Kingdom. Melancholic already has her hands full with Candlelight's matters in Star Moon Kingdom. The most she can do is manage Silver Wing City. It would be impossible for her to manage Zero Wing City. Not only did Melancholic Smile have to manage the Candlelight Trading Firm, but as an advanced Master Forger, she also had to work on getting promoted to Grand Master Forger. If she had to manage a main city on top of that, she wouldn't even have time to sleep. After all, a main city had many more things that required management than an ordinary guild city. Just the recruitment and management of the main city's 30,000 NPC soldiers would be more than enough to keep a person occupied. Zero Wing City's manager would have to assign daily tasks to these soldiers as well as constantly revise the weapons and equipment configuration of these soldiers, allocating better gear and positions to soldiers who performed well, and so on. From his experience as a guild leader in his previous life, Sherfong understood just how tedious it was to manage a main guild city. In the past, it was precisely because he had to devote a significant portion of his time to handling guild affairs that he failed to reach tier 4. Hence, in this life, he had pushed all these tasks to other people while he focused on improving himself. Otherwise, he wouldn't have achieved his current combat power. You're also going to move the city. Liang Jing's breathing quickened when she heard Sherfang's words. Just the fact that Zero Wing City was getting promoted into a main city was already plenty shocking. If your phone could also move the city to a neutral map, Zero Wing would be rich. MHM, so I need you to begin the necessary preparations now. You'll probably be very busy afterward, Sher Fong said, nodding. Simultaneously, a hint of anticipation appeared in his eyes. Currently, of Zero Wing's three guild cities, Stone Forest City in the Dark Knight Empire and Silverwing City in the Orc Empire held strategic locations. In the case of Stone Forest City, it was necessary to stop the Dark World's invasion. As for Silverwing City, it served as a barrier to the Faux Saint Army's expansion. Hence, both cities should not be moved unless absolutely necessary. This left Zero Wing City as the only option to use as a foothold in high-level neutral maps. After all, unlike Stone Forest City and Silver Wing City, Zero Wing City didn't counter any player forces. Moreover, Zero Wing City's position in Star Moon Kingdom no longer brought much value to the guild. 
Two hours went by quickly, and an entirely new Zero Wing city came into view. Immediately afterward, Sherfong arrived in the city lord's mansion's core control room and injected 5,000 mana stones into the world mirror. He then transferred Zero Wing City to a level 140 neutral map, leaving the excited crowd outside the city dumbfounded. Chapter 2834, New Zero Wing City The city disappeared. What's going on? Wasn't Zero Wing supposed to get promoted into a main city? The players gathered at the Witch's Hill were inevitably confused when they saw Zero Wing City disappear all of a sudden. It just vanished into thin air. Did Zero Wing transfer the city elsewhere? That shouldn't be possible, right? This is a main city we're talking about. I looked into it before. If a main city will relocate within the borders of a country, transferring it requires not only an advanced city transfer order but also the permission of the host country. This is because a main city is deeply involved in the governance of the region it is in. A heated debate promptly arose over Zero Wing City's disappearance. Star Moon Kingdom's various powers, in particular, were nervous. After all, Zero Wing would automatically gain the ruling rights of whichever location Zero Wing City was transferred to. If this location happened to fall within their territory, they would have to say goodbye to their territory. Meanwhile, as Star Moon Kingdom's various players and powers were discussing this matter. Level 140 Neutral Map, Arctic Canyon A majestic and wealthy city suddenly appeared on a cliff near the coast of this map, instantly occupying nearly half of the 20,000-yard coastline. The city faced a boundless, snowy forest and had its back to the frozen sea. It's finally my turn to control this region in this life. Sure Foam couldn't help being a little excited as he looked at the ocean view outside the city. The Arctic Canyon was a level 140 to level 160 neutral map, one of the few neutral maps on the main continent connected to the sea. The Sea of Death was near the Arctic Canyon, and by crossing the Sea of Death, one could reach the western continent. The Arctic Canyon was one of the eastern continent's closest shores to the western continent. In addition, the Arctic Canyon also lay close to the top of the world. This was a new continent that countless experts in God's domain sought to conquer. Not only was the Arctic Canyon one of the few maps that led to the top of the world, but it was also the easiest entry point to this continent, which was 100,000 meters above sea level. In the past, every inch of land in the Arctic Canyon was worth its weight in gold. It was a place where the various superpowers sought to establish a foothold, no matter the cost. However, as most of the Arctic Canyon's terrain was uneven, the map could house only a limited number of guild cities, especially guild cities at the main city standard. The Arctic Canyon could house four main cities and 22 ordinary guild cities at most. Guild towns couldn't survive in this place at all. Even if the town received protection from a tier 5 player, the blizzard tier would still reduce it to a pile of ruins in an instant. For a shelter to survive here, it would need to be at the advanced city standard at a minimum. With such limited space, first-rate guilds and weaker would be dreaming if they thought they could establish a foothold here. In fact, most superpowers failed to do so in Shurfang's previous life. The four plots of land that could house main cities, in particular, were so heavily contested that even the five great super guilds met with failure. In the end, the five great super guilds had to share two of these lands, while the various superpowers shared the remaining two. Yet, Shurfang had now claimed the Arctic Canyon's best plot of land for himself. How could he not be excited by this situation? After all, any player that had reached level 150, tier 4 would have to visit the top of the world. This was because this new continent held plenty of ancient treasures and legacies, all of which were crucial for these players to further improve themselves. Back then, the top of the world was such a tempting place that even tier 3 players had come to challenge it. Unfortunately, due to the top of the world being too distant from Star Moon Kingdom, it had been completely outside Shadow's sphere of development. Hence, Sherfong never actually set foot into the top of the world in the past. He had only ever heard stories about it. The Arctic Canyon, though, was a place he had visited in his previous life. This was because the Arctic Canyon served as a trade hub for the two main continents. Over 20% of the ships traveling between the two continents would stop at the Arctic Canyon. After all, not everyone had a flying mount, and neither was everyone capable of reaching Tier 4. The intercontinental magic arrays available had also been monopolized by the various superpowers. As a result, most trades conducted between the two continents were still seaborne. With this place serving as Zero Wings base, the guild would no longer have to worry about matters relating to funds, resources, and leveling up. Even the various superpowers working together wouldn't be able to suppress Zero Wing. Next up is to set up the 12 Array Magic World. Shifting his gaze to the control room's core magic array, Sherfone took out various materials he had prepared beforehand. Apart from some basic materials, the 12 Array Magic World also required 300,000 magic crystals, 107 luminaries crystals, and 200 magic elven stones to set up. Once operational, the magic array would need 800 mana stones every day to maintain it. Even with the Philosopher's Stone's alchemical synthesis, it would still cost 40,000 magic crystals daily. Just its maintenance could already bankrupt the average first-rate guild. An hour later, Sherfong finished integrating the 12 Array Magic World with Zero Wing's core magic array. Once he injected the necessary mana stones into the magic array, he could activate it whenever he wanted. However, Sherfong did not rush to activate the 12 Array Magic World. Instead, he took out a gigantic, pitch-black heart from his bag. The heart was translucent like a crystal, and one could even see it beating occasionally. This crystalline heart was one of the two items Beast Emperor dropped. An Evil Demon King's Heart 
It was a bona fide inferior divine artifact ranked material. The value of this item rivaled a dragon's heart. Back when Chirfong picked up this item, he had even wondered if he had killed a tier 5 evil demon king instead of beast emperor. An inferior divine artifact ranked power source was beyond extraordinary. It could even elevate a basic main city into an advanced main city. Of course, the evil demon king's heart wasn't suitable to be used as a city's power source since it contained evil energy. Using it as a city's power source would contaminate the city's mana. However, the evil demon king's heart was perfect to be used as a magic barrier's core. This was because a magic barrier exhausted the energy it was supplied with to manipulate the power of the outside world. In contrast, a city's core magic array didn't consume its supplied energy to generate results but spread the energy to all parts of the city. Previously, the 12 array magic world had given Shurfong a headache since it was only a master magic array. Normally, only grandmaster magic arrays could cover a main city. Although the 12 array magic world was indeed powerful, it could cover only an entire basic city at best. Let's hope this thing lets the magic array undergo a qualitative transformation. Taking a deep breath, Shurfong placed the evil demon king's heart onto the 12 array magic world's core. He then activated the magic array. Suddenly, he sensed a terrifying and violent energy flowing into the magic array. This violent energy then shattered the space above Zero Wing City through the magic array, creating a dark void with a 10,000 yard radius. Upon the appearance of this dark void, the nearby Great Lord ranked monsters promptly fled the covered area, none of them daring to remain there. Immediately afterward, boundless mana surged out of the dark void and cascaded over Zero Wing City like a waterfall. So, this is the power of an inferior divine artifact ranked power source. Shurfong was dumbfounded by this situation. The present Zero Wing City already had extraordinarily dense mana due to the presence of the Mana Tower and the main city ranked Core Magic Array. In fact, its mana was even superior to Silver Wing City's. Yet, the instant the boundless mana flowing out of the Dark Void flooded Zero Wing City, the mana in the city had turned into mist. However, due to the 12 Array Magic World suppression, the misty mana actually disappeared immediately afterward, hiding within the void of this area. On the surface, it looked as if everything had reverted to its original state. In reality, though, the mana within the city had undergone a qualitative transformation. At this point, Shurfong could sense that his perception of mana had improved by at least 150% compared to before. The affinity within perception of mana he experienced here practically rivaled what he experienced in the NPC city he visited in the ancient god's domain. Guild leader, how are things coming along on your side? At this time, Liang Jing suddenly contacted Shurfong. I'm already done selecting the first batch of players to send to Zero Wing City. These players are completely loyal to us and have fought dozens of small and large battles for us. Every one of them has reached tier 3 and possesses great potential. I believe they can adequately handle Zero Wing City security and suppress any NPC troublemakers in the city. I'm done here too. Chuckling, Shurfong added, however, I think it's best if you come here in person first before deciding on the exact arrangements. I've already granted you access to the city. You can teleport here through a residence now. Chapter 2835, News of Zero Wing City Sky Spring City, Zero Wing's Residence At this time, more than 10,000 Tier 3 experts had gathered in Zero Wing's residence in Sky Spring City. Such a force was already enough to overwhelm even first-rate guilds. Moreover, this number continued to increase as time passed. This development inevitably shocked the various powers operating within Sky Spring City. What's going on with Zero Wing? Why is it gathering so many of its Tier 3 members in its residence? Is Zero Wing planning some kind of big operation? That might be possible. After the battle at the Secret Covenant Tower, Saint's Hand declared an all-out war on Zero Wing. Meanwhile, since the popular Orc Empire is Saint's Hand's home ground, other guilds have stopped visiting Silverwing City lest they offend Saint's Hand and get targeted by those faux Saint monsters. So, there's a good chance that Zero Wing is gathering its forces for a counterattack. The various powers secretly discussed Zero Wing's purpose in gathering its forces. Many of them guessed that Zero Wing wanted to make use of its current advantage to launch a big operation. After all, now that Zero Wing had the Secret Covenant Tower as its foundation, nobody was capable of threatening the guild's existence. With Zero Wing's ability to produce a large number of Tier 3 players continuously, it wouldn't necessarily be impossible for the guild to confront Saint's Hand in the Orc Empire. At this time, the people in the outside world weren't the only ones confused by Zero Wing's sudden decision to gather its Tier 3 members. Even the players in Zero Wing's residence were confused by the situation. Fire, have you found out what is going on? Solitary Sword, the red-haired commander of the Crimson Wolf Adventurer team, asked curiously as she looked at the Tier 3 summoner youth hurrying toward her. It would be hard not to notice the sudden appearance of so many Tier 3 experts in the residence. This was especially true now that so many top-tier epic weapons and equipment had appeared in Zero Wing's warehouse. In less than a day, 8 of the 100-plus epic weapons and equipment in the guild warehouse had already been claimed. And this was only the beginning. As more time passed, the various adventurer teams that had recently joined Zero Wing would accumulate more and more GCPs. Then, more and more of these epic items would get taken away. Although she had already managed to exchange for an epic headgear for swordsmen, she still had her eyes on an epic weapon. So long as she could obtain this weapon, her combat power would definitely undergo a qualitative transformation. If all of these many tier 3 experts, who had suddenly appeared in the residence, were aiming at the epic weapons and equipment, the competition would intensify sharply. 
Boss, I asked around. I even ask some of the adventurer teams I have friendly relations with. However, none of them know what's going on. Even the guild's core members have no clue about this situation, the summoner youth replied, shaking his head. However, I did find out why so many tier 3 members have gathered in Sky Spring City. It seems there's an emergency summons from the guild leader's assistant. Also, the ones summoned are all veteran members of the guild. The guild specifically summoned these core members. Solitary Sword frowned at this information. If that's the case, the guild is most likely undertaking a large-scale operation. Guilds would generally award a generous amount of contribution points to members who participated in their large-scale operations. Now that Zero Wing was gathering its veteran Tier 3 members for a large-scale operation, the competition for the epic weapons and equipment would undoubtedly intensify. While Solitary Sword worried over the situation, a large group of players suddenly entered the guild residence. Not only did none of these people wear Zero Wing's emblem, but they all exuded astonishingly powerful auras. The man leading the group even had an oppressive aura that verged on the aura of Tier 4 players. Why is Heaven's Blade's Vice Commander here? I heard rumors stating that Heaven's Blade became Zero Wing's subsidiary after the incident on Dragonheart Island. It seems these rumors were actually true. The arrival of Heaven's Blade's Tier 3 experts in Zero Wing's residence stunned the players idling around outside the residence. The various guild players were especially shocked. Although Heaven's Blade was only an adventurer team, it possessed incredible fame. The adventurer team even had three domain realm experts. Moreover, many superpowers in God's domain had tried recruiting Heaven's Blade, but the adventurer team had refused all the invitations it received. Yet, Heaven's Blade now appeared in Zero Wing's residence. Given the rumors surrounding the two organizations, Heaven's Blade's arrival was basically a declaration that the adventurer team now belonged to Zero Wing. This was absolutely bad news for the various guilds. Thus far, Zero Wing could only remain on the defensive due to a lack of manpower. However, things would definitely change now that Heaven's Blade had come under Zero Wing. Vice Commander, Zero Wing really is amazing. It already has so many Tier 3 experts now. At this rate, it won't be long before Zero Wing overtakes the various superpowers in this regard, Cleansing Flame said, sighing ruefully as she took in her surroundings. She had heard something of the battle that had taken place at the Secret Covenant Tower. At one point in the past, Heaven's Blade had been in existence that could contend against the various superpowers. At that time, the adventure team had more experts than Zero Wing. Now, Zero Wing had become a true behemoth. Despite not being an actual superpower, it had already surpassed the various superpowers. Chuckling at Cleansing Flame's words, Divine Shadow said, All right, let's hurry up. We shouldn't make Guild Leader Black Flame wait for too long. Nodding, Cleansing Flame quickly followed Divine Shadow to the residence's guild hall. Personally, she was very curious about why Shirfone had suddenly called for Heaven's Blade's top combatants this time. Logically, with the number of Tier 3 experts Zero Wing had assembled in Sky Spring City, it shouldn't lack manpower here. In fact, the guild should be sending more manpower to Dragonheart Island instead. After all, the exploration of the World Tower's fourth underground floor wasn't an easy task. Shortly afterward, Divine Shadow and Cleansing Flame reached the top floor meeting room of Zero Wing's residence. At this time, the executives of Zero Wing and the Azura Adventure team had long been waiting here. The arrival of Heaven's Blade's members confused these executives. However, as Zero Wing's and Azura's executives wondered why Shirfong had invited Heaven's Blade's members, Shirfong and Liang Jing also entered the room. After taking his seat, Shirfong scanned the crowd before him and said, Sorry for the long wait. At Shirfong's words, everyone in the room fell silent and looked at Shirfong with curious eyes. Liang Jing. Seeing everyone's confusion, Shirfong chuckled and said, Brief everyone about the specifics of the situation. In response, Liang Jing stepped up to the table and opened the booklet she held. After taking a deep breath, she said, Everyone, I believe you should know by now that Zero Wing City has been upgraded into a main city. The reason we have gathered you here today is to discuss Zero Wing City's future development. Zero Wing City's future development. Divine Shadow found Liang Jing's explanation strange. If today's meeting was about Zero Wing City's future development, there should be no reason for the guild to invite Heaven's Blade to attend. After all, this was Zero Wing's internal matter. It should have nothing to do with an affiliated adventurer team. That's right. Nodding, Liang Jing said, before this, everyone has been wondering where Zero Wing City went. Now, I can tell everyone that Zero Wing City is currently located in the Arctic Canyon, a level 140 neutral map. After saying so, Liang Jing shared the specifics regarding the Arctic Canyon through the conference table's virtual interface. These are the Arctic Canyon's details. Feel free to study them. At Liang Jing's words, everyone promptly opened the file they received and began reading up on Arctic Canyon. After a short silence, gasps sounded in the room one after another. Chapter 2836, Zero Wing's New Benefits The information Liang Jing provided was very detailed. According to the information, the Arctic Canyon had its back to the ocean and also served as the entrance to the top of the world. These two points aside, just the fact that Tier 4 Legacy Land spawned in the Arctic Canyon was already more than enough to drive countless Tier 3 players wild. When everyone in the room finished reading the information provided, they could already imagine the sensation Zero Wing City would cause throughout God's domain as soon as it opened to the public. It wouldn't even be strange if Zero Wing City became the most popular city in the game. 
At this time, let alone Zero Wings members, even Heaven's Blade's Divine Shadow couldn't help gazing at the information before him with passionate eyes. Although the World Tower's fourth underground floor was a good place to search for Tier 4 legacy lands, it was still significantly inferior to the Arctic Canyon. This was because the fortresses on the fourth floor were far from comparable to an actual city. Unlike fortresses, cities were made as rest areas for players. Cities addressed the various needs of players, such as providing a place for trade in the form of an auction house. Fortresses did not possess such functions. After reading the information, Fire Dance turned to Shurfong and asked, Guild Leader, do you mean to close Zero Wing City's access to the public and have us monopolize the map for now? Upon hearing Fire Dance's words, everyone else looked at Shurfong curiously as well. Since today's meeting was to discuss Zero Wing City's future development, the best option would definitely be opening the city to the public right off the bat. This way, the city could rake in a fortune just from entrance fees alone. After all, with Zero Wing City's advantages, it would instantly become the most popular city in God's domain, surpassing even Imperial capitals. It would become a mecca for countless Tier 3 experts. However, if Shurfong had decided to simply open Zero Wing City to the public, there would be no point in gathering them here today. He could do so on his own volition. That's right. Now that we have secured such a big advantage, we naturally have to use it to benefit ourselves. Only after we have grown stronger will we open Zero Wing City to the public, Shurfong said, nodding. It's just that operating a main city costs a lot. If it were an ordinary guild city, just the maintenance cost of 30,000 NPC soldiers could bankrupt several first-rate guilds. Moreover, he had enhanced the city with the 12 Array Magic World, further increasing the city's demand for magic crystals. Hence, he had no choice but to give up on his plan to limit access to the guild's several thousand core members. After all, a measly few thousand players could hardly cover the expenditure of such a main city. In that case, we might as well give access to all guild members. Of course, we will also have to charge an adequate fee since running a closed city is a losing business, Flying Shadow suggested. That won't do. Shaking his head, Blackie said, we have a lot of people joining Zero Wing recently. If the various powers successfully sneak some of their members into our guild, we'll suffer a huge loss. Everyone in the room nodded in agreement with Blackie. Currently, many guilds had already begun sneaking their members into Zero Wing just because of the benefits offered by the Mobile Fortress and the Secret Covenant Tower. To counter this problem, Fire Dance had deliberately made core membership a requirement for entering the Mobile Fortress. To become a core member of Zero Wing, one would have to contribute a lot to the guild. It would take a new member one or two months to accumulate sufficient contributions. Only after this new regulation appeared did the various guilds dismiss their plans. However, this new regulation failed to deter the adventurer teams. Adventurer teams still joined Zero Wing one after another, all of them with the purpose of utilizing the mobile fortress's training environment. They had joined the guild solely to exploit the guild for their own benefit. Once these adventurer teams achieved their goals, there was a high chance they would just pack up and leave. Of course, Zero Wing didn't mind that much. After all, these adventurer teams would have to make the corresponding contributions to obtain the benefits they sought. At this time, Yulan suggested, how about we learn from the mobile fortress's example and let only core members enter? I'm afraid we won't have enough numbers if that's the case. Shaking her head, Liang Jing explained, based on our current estimates, we need at least 80,000 people to keep Zero Wing City running normally. Even then, we'd have to charge one magic crystal per person. It cost 40,000 magic crystals just to keep the 12 array magic world running. After factoring in the magic crystals needed to keep the city's various other magic arrays and constructions operating, the city would need to make at least 80,000 magic crystals per day to avoid falling into the red. Moreover, this still didn't include the cost of the 30,000 tier 3 NPC soldiers the guild planned to recruit. That much. Yolan was slightly surprised. A daily operational cost of 80,000 magic crystals was something even the various superpowers would find hard to stomach, especially since this was only one city they were talking about. That's why Liang Jing and I plan to open Zero Wing City to the elite members of Zero Wing and Zero Wing's affiliated powers as well. However, everyone will have to cover the teleportation fees themselves. Elite members will also have to pay three magic crystals to enter the city, while core members will have to pay two magic crystals, Shifeng said. Apart from the core members we gathered this time, everyone else will be free to choose whether they want to enter the city or not. Three magic crystals per person. This entrance fee rendered everyone present speechless. It was undoubtedly the highest ever charged in God's domain's history. If the city were open to the public, there might still be many people entering the city despite the high cost. However, if access was limited to guild members, the number of players entering the city would be minimal. After all, players had far too few sources of magic crystals. For the average player, they could obtain magic crystals only by harvesting ores, doing quests, opening treasure chests, and raiding large-scale team dungeons. It was almost impossible for them to obtain magic crystals through standard grinding. If a player was merely seeking to level up, they would be much better off heading to the Secret Covenant Tower instead of the Arctic Canyon. As for those trying to find Tier 4 Legacy Lands. To put it bluntly, how many players in Zero Wing were actually confident of completing their Tier 4 promotion quests? Tier 4 Legacy Lands were necessary for the guild, not for the guild's members. If the average guild member found a Tier 4 Legacy Land, they would, at best, receive a reward from the guild. However, if obtaining this reward meant having to explore a level 140 neutral map and pay an entrance fee of 3 magic crystals, very few people would accept such a business proposition. 
After listening to Shi Feng's words, Cleansing Flame turned to Divine Shadow and asked quietly, Vice Commander, should the two of us head to Zero Wing City and take a look first? Although we brought only core members with us this time, it would still be a considerable cost if all 2,000 of them enter the city. It would be a lie to say that they weren't tempted by the prospect of finding Tier 4 Legacy Lands. However, Heaven's Blade had already suffered a major loss due to its previous disbandment. Apart from some fixed assets, Heaven's Blade didn't have much resources left, and just maintaining the adventurer team's daily operation was a struggle. If they splurged their precious magic crystals now, they would be putting the cart before the horse. After all, magic crystals were different from ancient coins and standard coins. While purchasing magic crystals in small quantities was possible, purchasing them in bulk was absolutely impossible. At this stage of the game, due to the high demand for magic crystals, even the five great super guilds had begun publicly purchasing magic crystals. Yet, they only managed to purchase the crystals in small quantities from independent players seeking to earn credits. None of the various guilds or adventurer teams members would be dumb enough to trade magic crystals for credits. MHM. We'll do that, Divine Shadow said, nodding. If the Arctic Canyon is better, we can shift our base of operations to Zero Wing City instead of continuing our struggle with the various superpowers on Dragonheart Island. Shortly after Shurfone and the others concluded their meeting, Zero Wing suddenly announced a new guild benefit on its notice board. The announcement included information on Zero Wing City's current location and the qualifications and cost of entering the city. A sensation immediately spread within the guild. Can this be considered a benefit? Although Zero Wing City's location is good, the guild is charging elite members three magic crystals to enter. Isn't the guild just trying to harvest us for magic crystals? That's right. That's a level 140 neutral map we're talking about. Our average level is only level 122. Even tier 3 players will have difficulty killing the monsters in the Arctic Canyon. If the guild really wants to give us a new benefit, it should let us enter for free. However, the Arctic Canyon is an unexplored neutral map. There will be plenty of treasure chests and dungeons waiting for us. We also won't have to worry about competing with the members of the other powers. Exploring the Arctic Canyon will definitely be more profitable than exploring level 130 neutral maps. For a time, Zero Wings members debated heatedly among themselves. While some felt that the entrance fee was too much, others felt that the benefits they could gain from the Arctic Canyon were worth the cost. Boss, should we head to Zero Wing City, the Tier 3 Summoner Youth from the Crimson Wolf Adventurer team asked Solitary Sword. Many of our team's members are planning to head to the Secret Covenant Tower to grind for levels first. They think that there's no need to explore the Arctic Canyon for now. Of course. Why wouldn't we go? Solitary Sword said with a faint smile. I've always been thinking of finding a Tier 4 Legacy Land. Now that there's an opportunity before me, why wouldn't I take it? Besides, I'm curious to see what the guild's main city looks like. It's just three magic crystals. It's not like we're going to be operating out of Zero Wing City. Subsequently, Solitary Sword went to Sky Spring City's teleportation hall together with several dozen of her Tier 3 companions. At this time, hardly any players could be seen teleporting from Sky Spring City to Zero Wing City. The majority of Zero Wing's elite members didn't have much of a desire to visit Zero Wing City. Compared to spending three magic crystals to go sightseeing in Zero Wing City, they would rather spend one magic crystal to enter the Secret Covenant Tower and grind for levels. Shortly afterward, the teleportation hall's teleportation array leading to Zero Wing City flashed. The several hundred members standing on the teleportation array then disappeared and reappeared in the distant Zero Wing City's teleportation hall in the blink of an eye. Chapter 2837, Holy Land Zero Wing City, Teleportation Hall Accompanied by a bright flash, several hundred players suddenly appeared on one of the teleportation arrays in the teleportation hall. With the arrival of these players, the teleportation array, which was the size of a basketball court, instantly became overcrowded. However, despite this uncomfortable situation, none of the people present raised a fuss. On the contrary, they all stood blankly on the spot as if petrified. How is this possible? How can the mana here feel so dense? Cleansing Flame, who stood among the crowd, was shocked and confused when she sensed the mana surrounding her. The ambient mana clearly wasn't a mist, yet she felt as if she had sunk into a lake the instant she arrived. This was the first time she found mana heavy. Even mana that had taken on a mist form could not compare to the density of the mana she was experiencing. The two were worlds apart from each other. After thoroughly experiencing the calm and empty feeling brought about by the surrounding mana, the astonished Cleansing Flame muttered, training in this magical environment will probably yield double the results compared to training in other guild cities. Although there were many items in God's domain that could help players clear up their minds and invigorate their thoughts, the effects of these items paled significantly when compared to the effects of Zero Wing City's mana. Double. You're severely underestimating this place. The mana here isn't just incredibly dense, Divine Shadow said, shaking his head. With his face blank with astonishment, he continued, my mana affinity feels like it doubled or more. I can perceive the operating principles of mana with much greater clarity. If we train here, our training efficiency will quadruple at the very least. Moreover, this place should also be of great help toward reaching Tier 4. What made the Tier 4 promotion quest challenging wasn't just the troublesome process of finding a Tier 4 legacy land. Having to learn a Tier 4 skill or spell within a short time was also a huge hurdle. This condition placed an incredibly high demand on players' understanding of and familiarity with mana. This was akin to asking a programmer to create a game of epic proportions within a limited period. 
While most programmers knew the programming language necessary to create the game, not every programmer had the skill and understanding to complete the game within the time limit. Hence, apart from a small number of geniuses gifted in this regard, everyone else would face great difficulty completing this condition. In this situation, the only thing players could do to remedy this problem was improve their familiarity with and control over mana. Only, doing so was easier said than done, as very few external items in God's domain could help in this regard. Now, Zero Wing City made this possible. Upon hearing Divine Shadow's words, Cleansing Flame also focused on her affinity with the surrounding mana. Immediately afterward, an indescribable sense of shock overwhelmed her. At this time, her perception of the operating principles of mana had undergone a massive transformation. Previously, whenever she tried perceiving the operating principles of mana, it was as if a dense layer of fog hindered her perception. Without assistance from legacies and graphical introductions, she wouldn't have understood anything. Now, when she tried perceiving how mana operated, her perception was no longer as foggy as before. Instead of a dense layer of fog, it was more like a thin gauze hindered her perception. Even without concentrating, she could still perceive the operating principles with great clarity. With this improvement in her perception, she quickly found answers to the problems previously plaguing her. Now, I know why guild leader Black Flame dared to collect magic crystals so wantonly and even called this city a guild benefit. When Divine Shadow perceived his improved control over mana, he couldn't help a bitter smile. With the mana density here, he doesn't need to worry about nobody visiting the city at all. In fact, countless tier 3 experts will probably want to enter the city. The special nature of Zero Wing City's mana simply couldn't be found in any other guild city in God's domain. This was especially true for the improved perception of the operating principles of mana. This effect could hardly be found anywhere in the continent. It also wasn't something that training could offset. At this time, Divine Shadow wasn't the only person with such thoughts. The other people standing on the teleportation array shared his outlook. Amazing. This is simply amazing. If I can stay here long term, aside from improving my combat standards, I can probably rapidly unlock my mana body to 100% completion rate, too, the tier 3 summoner youth from Crimson Wolf exclaimed. Although he had already reached tier 3 for some time now, he was still far from fully unlocking his mana body's potential. Meanwhile, the difference between fully unlocked and partially unlocked mana bodies was significant. Previously, he was already at the brink of despair over fully unlocking his mana body. However, he saw hope again after arriving in Zero Wing City. Moreover, he felt that his odds of success were excellent. So, this is why Zero Wing isn't afraid of making enemies of the various superpowers. With this city, Zero Wing will have to mess up very badly to fail in its development, Solitary Sword said. She, too, felt incredibly excited when she realized Zero Wing City's benefits. Previously, she had anticipated that Zero Wing City would only provide temporary shelter while she searched for Tier 4 Legacy Lands. Now, however, she could also use Zero Wing City to improve herself and increase her chances of promotion to Tier 4. After a brief silence, the several hundred players standing on the teleportation array could no longer suppress the restlessness in their hearts. They charged out of the teleportation hall, curious to see what the situation in Zero Wing City was like. As soon as everyone exited the building, they were dumbfounded by the sight that greeted them. Zero Wing City was practically more developed than NPC cities. Not only was the city filled with high-rises, but there were also all sorts of high-end buildings. Most importantly, this city had a battle arena. This was a place where players could conduct PvP to their heart's content. Originally, the battle arena held very little attraction for Tier 3 players. This was because the battle arena provided very little benefit to Tier 3 players, apart from the opportunity to spar against powerful experts. Only Tier 2 players and below preferred to visit the battle arena for sparring. In the present Zero Wing City, however, the battle arena had undoubtedly become the place everyone paid most attention to. All of the new arrivals in the city wished they could charge into the battle arena and start sparring immediately. As more and more players arrived in Zero Wing City, news about the city quickly spread in Zero Wing's guild channel. In less than half an hour, Zero Wing's elite members started flocking to Sky Spring City like a bunch of madmen, crowding the city's teleportation hall. Many of these elite members had to wait for several dozen minutes before they could teleport to Zero Wing City. Naturally, the mass gathering of Zero Wing's elite members resulted in information about Zero Wing City reaching the ears of the various powers and independent players. The various powers couldn't help wishing they could head to Zero Wing City and take a look at the situation there for themselves. Unfortunately, with Zero Wing's regulations, they could only watch from the sidelines. Contact Zero Wing immediately. Tell them that the Wind Valley Guild is willing to partner with them so long as they open Zero Wing City to us. Contact Zero Wing and say that the Draconic Adventurer team is willing to join Zero Wing, but Zero Wing must make all our members elite members. For a time, various guilds contacted Zero Wing for partnership, while Adventurer teams sought to join the guild as a whole. There were even superpowers that made overtures to Zero Wing. Guild leader, over 40 first-rate guilds and 200 adventurer teams have contacted us already. We even received calls from 5 superpowers. All of them are either looking to form partnerships or join us with the condition of receiving access to Zero Wing City, Fire Dance reported excitedly when she read the statistical data her subordinate sent her. Some guilds are even willing to pay an entrance fee of 10 magic crystals per player. According to our current estimates, we can get an additional 500,000 players entering the city. Should we let them in? 
If they charge 10 magic crystals per person, they could gain an additional income of 5 million magic crystals per day. Even superpowers would go crazy from jealousy if they saw Zero Wing City raking in so many magic crystals. After all, the average superpower would have a stockpile of only several million magic crystals at this stage of the game, while Zero Wing City could earn that amount every day. Now still isn't the time to let them enter the city, Shifeng said, shaking his head. However, you can tell them that Zero Wing is willing to conduct some preliminary partnerships. We will offer 1 million entry slots for now. Only 1 million? Fire Dance asked, confused. Zero Wing City was already a main city. Let alone 1 million, it could easily accommodate 10 million players. Even if they excluded the slots Zero Wing needed, such a tight restriction to the entry slots shouldn't be necessary. After all, they would be making 10 magic crystals for every non-guild member that entered the city. MHM. Any guild that has signed a strategic alliance or resource alliance with Zero Wing can purchase these slots, Shifeng said, nodding. We will auction off these slots through candlelight, with a starting bid of 10 magic crystals per slot. Auction. Fire Dance's eyes lit up in realization when she heard Shifeng's words. I understand. I'll notify them now. Chapter 2838, Astonishing News When Fire Dance announced Zero Wing's plan to sell 1 million entry slots for Zero Wing City, a commotion broke out throughout the Eastern Continent. Almost every power operating on the Eastern Continent promptly held a meeting among their executives to discuss the entry slots. Orc Empire, Crimson Flame Fortress How arrogant of Zero Wing! Aren't they afraid of suffering a backlash for pulling such a stunt? Snow Scar, who was now a level 130, tier 4 berserker, sneered as he looked at the information displayed on the conference table. They probably aren't aware that Saint's Hand has already established a city in the Black Hills, together with over a dozen superpowers. The Black Hills This was a level 130 neutral map connected to the Valley of Death, a forbidden land. Meanwhile, the Valley of Death was also the map that current players had the best chances of exploring successfully. Although the forbidden land was dangerous, according to the reports of the tier 4 experts who had explored it already, the number of tier 4 legacy lands appearing inside far exceeded that of other places. There were also plenty of ancient ruins hidden in the map, which were of significant help with getting promoted to tier 4. In fact, even tier 4 players could reap a lot of benefits from these ancient ruins. In response to Snowscar's words, Jing Yang, who was now a level 131, tier 4 great wizard, turned to the woman exuding a heroic and charming aura, seated at the table's seat of honor. In a respectful tone, he said, Vice Guild Leader, Saint's Hand has sent us an invitation as well. They say they will offer us 10% of their new city shares once it is constructed. However, we will need to garrison the city with one tier 4 player and 20,000 tier 3 players in return. How calculative of Saint's Hand. They must be aiming to have us help them deal with Zero Wing in the Orc Empire, a level 128, tier 4 female assassin said, smirking. However, if they want to use us as pawns, don't you think that the price they're offering is too low? Snow Scar also nodded in agreement with the female assassin. The Blackwater Guild was no longer the same as it was before. Under Xuan Wuchisa's lead, the guild had grown to a point where it could rival even super guilds. Moreover, unknown to the public, the guild even had six tier 4 experts already. Jin Yang, tell Saint's Hand that they need to show more sincerity if they want to partner with us. We want at least 30% of the city shares, Xuan Wuchisa said, opening her eyes. Also, notify Zero Wing of Saint's Hand's actions. Tell them that Blackwater is willing to partner with Zero Wing to go up against Saint's Hand's alliance. However, in return, they must allow all of Blackwater's elite members into Zero Wing City. Vice Guild Leader, you know how Zero Wing operates. There's no way they will agree to such a condition, Jin Yang argued, feeling a headache incoming. He had negotiated with Zero Wing for partnership many times in the past, yet he had faced rejection every time. Now that Zero Wing had the potential to rival the five great super guilds, it had even less need to heed Blackwater's demands. It doesn't matter if they don't accept it now, Xuan Wuchisa said nonchalantly. Once Saint's Hand opens their city and that side arrives, Zero Wing will have no choice but to agree to our demands. I understand. Jin Yang nodded. The current Zero Wing indeed had the qualifications to be arrogant. However, once Saint's Hand opened its city in the Black Hills, the situation would quickly reverse. After all, mainstream players were currently only at level 120. Although the Arctic Canyon was also an excellent location, it simply wasn't a place mainstream players could visit. At most, they could only make use of Zero Wing City's incredible mana environment. Not to mention, Saint's Hand's alliance consisted of more than a dozen superpowers. With the manpower and resources available to them, the alliance would soon become an existence that even the five great super guilds had to be wary of. At that time, Zero Wing's advantage in Tier 4 players would also disappear. However, Saint's Hand's alliance still wasn't the biggest problem Zero Wing would have to face but the world shattering were looming over the main continent. A guild like Zero Wing, which had established a base in a level 140 neutral map, would definitely head the list of cannon fodder for this war. Currently, though, very few people in God's domain actually knew of this upcoming war. The only reason Blackwater knew about it was Xuan Wuchisa's special identity. Just when Blackwater was about to notify Zero Wing of Saint's Hand's actions, Saint's Hand actually announced its astonishing plan to the entire eastern continent. Moreover, Saint's Hand even declared that it would open its city to everyone and charge a cheap entrance fee of only one magic crystal or 50 silver coins. As soon as this news came out, many of the first-rate powers considering partnering with Zero Wing promptly changed their minds. 
After all, although Zero Wing City possessed an excellent environment, the entrance fee it charged was simply beyond the various first-rate powers means. Not to mention, the city's entry slots would be auctioned. In other words, the entry slots wouldn't cost just 10 magic crystals. By the end of the auction, each slot might actually go for 15 or even 20 magic crystals. Moreover, this was only the price to enter the city. Once inside the city, they were bound to incur all sorts of other expenditures as well. Rather than spending all those magic crystals, it would be much better to head to Saint's Hand City and explore the Valley of Death for Ancient Ruins and Tier 4 Legacy Lands. Not only could they save up on a lot of magic crystals by doing so, but their potential income was also higher. Sky Spring City, Zero Wings Residence Guild leader, 90% of the first-rate powers seeking to partner with us and 80% of the adventurer team seeking to join us changed their minds after Saint's Hand's announcement, Fire Dance said, a hint of disbelief in her eyes as she read the report she just received. There won't be any competition for the entry slots. In fact, the 1 million slots we're offering exceed the remaining guild's demand. It doesn't matter. Let Saint's Hand do whatever it wants. Our plan will remain the same. We will still sell 1 million entry slots during the auction, Sherfong said, chuckling as he looked at the statistical report. When the time comes, just sell as many slots as possible. To begin with, we're not doing this to earn magic crystals. We're just trying to keep Zero Wing City operational. You might be right, but if we have enough magic crystals, we could construct another mobile fortress, right? Fire Dance said regretfully. The magic crystals Zero Wing earned from its members visiting Zero Wing City were already more than enough to keep the city functioning normally. The only problems remaining were the recruitment and maintenance of the city's NPC soldiers. However, resolving these issues wasn't a big deal for the present Zero Wing. This was because many guild members were willing to develop themselves in Zero Wing City. There were also more than 20,000 Tier 3 experts from Heaven's Blade and Azura. In total, Zero Wing City already had an astonishing 50,000 Tier 3 players operating in it. At this point, all they needed to do was wait until the guild accumulated enough Tier 3 members to ensure Zero Wing City security. Once the city security was no longer a concern, they could open up the city to NPCs and begin recruiting NPC soldiers in large numbers. However, the mobile fortress's power had made a deep impression on Fire Dance. She believed it would be wonderful if Zero Wing could gain another mobile fortress. Let's not talk about getting another mobile fortress, Sherfong said, chuckling. What we can do is further increase the number of Tier 4 players we have to improve the guild's strength. Further increase. Fire Dance parroted, confused by Sherfong's words. Is that even doable? Producing Tier 4 players was easier said than done. Finding Tier 4 legacy lands was one thing, mastering a Tier 4 skill or spell within the allotted time was another thing altogether. The help Zero Wing City's environment provided for this aspect could already be regarded as the best available in God's domain. She found it hard to imagine other ways to help Zero Wing produce even more Tier 4 players. Of course. Smiling, Sherfong said, contact Summer and the others and have them gather in Zero Wing City City Lord's Mansion. If it were before he had visited the Ancient God's Domain, he would indeed have no way of accomplishing such a feat however, after his trip to the Ancient Era, he did. And that was by using the Ancient Beast Sculpture. Chapter 2839, Statue's Astonishing Function Zero Wing City, City Lord's Mansion Alluring Summer, Shadow Sword, Turtle Dove, Cola, Yulan, Blackie, Flying Shadow, Silent Blade, Stubborn Bone, Yi Wu Mian, Rampant Blade, Su Qian Liu, Minor Wind, and Graceful Moon gathered in the second underground floor of the City Lord's Mansion after receiving Fire Dance's summons. Looking at Fire Dance, who was guiding their group, Cola asked curiously, Commander, why did the guild leader suddenly have us come over? At Cola's question, the others in the group also looked at Fire Dance curiously. For the sake of raising their chances of getting promoted to Tier 4, they had all focused on training in the battle arena recently to improve their control over mana. In Zero Wing City's mana environment, their control over mana had improved at a noticeable rate. Among them, Alluring Summer had become a master magician and even gained her own mana domain. Her achievements had spurred the rest of them to train even more zealously. Yet, instead of letting them focus on their training, Fire Dance had suddenly summoned them here. It's a secret, Fire Dance answered with a smile. Moreover, this trip will be beneficial for you. You might even increase your chances of getting promoted to Tier 4 by a large margin. Fire Dance naturally knew of everyone's desire to get promoted to Tier 4. After all, Zero Wing City's environment was greatly beneficial to even a Tier 4 player like herself, let alone Tier 3 players. Moreover, in the current God's Domain, Tier 3 players couldn't make any waves at all. Only by reaching Tier 4 would a player have an impact on the big picture. Are you trying to trick us, Commander? We already have Zero Wing City's environment to help us. Is there really another way to increase our chances of promotion further? Shadow Sword asked skeptically. However, he couldn't help growing a little eager and excited at Fire Dance's answer. He understood very clearly that with his current standards, it would be incredibly difficult for him to get promoted to Tier 4, even with the support of Zero Wing City's excellent environment. It would most likely take him several attempts before he could get promoted. And worse, players who failed their Tier 4 promotion quest had to wait for a long period before they could rechallenge their promotion quest. Even if he could find another Tier 4 Legacy Land quickly, he would still have to wait up to a month. If he suffered consecutive failures, it could very well take him up to half a year or possibly more to reach Tier 4. 
If he were to hover at Tier 3 for half a year, he simply couldn't imagine how far he would fall behind the current Tier 4 players. After all, there were still many places in God's domain that only Tier 4 players and above could set foot in. Meanwhile, the opportunities, legacies, and items available in these forbidden lands were far superior to what other maps provided. That was what the guild leader said, Fire Dance said, nodding. Otherwise, he wouldn't have interrupted your training spree and called you here. After saying so, Fire Dance stopped before a stone door sealed by a magic array. Standing guard beside the stone door were four level 140, tier 3 fine gold guards. Even if a tier 4 player came here, they shouldn't think of getting past these NPCs quickly. When the four NPCs saw Fire Dance, they promptly removed the seal on the stone door. Subsequently, the stone door parted slowly, revealing a room the size of a basketball court. Many magic arrays isolated the room. Even if a tier 4 player made a ruckus inside the room, their actions would go unnoticed in the outside world. Sherfone was waiting inside the isolated room. After glancing at everyone, Sherfone said, Come on in. In response to Sherfeng's words, Fire Dance entered the room curiously, followed by the rest of the group shortly afterward. After everyone entered the room, the four guards outside the room closed the door and quietly stood watch by the door, none of them daring to relax for even a moment. Having entered the room, Fire Dance and the others couldn't help looking at Sherfone in confusion. This was because even after entering the isolated room, they failed to sense anything special about it. In fact, the mana density inside the room even seemed slightly lower compared to outside. Upon seeing everyone's confusion, Sherfone smiled and said, You must be wondering why I summoned you to such a place, right? Guild leader, the commander said you have a way to further increase our chances of getting promoted to tier 4. Unable to hold back his curiosity any longer, Kola asked, is that true? Truthfully, Kola didn't have much confidence in getting promoted to tier 4 since his combat standard was still stuck at the flowing water realm even now. His control over mana was also only at the advanced magician standard. It was basically impossible for him to learn a tier 4 legacy skill within a short period. It's true. However, how much improvement you gain will depend on yourselves, Sherfong said, nodding. He then pointed at the ancient beast statue set up in the center of the room and continued, This thing is the key to your promotion to tier 4. A statue. Everyone present grew even more confused when they heard Sherfang's words. Even Fire Dance was no exception. Although the statue in front of them looked exquisite, no matter how they looked at it, it did not seem like a tool that could help them reach tier 4. Observe it from a closer distance, Sherfong said, chuckling. But don't use your eyes, use your whole body to perceive it. The ancient beast statue was an incomparably mysterious object, and it was incredibly difficult for someone to notice its uniqueness. This was because the ancient beast statue would reveal its properties only in an environment with incredibly dense mana. Moreover, these properties were noticeable only at close distance. If one stood too far away from the statue, one wouldn't sense anything special about it. In fact, placing the statue in a room would even cause the density of the mana in the room to drop. In the past, some players had even treated the ancient beast statues as junk and sold them cheap. At Shurfang's advice, Kola and the others approached the statue. And when everyone got within 10 yards of the ancient beast statue, their expressions promptly changed. How is this possible? The operating principles of mana have become much clearer. There's at least a 50% improvement. As a tier 4 player, Fire Dance was the quickest to notice the changes the ancient beast statue brought about, and she couldn't help gaping at the statue in disbelief. Assuming that she could view the operating principles of mana at only 10% clarity under normal circumstances, then in Zero Wing City's environment, she could view the operating principles at 20% clarity. However, standing beside the ancient beast statue, she could view the operating principles at 30% clarity. Kola and the others did not achieve as good a result as Fire Dance since they were still at tier 3, however, they still managed to achieve a clarity of at least 20%. At this time, their perception of the operating principles of mana was superior to the average tier 4 players. Now, they were basically viewing the world around them from a higher perspective than even tier 4 players. As tier 3 players, the benefits they could gain from such an experience were immeasurable. If this situation leaked to the public, the various powers of God's domain would most likely go crazy. Fire Dance finally understood why Sherfong had instructed her to be extremely careful when coming to this place and even limiting the people she could invite to only the guild's core executives. The next moment, the isolated room fell indescribably quiet. This was because Kola, Alluring Summer, and everyone else had wholeheartedly thrown themselves into their enhanced perception with no intention of exiting this immersion. Sherfong did not find this situation surprising, either. After obtaining world authority, his perception of the operating principles of mana had reached an incredibly high level. Within the ancient beast statue's vicinity, he could even achieve a 40% clarity. Back when he was controlling for Barrow, a half-step demon king, he had only managed to achieve a 50% clarity, yet he already had a feeling of invincibility. Of course, this was only a misconception arising from suddenly obtaining so much power. Even so, the brief experience of viewing the world through for Barrow's senses had provided him with immense help in developing his mana body and improving his control over mana. Although he didn't get the same feeling when standing next to the ancient beast statue, he was relatively close to that feeling already. And while subject to this sensation, even he couldn't help wishing he could disregard all his duties and focus solely on researching the operating principles of mana, so what more Kola and the others? 
Shortly after Fire Dance immersed herself in her enhanced perception, the mana around her body began rampaging. It was evident that she was trying to break through her mana body's 100% threshold. Sherfone was slightly surprised to see this. He then took out a colorful crystal from his bag and handed it to Fire Dance, saying, Don't rush to break through yet. Do it after you finish learning the legacy inside this thing. In response to Sherfeng's words, Fire Dance halted her attempt to break through and accepted the memory crystal. However, after checking the memory crystal, she was stunned. She never thought that Sherfone would actually possess such a precious legacy. Moreover, the legacy recorded in the memory crystal even contained information on how to reconstruct one's mana body. For tier 4 players like herself, this information was priceless. Guild leader, this is a sword saint's legacy. Giving it to me would be wasteful, Fire Dance said hesitantly. She was no fool. Anyone who had gotten promoted to tier 4 would know what was most important to a tier 4 player, achieving a breakthrough in one's mana body and reconstructing it. This was the basis of getting promoted to tier 5. However, Sherfone simply chuckled and said, relax. This is a complete legacy crystal. It can be used up to 9 times. Every person will get the best result from the crystal only on their first use. Using it more than once would be a waste. Now that you are one of Zero Wing's key combatants, it will be of great help to the guild if you can further improve yourself. Teresa had given him a complete tier 5 legacy crystal that could be used 9 times. And although it was a Sword Saint's legacy, as the Swordsman and Assassin classes were both physical classes, an Assassin could still gain significant help from the legacy. If Fire Dance could elevate her mana body's potential to 105% due to this legacy crystal, it would be of significant help to the present Zero Wing. Since Sherfone wasn't accepting any argument, Fire Dance eventually gritted her teeth and activated the memory crystal. After all, what Sherfone said was true. There were significant differences even between Tier 4 players. Take Violet Cloud, for example. Because she had long since broken through her mana body's 100% threshold, her combat power had surpassed Fire Dance's by a large margin as soon as she reached Tier 4. If Fire Dance could break through the 100% threshold now, she would be able to hold her ground even against monstrously strong Tier 4 experts. Immediately, the colorful crystal in Fire Dance's hand released several streaks of light that flowed straight into her eyes. Simultaneously, a large amount of information was transmitted directly into her brain. Chapter 2840, Consecutive Breakthroughs As information from the Sword Saint's legacy flooded Fire Dance's mind, the mana she exuded strengthened and weakened in intervals. It was evident that she had received a lot of inspiration from the legacy. Both her control over mana and understanding of mana rose at a visible rate. Seeing this development, Sherfone couldn't help growing envious. Truthfully, he had constantly been thinking of using the Sword Saint's legacy himself ever since he received it. However, he also understood that he wouldn't benefit much from it. This was because the current bottleneck he faced wasn't related to mana but his concentration. To raise the strength of his mana body to a whole new level, he needed to raise his concentration to a point where he could control his mana body with a threefold manipulation method. Hence, using the Sword Saint's legacy now would simply be a waste. I should start training and adapting to a threefold manipulation method as well. Sherfone smiled involuntarily when he saw everyone in the room improving rapidly. Then, he sat down and began his own training. Back when he was in the Ancient God's Domain, his concentration standard had only been at the Tier 4 Intermediate Standard. Among Tier 4 existences, that wasn't anything to brag about. However, merging with the Tier 4 Hellfire had thoroughly tempered his concentration. He now estimated that his concentration was at the Tier 4 Peak Standard already. He should be only one step away from reaching the Tier 5 Standard and achieving World Creation. Of course, just elevating his concentration standard to Tier 5 wouldn't be enough to achieve World Creation. He would still need to become a Grandmaster Magician first. This was also the main reason many players and NPCs couldn't achieve world creation even after reaching Tier 5. After all, becoming a Grandmaster Magician was incredibly challenging. Generally, most people capable of becoming a Grandmaster Magician were Lifestyle Grandmasters. Yet, most of these Lifestyle Grandmasters were unsuited for combat and were incapable of reaching Tier 5, only reaching Tier 4 at best. This situation was especially obvious among players. In the past, over 70% of experts that had achieved world creation were Lifestyle Grandmasters stuck at Tier 4, and many experts who had risen to Tier 5 couldn't help envying those players. After all, the disparity in combat power between individuals with and without world creation was like the difference between heaven and earth. Even at Tier 5, world creation could still influence a battle. Following which, time passed swiftly. In the blink of an eye, half a day had gone by already. Amid Sherfeng's repeated attempts at executing a threefold manipulation method, the mana fire dance exuded suddenly skyrocketed in intensity. Her rapid transformation even kicked up a mana storm, the phenomenon startling everyone in the room. What's going on with this cis fire? The mana she's exuding is so powerful. Flying Shadow exclaimed. He was thunderstruck when he saw the white mist wreathing Fire Dance's body. She should have broken through her mana body's limits, Turtle Dove said enviously. No, this shouldn't be just a simple breakthrough, Alluring Summer said, shaking her head. I've broken through the 100% threshold as well, yet compared to Fire Dance right now, the phenomenon my breakthrough created was much weaker. Even if she achieved her breakthrough at Tier 4, the reaction shouldn't be so exaggerated. Alluring Summer had much greater authority when talking about breaking through the mana body's limits since she had unlocked her mana body to 102% potential already. 
Back when alluring summer broke through, her mana body had indeed undergone a qualitative transformation and provoked a powerful reaction in her surroundings. However, that reaction was much more subdued than fire dances. At this time, the mana surrounding fire dance was already almost liquid. Even if alluring summer factored in the special environment of this room and the fact that fire dance was a tier 4, a breakthrough in the mana body's limits still shouldn't generate such a powerful reaction. Several more minutes later, fire dance finally stabilized her mana, and an excited expression immediately appeared on her face. Guild leader, I succeeded. Fire dance said as she looked at your phone excitedly. My mana body is currently at a 107% completion rate. If you give me a little more time, I can even reach 110%. She had heard plenty regarding the mana body from Shirfone. According to him, after breaking through the 100% threshold, the mana body would see further qualitative transformations at the 105% and 110% thresholds. Although she had yet to reach a 110% completion rate, with the information the Sword Saint's legacy provided and the Ancient Beast statue's effect, she was now confident of reaching that threshold. At that time, her combat power would definitely surpass Violet Clouds. After all, Violet Cloud's mana body was only at a 108% completion rate right now. You reached 107% on the first breakthrough. Surefone was shocked. Normally, a player couldn't reach or exceed 105% on their first breakthrough. Even Violet Cloud was no exception. After all, players would need to overhaul the method they used to manipulate their mana body to reach this threshold. Nevertheless, Fire Dance had skated through this process. The improvement she achieved was beyond remarkable. That Sword Saint had a very thorough understanding of the mana body. His explanations were also simple to understand. It's a pity that I'm not a swordsman myself. Otherwise, I would have improved even more, Fire Dance said regretfully. If this legacy is given to Shadow Sword and the others, they should have a very easy time breaking through the 110% threshold. If you used it, you would probably achieve even more astonishing results, Guild Leader. The legacy actually has such great effects. Sure Phone couldn't help feeling tempted by Fire Dance's words. However, he still suppressed his agitated heart in the end and said calmly, I'll pass for now. However, we can let Shadow Sword and the other swordsmen use the legacy once they reach tier 4. Anyone with a physical class can also use it if they manage to break through the 100% threshold. Sure, Phone was indeed very tempted to use the Sword Saint's legacy and go beyond his mana body's present 110% completion rate. He might even be lucky enough to reach a 115% completion rate. If that happened, he would have full confidence in completing the Divine Dragon's trial. However, his current priorities were developing his concentration standard and improving his understanding of magic arrays. So long as he succeeded in doing so, combined with the Sword Saint's legacy, he could develop his mana body beyond even a 115% completion rate. In fact, once he reached level 150, he could even start trying to create a personalized mana body. After all, not every tier 5 expert in the past had started creating personalized mana bodies only after exceeding the 110% completion rate. Many of these tier 5 experts had tried and succeeded even at 109% and 110%. This was because there was no integral connection between a mana body's completion rate and the creation of a personalized mana body. Having a higher completion rate only meant that a player was more familiar with the mana body they currently had. At most, this familiarity would grant the player an easier time in creating a personalized mana body, it wasn't essential. As for the matter of sharing the Sword Saint's legacy, if it were possible, he would prefer to let only Tier 4 swordsmen use it. However, given the circumstances, Zero Wing didn't have 7 more Tier 4 swordsmen suitable. Hence, he had no choice but to loosen the condition. That way, the guild could produce more above average Tier 4 players. I understand. Fire Dance nodded. Over the next 10 days, Zero Wing's core executives achieved significant breakthroughs one after another, thanks to the Ancient Beast statue. In addition, as the guild had discovered quite a number of Tier 4 legacy lands in the Arctic Canyon, everyone began challenging their Tier 4 promotion quests. As for Fire Dance, after reaching a 110% completion rate with her mana body, she led an exploration team into the Arctic Canyon, drastically increasing Zero Wing's income, particularly of top tier level 130 plus equipment and materials. The amount of equipment and materials Zero Wing was currently raking in surpassed even that of ordinary superpowers. Among the harvests Zero Wing made, the most notable one was Seven Luminaries Crystals. Because the Arctic Canyon's team dungeons dropped small quantities of Seven Luminaries Crystals, Zero Wing earned over 600 units of Seven Luminaries Crystal in just 10 short days. Even Shurfone was astonished by this harvest. He never thought that the Arctic Canyon would be so rich in resources. Fire Dance's team was responsible for more than half of the Seven Luminaries Crystals earned. At this time, he could already foresee that once Zero Wing gained more and more Tier 4 players, the guild's income of Seven Luminaries Crystals would reach staggering levels. Meanwhile, Shurfone had been relatively free compared to Fire Dance and the others these past 10 days. He was also only half a step away from successfully implementing the threefold manipulation method on his mana body. However, during this time, huge events had also taken place in God's domain one after another. Firstly, there was the appearance of Saint Heart City. Secondly, the various superpowers had received news that Lu Xinglua had his qualifications as the Starling Corporation's heir stripped due to his numerous failures and that his game account had gotten crippled. This unexpected development placed heavy pressure on the heirs of the major corporations leading the various superpowers. Thirdly, the first batch of players belonging to Zero Wing's allies had entered Zero Wing City. 
When these 20,000 players entered the city, Zero Wing's allies instantly understood Zero Wing City's value. For a time, Zero Wing City's entry slots enjoyed even greater popularity. However, the best piece of news for Zero Wing was Gentle Snow, Aqua Rose, Zhao Yueru, Yan Tianqing, and Yi Luafei's successful promotion to Tier 4. Their success had instantly boosted Zero Wing's overall combat power by a large margin, and exploring the Arctic Canyon became a lot easier. Zero Wing City, Candlelight Trading Firm, Special Forging Room Sure enough, breaching the Grandmaster Magician Threshold isn't an easy task. A pale-faced Shifeng smiled bitterly as he looked at the Tier 3 mana set equipment he had just produced. After several days of research, he concluded that only two methods would let him achieve threefold manipulation, developing his concentration to the Tier 5 standard and becoming a Grandmaster Magician. For the time being, developing his concentration to the Tier 5 standard was nigh impossible since it required fortuitous encounters and undergoing tempering. This left him with raising his Magician rank. Producing Tier 3 mana set equipment was one of the ways that could help him do so because the most difficult aspect of producing the set was engraving its magic array. Although the system deemed the set's magic array as only a master magic array, it rivaled even Grandmaster magic arrays in complexity. If he could successfully engrave the entire magic array in one go, he wouldn't be far off from becoming a Grandmaster magician. Unfortunately, even after working for several days consecutively and producing more than 200 sets of Tier 3 mana set equipment, he still couldn't engrave the set's magic array in one go. He felt as if an invisible barrier was preventing him from advancing. Meanwhile, Sherfone also happened to reach level 150, the threshold where he could get promoted to tier 5. Guild leader, you previously asked the Boulder Corporation to look into Phoenix Rain's little sister, right? At this time, Liang Jing suddenly contacted Sherfone. They just sent back news that Phoenix Rain's little sister should be staying in Haitian City's upper zone. All right, got it. Nodding, Sherfone promptly chose to log out of God's domain and decided to pay Haitian City's upper zone. Apart from checking up on Phoenix Rain's little sister, he could also use this opportunity to broaden his business circle to Haitian City's upper zone. Every upper zone had its own contribution competition. Since the various corporations were placing such heavy importance on the season's competition, it would be a huge waste not to take advantage of it and make a killing. After all, Zero Wing was already a massive organization that had many mouths to feed. A large number of newcomers with great potential had even joined the guild's headquarters recently. There were also the resources needed to nurture Zero Wing's executives. With all the guild's resource requirements, simply relying on the five states corporation would be far from enough. Chapter 2841, Mental Strength Training House Haitian City, Upper Zone A luxury hovercar slowly landed in front of the Upper Zone's entrance. A man and a woman then got out of the car, their appearance instantly attracting the hundreds of teenage boys and girls waiting by the entrance. This man and woman were none other than Shurfong and Mushin. However, all of the teenagers focused on Mushin, their eyes filled with surprise and confusion. Why is the Boulder Corporation's heir here at Haitian City's Upper Zone? Could she be transferring to our Upper Zone? That's impossible. I heard that Mushin broke through recently and acquired Grade 1 authority in Yuantian City's Upper Zone. Moreover, not only does she have the Boulder Corporation's full support, but the base layer's supervisor is also quite supportive of her. At this rate, she might enter the middle layer of Yuantian City's Upper Zone. Why would she want to come to our Upper Zone? The teenage boys and girls began a heated discussion among themselves when they saw Mushin. They couldn't understand why a big shot like her would suddenly come to Haitian City's Upper Zone. Mushin, on the other hand, paid no attention to the teenagers discussing her. She behaved as if these people did not exist at all. Why are there so many people taking Haitian City's test? It's more than ten times the number I saw at Yuantian City, Shurfong asked, astonished when he saw the crowd thronging the entrance. When he took the test to enter Yuantian City's upper zone, there had only been several dozen other people taking the test with him. Such a huge difference between upper zones was incredible. Haitian City's upper zone is more populous than Yuantian City's upper zone. It was also constructed a little earlier. Looking at the teenagers waiting by the entrance, Mushin shook her head and explained, however, these people aren't talents the Green God Company is nurturing internally. They were born inside Haitian City's upper zone. Also, this place is holding its annual evaluation, which is why so many people are here. The corporations behind these people will use the test results to determine their future successors and daily resource allocations. For these people, this period will most likely be the most competitive period of their lives. At this point, a hint of frustration darkened Mushin's eyes. It was precisely because of this competition that her relationship with Kurue wasn't particularly good. Compared to life in the outside world, life in an upper zone was much harsher. I see. So that's why these children have such astonishing physical fitness, Shurfong commented. When he looked at the teenagers before him, he couldn't help sighing ruefully. He had to admit that the upper zone's children were indeed amazing. From what he could see, every one of these teenagers could easily beat up martial artists below the master standard. This wasn't a standard the youths born and living in the outside world could match. Having such amazing physical fitness at such a young age, these teenagers would become even more amazing once they entered God's domain. Let alone reaching tier 4, they could very well reach tier 5. At this moment, Shurfong finally understood why the various superpowers had so many tier 4 and tier 5 experts. He could produce many tier 4 experts just from the group of youngsters in front of him. Let's hurry inside. 
Taking a look at the time, Mushin said, if we wait until the mental path activates, like last time, it'll be even more difficult to find that girl you mentioned. After all, we are residents of Yuantian City's upper zone, not of Haitian City's upper zone. Sure Feng nodded in response and followed Mushin straight into Haitian City's upper zone. Although a person could freely visit all upper zones once they had a registered ID, the upper zones operated like independent organizations and competed with each other. In fact, some of the tasks the Green God Company assigned to the various upper zones were dependent on the performance of each upper zone. Hence, the residents of every upper zone were somewhat hostile toward the residents of other upper zones. Under normal circumstances, an upper zone's resident wouldn't visit another upper zone. After all, one mistake could easily result in a fight. Upon seeing Machine and Shurfone walking straight into the upper zone, the teenagers standing by the entrance couldn't help envying them. This was because people older than 20 who could enter the upper zone directly had already obtained IDs in the upper zone. These people wouldn't have to struggle to enter the upper zone, unlike themselves. Who's that man? Why is a person like Mushin escorting him? He might be the son of some big shot living on the middle layer. Otherwise, why would someone of Mushin standing guide him? Damn it. This is too enviable. If I were the son or nephew of a mental strength master, I wouldn't have to struggle here so desperately. I could even enter one of the middle layer's mansions for training. At this time, the teenagers waiting by the entrance couldn't help gazing at Shurfone with jealous eyes. As children of major corporations, they might be objects of envy for the people living in the outside world, but they were nothing in the upper zone. Only the big shots living in the upper zone's middle layer would garner respect from the upper zone's residents. After entering Haitian City's upper zone, Shurfone found that this place was indeed more populous than Yuantian City's upper zone. In fact, one could even consider it more prosperous. Not only were there high-rises all over the upper zone, but there was also something called the Mental Strength Training House here. Such a facility did not exist in Yuantian City's upper zone. The Mental Strength Training House wasn't particularly large. The entire building was only two stories tall, with the footprint of a basketball court. Yet, a crowd waited to enter this small building, including children of major corporations and the Green God Company's talents. There were even direct successors of major corporations standing in line. This was a site that definitely couldn't be found in Yuantian City's upper zone. In fact, even Mushin felt an urge to enter the mental strength training house when she saw it. However, she could only let this urge fade away. This was because the notice outside the training house very clearly stated that only those with grade 2 authority or above in Haitian City's upper zone could use the training house. People of other upper zones would not be allowed entry at all. Aren't upper zones open to all residents with ID? Shurfone was confused when he saw the notice. Why is there such a rule in Haitian City's upper zone? Isn't this unfair to people of other upper zones? The upper zone placed extreme importance on mental strength. One could easily imagine how attractive a place capable of helping a person improve their mental strength would be for the residents of the various upper zones. There's no helping this. The Mental Strength Training House is a resource Haitian City's upper zone won after competing with the other upper zones. Hence, the Green God Company gave the residents of Haitian City's upper zone exclusive use of it. It is also why many more corporations are willing to invest in Haitian City compared to the other upper zones, Mushin said, shaking her head. A bitter smile appearing on her face, she added, if not for the Boulder Corporation having deep roots in Yuantian City, we would have most likely moved the focus of our development to Haitian City already. Mushin's words didn't particularly surprise Shurfone. Although he had not experienced the training house's effects, mental strength was everything in the upper zone. It would naturally be very attractive to the various corporations. In fact, Shurfone also felt tempted to transfer to Haitian City's upper zone. After all, his concentration was currently bottlenecked at the tier 4 peak standard. Thus far, he had already used three phantom potions, yet he was still nowhere near the tier 5 concentration standard. While Shurfone and Mushin were conversing, an argument suddenly broke out in front of the training house. Lu Tiendi, I've already said my adventure team will never join you. A fair-skinned girl sporting a double ponytail and wearing light blue sportswear glared at a handsome and dapper young man in his early twenties, her eyes blazing with indescribable rage. However, the young man in question paid no heed to the girl's anger at all. Instead, a robust, middle-aged man standing beside him smiled and said, Miss Ji Luorong, you are free to refuse my young master's invitation, but if you do, you can forget about obtaining resources from anyone in this upper zone from now on. You should understand very clearly that my young master has the power to blacklist you. You. None of the people present dared to refute the middle-aged man's words. In fact, nobody stepped forward to champion the girl. This was because Lu Tiendi was the Starlene Corporation's new heir. With the Starlene Corporation's influence in Haitian City's upper zone, it would be child's play for it to prevent the upper zone's residents from selling resources to a specific individual. Looking at the girl named Ji Luorong, the middle-aged man chuckled and said, Miss Ji, I advise you to listen obediently to my young master's words and have your entire adventure team join us. Otherwise, you shouldn't think of staying in Haitian City's upper zone anymore because nobody here will sell you any resources. You shouldn't even think of asking your older sister for help, either. At the middle-aged man's words, many of the corporate children present looked at Ji Luorong sympathetically. In Haitian City's upper zone, even major corporations wouldn't dare to offend the Starlene Corporation outright, let alone an individual with no background. If Ji Luorong refused Lu Tiendi's demand, everyone could already foresee the girl having to leave the upper zone shortly after due to a lack of resources. 
However, as Ji Luorong remained silent, the middle-aged man smiled triumphantly, and the spectating crowd sighed ruefully, a low voice suddenly resounded in the area. Is that so? What if I want to sell resources to this young lady? Chapter 2842, Silent Upper Zone A deathly silence suddenly fell over the area as everyone turned toward the voice's origin. What entered everyone's sight was an ordinary-looking young man clad in dark gray casual wear. Besides his ordinary appearance, the young man also felt no different from an ordinary passerby. This person was none other than Sher Fong. Although he had grown a lot taller as his physical fitness improved, he still couldn't change his plain appearance. Who is that guy? Isn't he a little too courageous? That guy is dead for sure. Even the successors of the other major corporations here wouldn't dare blatantly refute Lu Tiendi's words. Could this guy be a newcomer to the upper zone? The gathered people were astonished as they looked at Sher Fong. They never imagined that such an ignorant person could exist in Haitian City's upper zone. If it were the Starlene Corporation of the past, there would still be many people who would dare go against it. They definitely wouldn't let Lu Tiendi, who was merely the corporation's heir, act so arrogantly. Even Lu Xinglua, the corporation's previous heir, hadn't dared behave like Lu Tiendi was behaving now. However, Lu Tiendi's background was different from Lu Xinglua's. Lu Tiendi had caught the eye of one of the middle layer's big shots at a young age and had been secretly nurtured by this big shot since then. Only after Lu Tiendi had replaced Lu Xinglua as the Starlene Corporation's new successor had this matter gotten exposed. Due to this revelation, the Starlene Corporation's status in Haitian City's upper zone had instantly skyrocketed. Now, even the other major corporations operating in the base layer had no choice but to tuck their tails in front of the Starlene Corporation. Otherwise, Ikue, Lu Tiendi's butler, wouldn't have dared to be so arrogant, openly making such a bold statement in public. Ji Luorong, who had been standing silently in front of the training house all this time, couldn't help turning to Sher Fong in surprise and confusion. She never thought that someone would be willing to stand up for her. At the same time, though, she couldn't help worrying for Sher Fong. This was because she was well aware of Lu Tiendi's extraordinary identity. He was destined to live in the middle layer, and even the Green God Company would have to show him a certain degree of respect. Kid, it seems you're quite courageous, huh? Do you not know who my young master is? Ikue asked as he looked at Sher Fong coldly. Or do you intend to make an enemy of the Starlene Corporation? Ikue had just stated that so long as Lu Tiendi gave the word, nobody in Haitian City's upper zone would dare trade resources with Ji Luorong. Yet, no sooner had he made this declaration than Sher Fong announced his intention to trade with Ji Luorong. Sher Fong had basically slapped the Starlene Corporation's face. Upon hearing Ikue's words, many people present frowned at Sher Fong worriedly. Everyone could tell that Ikue was up to no good. The middle-aged man was escalating a trivial matter into a problem that concerned the reputation of the entire Starlene Corporation. If Sher Fong dared to say anything more now, the consequences were unimaginable. He might even face a similar end as Ji Luorong's and get kicked out of the upper zone eventually. After all, it was incredibly difficult to live in the upper zone without resources. When Ji Luorong heard Ikue's words, she gritted her teeth and resolved to stop Sher Fong from championing her. However, just as she was about to take action, a light figure suddenly appeared before her. Little girl, you don't need to worry about him, Mushin said. Looking at Ji Luorong's worried expression, Mushin smiled and continued, even the Starlene Corporation wouldn't dare do anything against him. Sher Fong not only possessed grade 1 authority in the upper zone but was also a neutralizing grandmaster. Let alone the measly heir of the Starlene Corporation, even if the Starlene Corporation's current owner were here, he wouldn't be able to do anything against Sher Fong. Looking at Mushin's dazzling beauty, Ji Luorong could tell that Mushin had an extraordinary background, which should mean that Sher Fong did as well. However, she still couldn't help worrying. But. Before Ji Luorong could say anything more, however, a low voice resounded throughout the area once more. So what if I am? These five simple words instantly created a commotion among the spectating crowd. Is he crazy? He's actually openly making an enemy of the Starlene Corporation. Does he not know what death is? If it were the Starlene Corporation of the past, even the Upper Zone's ordinary corporate children wouldn't fear offending it. After all, they were all residents of the Upper Zone's base layer. Why should they be afraid of each other? However, the situation was different now that the Starlene Corporation had the backing of a middle-layer big shot. That big shot could just make some random excuse and have them removed from the Upper Zone temporarily. Once they were outside the safe haven known as the Upper Zone, the Starlene Corporation would have plenty of means to deal with them. Upon hearing Sher Feng's response, Ikue was momentarily dumbfounded as well. After snapping out of his daze, he bellowed, Punk! It seems you really are itching for a beating. In that case, I'll help you loosen those bones of yours. Although the Green God Company prohibited fighting in the upper zone, the company would turn a blind eye to small conflicts in private settings. So long as one did not go too far, the Green God Company wouldn't look too deeply into the matter. After all, disputes were bound to occur wherever people gathered. However, if anyone dared to take things too far, the Green God Company was bound to dish out a severe penalty. In fact, many corporations and forces had gotten banished from the upper zone and suffered an early demise because they had crossed this line. Hence, nobody would dare to openly defy the Green God Company's rules. The next moment, Ikue stomped his right foot on the ground, and his body shot forward like a cannonball. 
The impact of his feet shook the ground slightly and even left a deep footprint behind on the cement. As his body shot forward, Ikue punched, perfectly integrating his fist's speed with the speed of his moving body. His fist generated explosive noises due to this perfect combination as it collided with the air. Evidently, his punch had already exceeded the speed of sound. A sonic boom. He's a Hanglian Grandmaster. When everyone heard the explosive noises, they stared at Ikue in shock. The upper zone's environment allowed one to develop one's physical fitness rapidly. In fact, even developing one's physical fitness to the standard of a Hanglian Master or a half-step Hanglian Grandmaster wouldn't be a problem. However, those who could actually overcome the final hurdle and become a Hanglian Grandmaster were incredibly rare. Even in the upper zone, such people were considered top-tier experts and treated as VIPs by major corporations. These corporations would even be willing to grant a Hanglian Grandmaster the position of elder to rope in such individuals. This was because every Hanglian Grandmaster was no different from a humanoid beast. Hence, everyone couldn't believe that Ikue was serving as a mere butler of a corporation's successor, despite being a Hanglian Grandmaster. Let alone the spectators, even Mushin was astonished by this situation. Only two people weren't surprised by this situation, Lu Tiendi and Ji Luorong. It's over. Ji Luorong reflexively shut her eyes at this sight. She had found out that Ikue was a Hanglian Grandmaster only because Ikue himself had revealed his strength to her during one of their previous meetings. Hence, she knew that Ikue wasn't just an ordinary butler but was also a terrifying bodyguard. If Shifeng got struck by Ikue's punch, he would be fortunate to leave with only a few broken bones, it wouldn't be strange if he ended up hospitalized for half a month. Boom. The next moment, as if a grenade had exploded, the sound of an explosion echoed throughout the area. Even those standing over a dozen meters away felt the intense impact. Almost everyone present shut their eyes subconsciously. After all, they could easily imagine the outcome that awaited those struck by a Hanglian Grandmaster. If a Hanglian Grandmaster managed to land a square blow, they could kill a bull with one hit. Even a neutralizing Grandmaster would end up with broken bones if they got struck by a Hanglian Grandmaster. Meanwhile, the sound of an impact meant that Ikue's punch landed on Shifeng. However, when everyone opened their eyes again, they were dumbfounded. How is this possible? At this time, not only was Shifeng completely intact, but he had actually caught Ikue's iron fist with just one hand. Ikue himself was surprised by this situation. He never thought that his punch would meet with such a result. You've made your move. Holding on to Ikue's fist, Shifeng looked at the middle-aged man and asked calmly, Is it my turn now? Chapter 2843, Shocking the Upper Zone Shifeng's words seemed to stimulate Ikue, the latter's face immediately turning ashen. Ikue was indeed surprised that Shifeng had blocked his punch, but that was merely because he had not expected that Shifeng would actually be a neutralizing grandmaster. Moreover, although his previous punch seemed fierce and domineering, he had actually used only about half of his strength. After all, he would be in big trouble if he created too much of a scene. At that time, even Lu Tiendi wouldn't be able to protect him. However, Ikue never thought that Shifeng would take advantage of this fact and turn him into a laughingstock in the eyes of the crowd. He was a dignified Hanglian Grandmaster. Even the owners of international corporations would have to be polite to him and treat him as a VIP when meeting him. As for neutralizing Grandmasters, they could only cower in fear in front of him. He had never once suffered such humiliation before. You bastard. Ikue took a step forward and punched with his other hand. Half-step collapsing punch. This time, Ikue did not hold back at all. The only thing on his mind was to make sure Fong regret his words. Sure Fong responded to the second attack in a similar manner, extending his other hand to catch the punch. He didn't seem to have noticed that Ikue's present punch was different from the one before. Upon seeing this, Ikue sneered. A punch carrying 50% of his strength indeed wouldn't pose a threat to a neutralizing Grandmaster. A neutralizing Grandmaster could easily block the attack by relying on technique. However, it was a different story for a punch carrying his full strength. A neutralizing Grandmaster who tried blocking such an attack would definitely end up with broken bones. Yet, Shifeng was ignorantly trying to receive his punch using the exact same method. Boom. A loud explosion rang out as Ikue's fist collided with Shifeng's palm. The shockwave generated by the impact this time was much stronger than before. Nevertheless, Ikue was still dumbfounded as he looked at Shifeng. This was because the result of his second punch was exactly the same as his first. Shifeng had still caught his fist without fail. Did I subconsciously hold back in fear of getting into trouble? Inevitably, such a thought occurred to Ikue. After all, this was the only reasonable explanation he could think of for this situation. Otherwise, how could a neutralizing Grandmaster possibly receive his full-powered punch? However, Shifeng did not give Ikue any time to react at all. Immediately, he pushed Ikue's hands aside and executed a palm strike on the latter's chest. The palm strike was so fast that the attack had already connected with Ikue's chest before he realized what was going on. However, even after noticing the attack, Ikue paid no attention to it at all. As a Hanglian Grandmaster, he had long since developed an instinctual defensive mechanism. Whenever his body received an attack, his muscles would tighten, giving them a toughness resembling steel and neutralizing the attack's impact. If neutralizing grandmasters were proud of their techniques, then Hanglian Grandmasters were proud of their physical body's toughness. 
In simpler terms, a Heng Lian Grandmaster was someone trained to take hits and dish out devastating blows. Even if a Heng Lian Grandmaster managed to land only one out of 100 attacks on a neutralizing Grandmaster, this one attack would end the fight instantly. Boom. Yi Kuei stood steadily even after receiving Shir Feng's palm strike. He also looked at Shir Feng in silent contempt. Nobody present found it surprising that Shir Feng's attack had no effect on Yi Kuei, either. This was because Heng Lian Grandmasters were precisely this powerful. They were truly monsters in human skin, and trying to harm these monsters with the hands and feet of ordinary humans was an utter joke. This was also why the various major corporations in the upper zone would desperately try to recruit or befriend Heng Lian Grandmasters. Kid, I admit that you're strong. However, you can't hurt me. Patting his clothes, Yi Kuei said disdainfully, on the other hand, how long do you think your stamina can hold out against my attacks? A neutralizing Grandmaster's ability to exert complete control over their physical body was indeed extraordinary. However, when it came to stamina, a neutralizing Grandmaster was far from comparable to a Hanglian Grandmaster. A Hanglian Grandmaster could fight three days and three nights without rest. In contrast, a neutralizing Grandmaster would be fortunate to last even half a day. Hence, neutralizing Grandmasters would frequently curse Hanglian Grandmasters as merely a bunch of simple-minded brutes with well-developed bodies. Spectating from the sidelines, Mushin grew worried when she saw this situation. She never thought that Lu Tiendi would have a Hanglian Grandmaster as his bodyguard. The Boulder Corporation had to pay a great price just to get a Hanglian Grandmaster to become one of its elders. Moreover, apart from the Boulder Corporation's master, everyone else in the corporation treated this Hanglian Grandmaster with awe and respect. Yet, Lu Tiendi actually had such a powerful expert working as his henchman. It was ineffective. Sure Feng also couldn't help looking at Ikue in surprise. Ever since his concentration had reached the Tier 4 peak standard, his control over his body in the real world had improved by a significant margin. After factoring in his improved physical fitness, he now even dared to apply some of the techniques he used in God's domain in the world. This was also why Sher Feng had provoked Yi Kuei. He was very curious to find out where his current limits lay. When Sher Feng was catching Yi Kuei's second punch, he hadn't just caught the attack with an open palm. Instead, he had executed three rapid palm strikes against Yi Kuei's fist. In other words, he had used the three extreme slashes technique, a simplified version of Miracle Dragon's six extreme slashes. As Sher Feng had executed his three palm strikes against Yi Kuei's fist almost in the same instant, it was practically impossible for the human body to tell that it wasn't just one but three separate attacks. Thus, Sher Feng had succeeded in blocking Yi Kuei's full-powered punch. Otherwise, even if his physical fitness had improved a lot after he began living in the upper zone, he would still have to avoid Yi Kuei's full-powered attack. Meanwhile, the offensive palm strike Sher Feng executed against Yi Kuei was currently his strongest attack. For extreme slashes From an outsider's perspective, Sher Feng's attack would look like an ordinary palm strike. In reality, his attack consisted of four palm strikes executed in rapid succession on the same location. This attack placed a heavy burden on his mental strength, and he couldn't use it a second time even if he wanted to. Looking at Sher Feng's surprised expression, Yi Kuei smiled. Kid. Now it's my turn, too. Just when Yi Kuei thought to attack again, his body suddenly stiffened, and he collapsed to the ground willy-nilly. His breathing became stifled, and he had difficulty even speaking. In fact, even his vision started to blur. These abrupt changes discombobulated Yi Kuei. He couldn't understand what was happening at all. You. What the hell did you do to me? Struggling to lift his head, Yi Kuei gaped at Sher Feng in confusion. He simply couldn't wrap his mind around how Sher Feng had managed to injure him so severely with just a palm strike. Now, he found even standing up from the ground difficult. The spectators were likewise surprised when they saw Yi Kuei collapse to the ground. He defeated a Hanglian Grandmaster in one strike. Who is this guy? At this time, the onlookers eyed Sher Feng as if he were a monster. They even began wondering whether the scene before them was staged. After all, who could possibly believe that a Heng Lian Grandmaster would fall from just one palm strike? I think I know who he is. Some time ago, two people managed to pass Yuan Tian City's mental path together. One of these people was even someone the Boulder Corporation brought in using its reserve slots. According to the rumors, that person was Zero Wing's guild leader, Black Flame. Although this guy looks different from God's Domain's Black Flame, they should be the same person. What? He's the guy responsible for dragging down the Starlene Corporation's Lu Xingluo. Among the crowd, some people who kept tabs on Yuan Tian City's upper zone recognized Sher Feng. For a time, the street bubbled with commotion. Nobody had thought that Black Flame, the mythical sword emperor of God's domain, would actually appear in their upper zone. Moreover, the man had even defeated a Heng Lian Grandmaster with a single palm strike. His strength was simply terrifying. So, he is the Black Flame Big Sis told me about. Ji Luorong gaped in shock as she looked at Sher Feng. After all, Black Flame was currently rumored to be the strongest person in God's domain right now. He was in existence even the five great super guilds had to tiptoe around. Chapter 2844, God's Domain's Black Flame So, that's why he dared to stand against Lu Tiendi. He's the one responsible for Lu Xinghua's removal. Lu Tiendi will probably have to tread cautiously around him. Amazing. As expected of Black Flame. 
I never thought that he would be the person who received grade 1 authority in Yuantian City recently. This is interesting. It seems Lu Tiandi has met his match. Everybody present knew of Black Flame, but they did not know much about Black Flame's identity in the real world. After all, they had many things they needed to handle. How could they possibly have the time to look into the real world identity of every famous expert in God's domain? Only if they were particularly interested in a specific person would they spend some money to commission a detailed investigation. Not to mention, Black Flame was someone who had never publicly declared his God's domain identity in the real world. This made it even more difficult to investigate his situation. Only superpowers that paid close attention to Zero Wing would know of Black Flame's identity. While most people did not know of Black Flame's identity in the real world, it was a different story for the name Black Flame itself. This name was far too well-known in God's domain. Not only was this name involved in many iconic battles in the game, but it was also behind the creation of many miracles. In fact, many of Black Flame's battle videos had circulated through the various kingdoms and empires forums and were regarded as a paradigm for swordsmen. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that almost every player operating on the eastern continent would know Black Flame's name. Needless to say, residents of upper zones like themselves, who were expert players in God's domain, would definitely know of Black Flame. Although Zero Wing started out as a guild with no backing or background, it was now publicly recognized as a superpower. Compared to the various superpowers that had relied on powerful organizations to gain their strength, the influence Zero Wing had over the public was many times greater. In fact, Zero Wing's influence over the virtual gaming industry almost rivaled the five great super guilds already. Zero Wing had already become an absolute titan in God's domain. Thus, Ji Luorong felt like she was dreaming when she looked at Shifeng. While the onlookers were discussing quietly among themselves, Lu Tiendi, who had been silently spectating the situation all this time, suddenly approached Shifeng. It seems I have been impolite. I didn't think that you would be Zero Wing's guild leader, Black Flame, Lu Tiendi said as he looked at Shifeng with a friendly smile. He also gave off an indescribably calm feeling, betraying no anger over Shifeng having heavily injured his butler. Hello, my name is Lu Tiendi, the current guild leader of Starlink. You have truly helped me a bunch by defeating Lu Xinglua, guild leader Black Flame. Otherwise, I would most likely have to expend a lot of time and effort to take over Starlink. No need for thanks. You and I are not allies, Shifeng retorted nonchalantly. Others might not know about Lu Tiendi, but Shifeng had a very deep understanding of him. This was because Lu Tiendi had been a well-known tier 6 god-ranked expert in the past. However, he had not joined any guild. Instead, he had led an adventure team while working under Starlink. Although Lu Tiendi appeared friendly on the surface, he was deep down a very conniving person. He had toyed with many powers in the past. These powers had worked for Lu Tiendi only to get backstabbed. For this reason, many superpowers had detested Lu Tiendi. However, because of Lu Tiendi's extraordinary strength and his Tremorous Clown Adventure Team, one of God's Domain's seven great Dark Adventure Teams, none of the various superpowers could do anything against him. Guild Leader Black Flame, must you be so unapproachable? Lu Xinglua and I are two different people. There are many people within the corporation who dislike Lu Xinglua for his overbearing and arrogant attitude as well. However, he is, after all, the Patriarch's son. Even if others have an opinion regarding his behavior, nobody dares to say anything. Guild leader Black Flames dragging Lu Xinglua off his pedestal is an event worth celebrating for the Starlene Corporation, Lu Tiendi said, chuckling. Since Miss G is your friend, Guild leader Black Flame, I will naturally stop trying to recruit her. Also, I have admired Zero Wing for a long time now. May I know if you are willing to form a partnership with me? To present Starlink's sincerity in this partnership and apologize for my rudeness to Miss G, I can sell a large batch of phantom potions to you and Miss G at cost on behalf of Starlink. May I know what you think of this, Guild Leader Black Flame? At Lu Tiendi's words, everyone couldn't help envying Shifeng. The Phantom Potion was something the various major corporations coveted. Let alone at cost, they would even be willing to buy the Phantom Potion at double or triple the original price. After all, the importance of improving one's mental strength trumped everything else in the upper zone. Ji Luorong was tempted by Lu Tiendi's offer. She currently held only grade 2 authority in Haitian City's upper zone. If she could acquire a few more Phantom Potions and improve her mental strength, she might reach grade 1 authority. At that time, she would have a much easier time operating in the upper zone. After all, only around 300 people held grade 1 authority in Haitian City's upper zone, and the Green God Company placed heavy importance on every one of them. At that time, even if a corporation in the upper zone wished to target her, they would face incredible difficulty. She also wouldn't be tight for resources, as the tasks offered to grade 1 authority holders would sometimes award phantom potions. Thank you for your goodwill, Guild Leader Lu, but Zero Wing already has its own collaborators. Currently, Zero Wing has no plans to cooperate with more guilds, so there is nothing I can do about this, Sher Feng said, directly rejecting Lu Tiendi's offer. If there is nothing else, we will be taking our leave now. If that's the case, then it truly is a pity. Sighing, Lu Tiendi said, if you have any intentions of forming a partnership in the future, feel free to contact me anytime, guild leader Black Flame. Sher Feng responded to these words with just a polite smile. He then turned around and left the training house together with Ji Luorong and Mushin. The spectating crowd also dispersed, leaving Lu Tiendi and Yi Kuei alone. After the crowd dispersed, Ikuei made a full recovery after consuming a life potion. 
Looking at Shifeng's departing back, Ikue said in a quiet voice, Young master, Black Flame is simply too arrogant. You already extended such a sincere invitation to him, yet he actually refused to show you any respect. It's no wonder he managed to anger Lu Xinguo that much. Should I find an opportunity to teach the kid a lesson? Ikue was furious over Shifeng's successful surprise attack on him. Had he been a little more careful earlier, he definitely wouldn't have suffered such a serious injury. Moreover, he had also noticed that Shifeng looked a little pale after attacking him. Shifeng had probably suffered a significant backlash from his own attack. If that were the case, landing a fatal blow on Shifeng would have been entirely possible. I don't know why, but he seems to be extremely wary of me, although this is clearly our first meeting. It seems it'll be impossible to use him for our own purposes. If that's the case, let's teach him a small lesson. However, I'm afraid you alone won't be enough, Lu Tiendi said, shaking his head. That Shifeng actually managed to execute Miracle Dragon's trademark move in the real world. Evidently, he has reached an incredibly high level in both his physical fitness and mental strength. It'll be tough for you to take care of him by yourself. I'll ask Brother Wang to accompany you. You'll have Mr. Wang come as well. Ikue was momentarily surprised by Lu Tiendi's words. However, he quickly revealed an ecstatic expression and said, If this is the case, that kid is dead. The Brother Wang Lu Tiendi mentioned was a Heng Lian Grandmaster who was only half a step away from becoming a mental strength master. He was also Lu Tiendi's senior brother and a resident of the upper zone's middle layer. It would be child's play for such an expert to take action against someone living in the base layer. By the way, when you head back, notify the others in the team to take action against Ji Luorong's adventurer team immediately. Make sure to destroy them as quickly as possible, Lu Tiendi instructed calmly. Since I can't have Ji Luorong's adventurer team, there's no reason why I should let Shifeng have it. Rest assured, young master. We have long since been keeping track of those people. If not for your love of talent, they would have been doomed already, Ikue responded, smiling. Nodding, Lu Tiendi then entered the mental strength training house. Chapter 2845, Soon to Break Seal Haitian City Upper Zone, Northern Mountain Villa Community Shifeng couldn't help doubting his eyes as he stared at the three-story mansion before him. You've been living in this place all this time? Shifeng asked as he looked at Ji Luorong strangely. The mansion before him not only looked luxurious but also occupied an area as large as two basketball courts, it was even larger than the Boulder Corporation's mansion in Yuantian City's Upper Zone, which had cost 30 million trade points to exchange. Meanwhile, Ji Luorong lacked both influence and authority in the Upper Zone. In fact, she was even living in the Upper Zone by herself. Apart from her family's corporation operating in the outside world, she did not possess any backers or background whatsoever. Hence, Shifeng found it truly hard to believe that she had managed to purchase such a large mansion. Even Mushin was a little surprised by this situation. After all, the base layer's mansions couldn't be bought by just anyone with sufficient points. Normally, one also needed to have grade 1 authority or above. However, from the information she obtained on Ji Luorong's background, the latter had only grade 2 authority. This is the mansion my maternal grandfather left behind, Ji Luorong said, nodding. Because of my family's decline, we had no choice but to live in the outside world. However, because my mental strength showed promise, my family decided to make use of the reserve slot my maternal grandfather left behind and let me live in the upper zone. Realization immediately dawned upon Shifeng at Ji Luorong's explanation. This also explained why Phoenix Rain had been living in the outside world despite her family having such a large mansion in the upper zone. The upper zone had existed for a long time already. During this period, there had indeed been many families that had fallen into obscurity and were forced to leave the upper zone. After all, the strong preyed upon the weak in the upper zone. Without a reserve slot or sufficient talent in the mental strength department, one would not qualify for residency in the upper zone at all. Through this revelation, Shifeng also realized that the Ji family was indeed extraordinary. Although it was in decline now, the fact that it had managed to acquire such an extravagant mansion in the upper zone proved that it had once been a powerful force there. This also explained how Phoenix Rain managed to rely on her own strength to become one of the Dragon Phoenix Pavilion's pavilion masters. As Ji Luorong talked about her family circumstances, the group arrived inside the mansion. Upon entering the mansion, Shifeng had to admit that it was indeed much better than his housing unit. Not only was the place much more spacious, but it also provided much greater help toward the improvement of one's mental strength. After entering the mansion, Shifeng turned the conversation to Ji Luorong's current circumstances and Phoenix Rain's brief reappearance in God's domain after her disappearance. Upon hearing news of her older sister, Ji Luorong breathed out a small sigh of relief. She had been incredibly worried when she found out that her older sister had disappeared. When she heard that her older sister had been brought to Haitian City's upper zone, she had repeatedly searched the base layer for clues of her older sister. Despite her efforts, she had come up empty. The only possibility she could think of was that her older sister had been transferred to the middle layer. Hence, she had been anxiously trying to enter the middle layer to verify her older sister's condition. Hearing that her older sister had once appeared in God's domain after her disappearance and even expressed that she was safe had lifted the stone weighing on her heart. Now, she could finally relax a little bit. By the way, why did Lu Tiendi come to find you? Do you have any grudges with him? Shifeng asked curiously as he looked at Ji Luorong. His main goal in coming to Haitian City's upper zone was to check Ji Luorong's situation. After all, he had promised Phoenix Rain to take care of her little sister. Meanwhile, Lu Tiendi wasn't a kind person. 
Catching his attention was akin to catching the attention of a fox. One was bound to meet with misfortune. I don't have any grudges with him. In fact, today is only our second meeting, Ji Luorong sighed. As for why he is approaching me, it is because he wants eternal glory, the adventurer team I established, to join his adventurer team, Tremorous Clown. He wants to annex your adventurer team. Sherfone was surprised by this answer. Tremorous Clown was an extraordinary dark adventurer team. According to his past knowledge, the team had been active on the western continent and possessed powerful members. At its peak, the team had even had three tier SIXS and nine tier fives. Even the various superpowers dared not casually offend the adventurer team. Back then, many experts operating on the dark side of God's domain had sought to join Tremorous Clown. However, only a small minority had succeeded because Tremorous Clown's entry requirement was tier 4. Normally, only peak experts who had reached tier 4 could join the team. Sherfone also knew a little about Ji Luorong's adventurer team since Ji Luorong had also been relatively famous in the past. Although not on the level of the Demon Queen Phoenix reign, Ji Luorong had still been a bona fide tier 5 apex expert, only half a step from reaching tier 6. Eternal Glory had also been a famous top adventurer team. At its peak, the team had had not only a tier 6 god ranked expert but also three tier 5 experts. However, Eternal Glory was currently merely a well known adventurer team. Its overall strength was still incredibly weak. This included Ji Luorong, the adventurer team's commander. Sherfone doubted that the team even had a single tier 4 player in its ranks right now. Hence, he found it inconceivable that Lu Tiendi wished to annex Eternal Glory. Of course, Sherfone wasn't looking down on Ji Luorong and her companions. The present Tremorous Clown was far stronger than Eternal Glory. Tremorous Clown probably rivaled the average superpower in the number of its peak combatants. Now that Lu Tiendi had acquired Starlink as well, the overall strength of the forces under his command should be at an astonishing level. My team is indeed incapable of catching Lu Tiendi's attention. The only reason I can think of for his efforts to annex us is the special legacy we obtained, Ji Luorong said after giving the matter some thought. Some time ago, we visited a very special secret land and found a massive world passage sealed there. We even came across a person who might be a tier 6 god. According to that person, the seal on the world passage would soon break, and the war of worlds would soon begin. Our team received a special legacy from that person. Recorded inside the legacy was a sealing magic array. If we sacrifice EXP to the magic array, we can isolate a specific area from the rest of the world for a long period. It can be considered a means to resist the war of worlds. However, at that time, other players aside from our team entered that place as well. In hindsight, those people might have been Tremorous Clown's members. Ji Luorong's words shocked Sherfone. This was because he had never heard of a war of worlds happening at this stage of the game in his previous life. However, he also doubted that Ji Luorong was lying. After all, he had visited the ancient god's domain. He wouldn't find it strange if there were other timelines of god's domain. This was especially true after seeing hundred ghosts as members. Those people clearly didn't come from the ancient god's domain but most likely were from another interstellar continent. This so-called War of Worlds was probably a great war between Earth's players and the said Interstellar Continent's players. If this was true, it would be a disaster for Earth's God's Domain. After all, in terms of resources and experts, the Interstellar Continent's God's Domain was far superior to Earth's God's Domain. If the two sides were to wage war against each other, it wouldn't take a genius to imagine that Earth's side would suffer a catastrophic defeat, with many superpowers getting annihilated. Even the present Zero Wing would have a difficult time facing the Interstellar Continent's offensive. This explained why Lu Tiendi wanted Ji Luorong's adventurer team to join Tremorous Clown. After all, the ability to isolate an area from the outside world would be of significant help to a guild in the upcoming war. When Mushin heard Ji Luorong's words, her complexion darkened. Mushin did not doubt that the War of Worlds would happen. This was because of information Frost Heaven obtained from investigating Hundred Ghosts. Previously, she had still been questioning the validity of this information. However, after listening to Ji Luorong's tale, everything made sense. Yet, she couldn't bring herself to be happy about this discovery. Frost Heaven had gone to great lengths to secure one of the reserve seats for God's Domain's 12 great guilds. Yet, just when the guild was about to usher in an era of rapid development, the War of Worlds was about to begin. This was an absolute nightmare for Frost Heaven. However, Mushin felt a little fortunate. If she hadn't chosen to accompany Sherfone to Haitian City's upper zone, she would have most likely remained ignorant about this upcoming, world-shaking change. If Frost Heaven did not prepare for the War of Worlds, it wouldn't be strange if the guild got annihilated. While Mushin was pondering Frost Heaven's future, Sherfone looked at Ji Luorong and said earnestly, Luorong, now that Lu Tiendi has set his sights on you and you have even rejected his offer, with his personality, I'm afraid it won't be long before he takes action against your team. It is no longer suitable for you to remain in Haitian City's upper zone. It will be safer if you move to another upper zone. I have a housing unit in Yuan Tian City's upper zone. Although it isn't comparable to this mansion, you can still conduct daily exercises there. Would you like to move there? Sherfone knew Lu Tiendi's personality better than anyone. Lu Tiendi would eliminate anyone he deemed his enemy. With the Starlene Corporation's present influence over Haitian City's upper zone, Ji Luorong definitely couldn't live there in peace. Only by leaving Haitian City's upper zone would Ji Luorong escape Lu Tiendi's clutches. Go to Yuan Tian City's upper zone. Inevitably, Ji Luorong hesitated. However, she also knew that Sherfone was right, living in Haitian City's upper zone would no longer be safe. 
Miss G, if you find it inconvenient to live with Guild Leader Sherfoam, you are welcome to live with me. Although the Boulder Corporation isn't as powerful as the Starlene Corporation, we have established a solid foundation in Yuantian City's upper zone, Mushin invited. Miss Mushin, you misunderstand. I don't find it inconvenient. I am already very satisfied to be able to live in Yuantian City's upper zone, Ji Luorong said, shaking her head. I am just worried about my friends. They don't live in the upper zone. If Lu Tiendi targets them, I'm afraid they won't be able to hide from him for very long. If it were before, when God's domain still didn't hold such great importance to the various corporations, she wouldn't have to worry about the Starlene Corporation secretly taking action against her companions. However, the situation was different now. Because of the extreme importance the Green God Company placed on God's domain, the various major corporations now prioritized the game. It wouldn't be strange if they took action against individuals in the real world. In response to Ji Luorong's worries, Shifeng chuckled and said, that is simple. Just have your friends head to Zero Wing's headquarters. I'll have everything arranged for their stay. He very much welcomed alliances with experts. Meanwhile, Eternal Glory had plenty of experts in its ranks. Once these players grew up, they would become formidable allies. Sheltering Eternal Glory's members now would only benefit Zero Wing. Moreover, Lei Bao was currently at the half-step Heng Lian Grandmaster standard already. There was also Fire Dance, who was not much inferior to Lei Bao. Combined with the various top-level security measures set up in Zero Wing's headquarters, even a Heng Lian Grandmaster would have difficulty making trouble there. After hearing Shifeng's words, Ji Luorong couldn't help rejoicing. Excitedly, she said, Thank you, Guild Leader Shifeng. I assure you that they will listen to all of Zero Wing's arrangements during their stay. The fact that her adventurer team's members could stay in Zero Wing's headquarters was definitely good news. After all, the present Zero Wing was already very strong. Moreover, the various major corporations hadn't been able to do anything against the guild thus far. Hence, her companions should be relatively safe once they move to its headquarters. After ending her conversation with Shifeng, Ji Luorong promptly contacted her companions and had them hurry to Zero Wing's headquarters immediately. Chapter 2846, Frightening Headquarters The sun was setting, and the sky was growing darker. Originally, this was a time when countless office workers would be getting off work and going home. However, the lights of Zero Wing Tower remained brightly lit. Compared to the buildings around it, the tower looked much livelier, with many people coming and going from it. There was even a long queue of young men and women waiting outside the entrance to take the basic tests for joining Zero Wing. At this time, a group of several dozen people of various origins and clad in diverse styles suddenly appeared in front of the tower and quietly studied the tall building before them with curious expressions. So, this is Zero Wing's headquarters, a young man with freckles on his face said in disdain as he looked at the line of young men and women waiting outside the building. I really wonder what's gotten into the commander. Why does she want us to train in Zero Wing's headquarters all of a sudden? Although Zero Wing is a powerful guild in God's domain, the number of peak experts it actually has isn't a lot. These people trying to join Zero Wing are obviously newbies as well. I bet they can't clear the trial tower's third floor. Yet, the commander actually wants us to train with Zero Wing. None of the group objected to the youth's derisive remarks. It was evident that they agreed with him. As people who had chosen to join an adventure team, the thing they disliked the most was being tied down by various restrictions. Hence, they also held players who joined guilds in extreme contempt, considering guild players to be basically weaklings who feared the strong but bullied the weak. In comparison, every member of their adventurer team could become a core member of a guild, even a super guild, should they choose to join one. This was because they had honed their combat techniques through fighting powerful monsters and various outdoor PvPs without relying on any background or backer. They were completely different from the experts pampered and cultivated by guilds. Moreover, they were also incredibly strong in real-world combat, much stronger than the fighting champions frequently mentioned on TV. This was also why they felt that going out of their way to train with Zero Wing was a complete waste of their time. However, the middle-aged men leading the group shot a glance at the freckled youth and said coldly, Enough, Tian Tong. This is the commander's order. Either you go to Zero Wing or leave the team. Do you wish to leave the team? The freckled youth named Tian Tong no longer dared complain. Although he was still unreconciled to the situation, he did not dare defy the middle-aged man. Similarly, everyone else in the group held their tongue, nobody daring to voice any opinions. This was because this middle-aged man wearing a black shirt was not only Crimson Mask, the Eternal Glory Adventurer team's vice commander, but also the strongest person in the Adventurer team. He was so powerful that even if everyone in their Adventurer team, including their commander, Ji Luorong, banded together, they would just barely be able to hold their ground against him. On the Western continent, he was also known to many as Crimson Mask the Demon. In one instance, in order to save a companion cornered by a large guild, he had charged into a map sealed off by an army of 10,000 all by himself. This army had over 1,000 tier 3 experts, yet not only had this 10,000-man army gotten routed, but none of the 10,000 players had managed to leave the map alive, either. After this battle, the nickname Crimson Mask the Demon began to spread across the continent. As a result, Eternal Glory had a much easier time operating out in the fields. Moreover, Crimson Mask possessed an extraordinary identity even in the real world. He used to be very famous in the bodyguard industry. Many international corporations had sought to employ him. However, for some reason, he had suddenly retired as a bodyguard to become a full-time gamer, thoroughly investing his life in God's domain. 
As for his decision to join Eternal Glory, which had been a weak adventure team back then, that had simply been an accident. After seeing that everyone had quieted down, Crimson Mask nodded and led the group into Zero Wing Tower's lobby. As soon as Crimson Mask and the others entered the lobby, a beautiful woman with shoulder-length hair and sportswear approached their group. The core member's emblem pinned on her top indicated that she was a member of Zero Wing. When this woman appeared, Eternal Glory's members automatically raised their guard. The expression of Crimson Mask, in particular, turned grave when he saw her. This was because the pressure and presence this woman gave off were simply too powerful. Although the woman did not exude any kind of aura, they couldn't help feeling nervous for some reason when standing in her presence. Faced with this feeling, ordinary people would most likely think nothing of it. However, as players who had fought in numerous life and death battles in God's domain, Eternal Glory's members had long since honed their intuition beyond that of ordinary people. Anyone capable of making them feel nervous definitely wasn't an ordinary person. Eyeing the woman approaching them, Crimson Mask inwardly calculated his chances of winning should he fight her. However, after a round of careful observation, he was surprised to conclude that he had only an even chance of victory, and this was only because his physique was stronger. Could she be Fire Dance, the commander of Zero Wing's main force? No matter how Crimson Mask thought about the situation, this was the only possibility he could think of. Otherwise, he couldn't explain why this woman before him gave him such immense pressure. You must be Eternal Glory's members, right? The woman said, smiling as she scanned the group before her. You can call me Turtle Dove. I've already heard about your situation from the guild leader. Since you have come to Zero Wing, you can treat Zero Wing as your home from now on. Your rooms are ready, so you can go there and rest whenever you want. After saying so, Turtle Dove led Crimson Mask and the others toward the elevator to the residential area. Turtle Dove. While following after Turtle Dove, Crimson Mask and the others revealed confused expressions. This was especially true for Crimson Mask. Before going to Zero Wing's headquarters, he had looked into the peak experts under Zero Wing's command. However, there was no one named Turtle Dove on the list. Even Tier 4 experts don't give off such powerful mental pressure. Could she be one of the trump cards Zero Wing is secretly cultivating? Tian Tong was also inwardly surprised when he looked at Turtle Dove. Tian Tong had met many experts, but this was the first time he had come across someone capable of giving such powerful pressure in the real world. Moreover, this was merely a pressure Turtle Dove was radiating subconsciously. Only those who had experienced countless harsh battles and training would develop such a temperament and aura. This was something even Crimson Mask had yet to accomplish even now. Crimson Mask was incredibly strong. He could defeat even master martial artists in a few moves. Despite his strength, Tian Tong had never felt such pressure coming from the middle-aged man. As the group was waiting to enter the spacious elevator, two men walked out of it. These two men were clad in sportswear similar to Turtle Doves. They also wore the emblem for Zero Wing's core members on their tops. The instant these two young men appeared, Crimson Mask and the others broke out in a cold sweat. This was because, in their eyes, the two men that just exited the elevator were no different from beasts. Even someone with dull senses would feel a chill crawl down their spine when bathed in the violent auras and oppressive feeling the two men exuded. Moreover, the two were incredibly fit as well. In fact, they were even superior to Crimson Mask. However, the presence of these two young men did not cause any of the Zero Wing members nearby any trouble. Instead, these Zero Wing members acted as if they did not see these two people, with some of them even chatting and laughing among themselves. What's wrong with these people? Tian Tong was flabbergasted when he saw the behavior of the Zero Wing members around him. Can they not sense this oppressive feeling at all? Right now, Tian Tong felt as if a lion was baring its fangs and claws at him, as if death itself was staring at him. If an ordinary person were subjected to such a feeling for long periods, they might even go crazy. Yet, Zero Wing's members seemed oblivious to this oppressive feeling. Looking at the two departing men, Crimson Mask couldn't help asking Turtle Dove, Miss Turtle Dove, may I know who those two people are? The instant those two young men exited the elevator, Crimson Mask had the feeling that he was doomed. This was because both of those young men were evidently stronger than him. If the two of them attacked him together, he wouldn't even have a chance to retaliate. Their shadow sword and flying shadow, Turtle Dove answered calmly. Because they have been improving quite slowly recently, Big Sis Fire has been scolding them a lot. Currently, the two of them must train with Master Lei Bao for two hours every day. Otherwise, they will be prohibited from entering God's domain. Slow improvement. Turtle Dove's words rendered Tian Tong speechless. She must be boasting. Yes. Turtle Dove is definitely boasting. After all, who could possibly find two guys who are both stronger than Crimson Mask to be lacking? However, when Tian Tong and the others finished settling into their rooms and visited Zero Wing's training room, they discovered that Zero Wing's headquarters was basically a den of monsters. This was because they witnessed Shadow Sword and Flying Shadow getting beaten up and yelled at by a sultry beauty dressed in a red t-shirt and shorts. The two young men were utterly incapable of fighting back at all. From an outsider's perspective, it looked as if an adult was beating up two children. While Eternal Glory's members were training in Zero Wing's headquarters, Shifeng's group arrived back in Yuan Tian City's upper zone. Mushin promptly bade farewell to Shifeng and returned to the Boulder Corporation's mansion. She intended to report the matter of the War of Worlds to the Guild and begin preparations for it as soon as possible. As for Ji Luorong, she arrived at Shifeng's residential unit. To her surprise, there were actually two big sisters sharing the residential unit. Neither of these two big sisters was inferior to her older sister in appearance. 
This was especially true for Gentle Snow. She was basically a goddess who had descended to the mortal world. Moreover, these two big sisters were incredibly strong and knowledgeable in combat as well. When the two of them saw Ji Luorong going through her daily training, not only were they able to point out her flaws in the blink of an eye, but their advice was also easy to understand. Yuan Tian City's upper zone, in a restaurant a short distance away from Shifeng's residential unit. Yi Kuei stood respectfully beside a burly young man and reported carefully, Mr. Wang, according to my investigation, Black Flame and that little girl are living in that residential area. However, they are currently remaining in their house, so it isn't suitable to take action now. I'm afraid I'll have to waste some of your time. No need for that much trouble. Chuckling, the youth named Wang Xianming said nonchalantly, that's merely an ordinary residential area. Besides, it's just teaching a neutralizing grandmaster a lesson. I can just sneak in at midnight. I guarantee that none of the surveillance systems in place will notice me. Then, I'll have to trouble you with that, Mr. Wang. Yi Kuei did not doubt Wang Xuanming's claim. Those surveillance systems might be able to stop him, but they definitely couldn't stop someone like Wang Xianming. Of course, it would be a different story if Shifeng were living in a mansion. Unfortunately, Shifeng was only living in an ordinary residential area, and the level of security in such a place wasn't particularly amazing. Chapter 2847, Den of Monsters The night was quiet, and the moon hung high in the sky. Apart from the street lights, no other light source shone in the 6th Southern District. It was evident that the people living in this residential area had already gone to bed. Outside the residential area, Yi Kuei approached Wang Xianming, who was all in black, and reported carefully, Mr. Wang, all the houses in the residential area have already turned off their lights. Only a few monitoring facilities are still operating there. In addition, we found 32 enforcement robots patrolling the area. They do not follow any set patrol routes. The reason the upper zone was incredibly safe wasn't just the Green God Company's absolute authority in the upper zone. Apart from that, there was also the fact that anyone who had lived here for some time would gain a physique rivaling that of Hanglian masters in the outside world. Moreover, while the upper zone prioritized mental strength above all, every resident living in the upper zone still possessed exceptionally high combat standards. Defeating such people within a short period would be incredibly difficult. Most importantly, enforcement robots constantly patrolled every corner of the upper zone. Not only did these enforcement robots operate using state-of-the-art artificial intelligence, but their bodies were also made of titanium alloy and other special alloys. Even if they received a hit from a cannon of ancient times, they would, at most, suffer minor damage, although it was highly unlikely that a cannon could ever land a hit on these enforcement robots. This was because these robots possessed inhuman reaction speeds and physiques. Thanks to these factors, they could rival neutralizing grandmasters. Before these enforcement robots, both neutralizing grandmasters and Hanglian grandmasters were nothing. Hence, Hanglian grandmasters dared not take any covert action in the upper zone. At most, they would openly cross hands with their opponents. This frightening technology was exclusive to the Green God Company and was one reason the various corporations worldwide feared the Green God Company so much. 32. Nodding, Wang Xianming said, Okay. Give me a map of their general location. Wang Xianming was not the slightest bit surprised to find so many enforcement robots in a residential area. In fact, this number was significantly lower than what mansion districts would boast. Even an ordinary mansion district would have at least 200 enforcement robots on patrol at all times. The security there was truly impeccable. It was only because Shifeng was living in an ordinary residential area that Wang Xianming had an opportunity to take action. Even then, Wang Xianming was only confident of teaching Shifeng a small lesson and heavily injuring him. This was because these enforcement robots were incredibly fast. The first enforcement robot would arrive within 8 seconds of the moment he broke into Shifeng's house. This was also the basic arrangement for ordinary residential areas. Hence, after Wang Xianming factored in the time he needed to escape, he concluded that he only had a very short time to do battle. If he delayed too long and got discovered by an enforcement robot, he shouldn't even think of escaping. As for putting up a fight against the enforcement robots, that was simply suicidal. These are the locations of the 32 robots 10 seconds ago, Yi Kuei said as he transferred the data to Wang Xuanming's quantum watch. Immediately, 32 red dots appeared on the map displayed on Wang Xuanming's watch. After glancing at the map, Wang Xianming smiled and said, It seems Xia Qingying is treating this guy quite well. With this distribution, I'll only have 7 seconds to conclude the operation. 7 seconds. Yi Kuei frowned at Wang Xuanming's estimate. How about I attract the attention of those robots? There might only be a one second difference between seven seconds and eight seconds, but a Hanglian Grandmaster could cross a distance of several dozen meters in one second. Hence, one second was by no means a short period. Relax. Grinning, Wang Xianming said, let alone this residential area, I've infiltrated even more dangerous places than this in the past. Seven seconds is more than enough for me already. If an ordinary Henglian Grandmaster were taking action, seven seconds would indeed be insufficient for them to injure a neutralizing Grandmaster and escape without getting caught. Not to mention, Shifeng was a neutralizing Grandmaster who had achieved an incredibly high standard in his mental strength. The control he had over his body was far superior to the average neutralizing Grandmasters, which would make teaching him a lesson even more difficult. However, this wasn't a problem for Wang Xianming. After all, he was only half a step away from becoming a mental strength master. The control he could exert over his body was far beyond what an ordinary Henglian Grandmaster like Yi Kuei could exert. 
In a situation where Wang Xianming fully exerted himself, he would need only three seconds to kill a Hanglian Grandmaster, let alone a neutralizing Grandmaster. Besides, his goal was only to injure Shi Feng heavily. Yi Kuei did not doubt the man in the slightest. After all, not only was Wang Xianming incredibly famous in Haitian City's upper zone, but Yi Kuei had sparred with him before and suffered defeat after exchanging a single punch. Moreover, after that exchange, his entire arm had gone numb and became paralyzed for a short period, despite Wang Xianming holding back. Before that fight, Yi Kuei had never thought that it would be possible for a person to possess such incredible strength. Wang Xuanming's strength could practically rival Superman's. With such strength, it would be child's play for Wang Xianming to teach Shi Feng a lesson. After Wang Xianming made some basic preparations, he promptly sneaked into the residential area by himself. Wang Xuanming's actions were swift and silent. Despite Yi Kuei keeping a close eye on him, the latter disappeared from his sight after just three seconds. Did his control over his body improve even further? Yi Kuei shuddered involuntarily when Wang Xianming disappeared into the coverless residential area. This was the first time he had seen someone with such an astonishing grasp of their body and surroundings. If Wang Xianming decided to take action against him, the consequences would be unprecedented. Yi Kuei felt very fortunate that Lu Tianti had a good relationship with Wang Xianming. If the two of them were hostile, then as Lu Tianti's butler come bodyguard, he would definitely suffer a miserable death. While Yi Kuei was in awe of Wang Xuanming's capabilities, Wang Xianming successfully evaded the enforcement robots one after another and arrived before Shi Feng's residential unit undetected. However, Wang Xianming did not rush to break into the house. Instead, he hid in a corner and silently observed his surroundings, then inspected the distribution of the 32 enforcement robots. He was being so cautious because the only way he could enter the house was by breaking down the door, hacking the lock system was simply impossible. Meanwhile, the moment he broke down the door, the nearby enforcement robots would take action. Hence, he needed to have a precise grasp of his timing and plan his escape route first. Otherwise, he would definitely get caught. Good. There are three escape routes. So long as I can teach that Shifong a lesson in five seconds, I can get out of this residential area scot-free. After planning his escape routes on his quantum watch and conducting some mental simulations, Wang Xianming set his sights on the nearby door. He then put on the helmet he carried, thoroughly concealing his identity. And as soon as he finished mentally preparing himself, he strode forward silently and arrived in front of the door in the blink of an eye. Subsequently, he kicked the door without hesitation. The door deformed, smashed open in an instant. Immediately afterward, the alarm in the house rang, and six enforcement robots received the alert almost simultaneously. These six enforcement robots then dashed straight for Shifeng's house. Meanwhile, Shifeng, who was logged into God's domain, also received the intruder alert as soon as the alarm sounded, and logged out of the game immediately. His reaction speed was so fast that he completed the entire process in just one second. However, for a Hanglian Grandmaster, one second was a long time. Even though the house had a 200 square meter footprint, Wang Xianming still passed through the long corridor and arrived in the middle of the living room in just one second. The next moment, just as Wang Xianming entered the 60 square meter living room and was about to charge towards Shi Feng's bedroom, he was stunned. This was because he discovered a woman with silky, waist-length hair sitting on the living room sofa. Wearing a snow-white nightgown, she quietly regarded Wang Xianming with eyes that carried neither joy nor sorrow. Looking at the absolute beauty before him, Wang Xianming smiled and said, Miss, it's bad for your skin to stay up this late. Wang Xianming did not stay surprised for long. This was because the information he had acquired had indicated that Shi Feng was living together with two women, who appeared to be Zero Wing's vice guild leaders. As Wang Xianming spoke, he did not stop his feet at all. In just a few steps, he had already arrived before Gentle Snow. Immediately afterward, he executed footwork and split his body into three afterimages. These three afterimages then executed a chop at Gentle Snow simultaneously, the chops breaking the sound barrier. Rest up for a week. The three chops Wang Xianming executed were lightning fast. Facing this move, even a neutralizing Grandmaster would barely manage to stop two of the blows. The next moment, the three chops could be seen landing on Gentle Snow's body simultaneously. Huh. However, the instant his hand hit Gentle Snow's body, Wang Xianming was stunned. An afterimage. Moreover, before Wang Xianming realized it, another life figure had appeared beside him. This figure was none other than Gentle Snow. At this time, Gentle Snow still regarded him with the same emotionless gaze, apparently unaffected by his attack. Damn it. Where did that guy find such a monster? Wang Xianming stared at Gentle Snow in shock and confusion. He also couldn't understand how Gentle Snow could be so powerful despite being so young. Before clashing with Gentle Snow, he already had an inkling that she would be a difficult opponent. Hence, he had gone all out right off the bat to end the fight quickly. However, when he exchanged moves with Gentle Snow, he understood just how terrifying the woman was. No. She's not just terrifying. She's practically inhuman. He could clearly tell that Gentle Snow's physical fitness was only at the standard of Hanglian Masters, which was far inferior to his own. Nevertheless, she had reacted to his attack as if she had long since known what he would do. Moreover, he had even failed to perceive her evasion. While he was executing his earlier attack, the figure he saw sitting on the sofa had merely been an afterimage his mind had fixated on. 
The moment he began his attack, Gentle Snow herself had already disappeared from the sofa. The ability to evade a Heng Lian Grandmaster's mental perception wasn't something that could be gained overnight. It was a high-level technique that had to be cultivated through rigorous training and countless battles involving life and death. While Wang Xianming might look like a 25-year-old man, he was, in reality, nearing 35 already. Yet, even at his age, he had just barely touched upon the threshold of this technique. In contrast, not only had this young woman before him learned this technique, but she had also mastered it to the point where she could dodge the attack of a half-step mental strength master with ease. Upon thinking up to this point, Wang Xianming rushed to the door almost immediately. He had no intention of staying here for even a second longer. If he were to clash against such a monster, it would be impossible for him to produce any results within the limited time available. If he stayed any longer, the enforcement robots would catch him. However, when Wang Xianming reached the entrance, he found another live figure standing by the door. This person was none other than Aqua Rose. Scram. Looking at the woman dressed in a light blue nightgown before him, Wang Xianming grew enraged. Not only had he failed to accomplish his mission, but there was even a monster behind him. If he wasted any more time here, he would definitely fall into the enforcement robot's hands. Hence, Wang Xuanming's first reaction when seeing Aqua Rose was to attack her with everything he had. The next moment, over a dozen fists could be seen punching at Aqua Rose, every punch carrying the full strength of a Hanglian Grandmaster. Even a Hanglian Grandmaster would suffer internal injuries and lose consciousness if they got hit by such a barrage of punches. However, Wang Xianming was dumbfounded once he finished executing his attack. When his fists had landed on the woman before him, he felt as if he were shadowboxing. Not only did his attacks fail to repel the woman, but the woman had even moved closer to him. By the time Wang Xianming had executed well over a hundred punches, Aqua Rose stood only half a step away from his two-meter-tall body, her delicate palm smacking his chest. Despite Aqua Rose only executing a gentle strike, Wang Xianming felt an intense pain in his chest. The pain was so unbearable that he stumbled two steps back. How is this possible? Wang Xianming gaped at the woman before him in disbelief. A monster. Another monster. At this time, Gentle Snow arrived behind Wang Xianming and was quietly looking at the burly man. Wang Xianming revealed an incomparably ashen expression as he switched his gaze between Aqua Rose and Gentle Snow, wishing he could kill Yi Kuei. How did that man conduct his investigation? Two inhuman monsters actually lived inside an ordinary residential unit. Even the security level at the mansion areas couldn't compare to the security of this little house. Chapter 2848, Uproar At the entrance of the 6th Southern District Ten minutes have gone by already. Looking at his quantum watch, Yi Kuei smiled in delight. Mr. Wang should be taking action right about now. Yi Kuei did not doubt Wang Xuanming's strength in the slightest. If not for the enforcement robots being too powerful, Yi Kuei would have wanted to spectate the fight at a close distance and see how terrified and helpless Xiu Feng was against Wang Xianming. After all, a neutralizing grandmaster like Xiu Feng would be utterly incapable of resisting Wang Xuanming's strength. The most he could do was run away. Once Xiu Feng was taken care of, dealing with Ji Luoro would become a lot easier. Just as Yi Kuei was entertaining such thoughts, a loud noise suddenly came from the residential area. As he started taking action, Yi Kuei grew excited when he heard the noise, and he couldn't help taking a few steps toward the residential area. Although he knew that the most he would see from his location was Shifeng's building, this was more than enough. He was only curious to find out how many seconds Shifeng would last against a monster like Wang Xianming. Three seconds. Or perhaps four seconds. Based on the strength Shifeng had displayed previously, Yi Kuei admitted that the younger man was indeed stronger than himself. However, if it came down to an all-out fight, he would have a great chance of victory. After all, Heng Lian Grandmasters did not possess just incredible defensive capabilities but also recovery abilities far superior to the average person's. Yi Kuei might have suffered significant damage from Shifeng's palm strike, but he had also recovered from the injury very quickly. One could say that the only advantages Shifeng had over the average Heng Lian Grandmaster were speed and destructive power. However, in front of Wang Xianming, these advantages would be negligible. Hence, Shifeng would probably last against Wang Xianming roughly as long as an average Heng Lian Grandmaster would. After leaving his hiding spot, Yi Kuei immediately noticed Wang Xianming charging into Shifeng's house. Wang Xuanming's speed was so fast that Yi Kuei didn't even catch a clear sight of him. However, two seconds after Wang Xianming disappeared into the house, he actually reappeared at the entrance. He's done already. Yi Kuei was dumbfounded when he saw Wang Xianming back at the entrance of Shifeng's house. He never thought that Wang Xianming would be so powerful as to end the fight in just one second. With such strength, calling Wang Xianming a monster wouldn't be an exaggeration at all. Wang Xianming was on a whole different level from Heng Lian grandmasters like himself. However, in the next moment, Yi Kuei was stunned once more. A woman wearing a light blue nightgown had actually appeared before the entrance without him realizing it. Meanwhile, as if agitated by this woman's appearance, Wang Xianming promptly launched a flurry of punches at her. Even from several hundred meters away, Yi Kuei could clearly sense the terrifying aura Wang Xianming exuded. Madness. Violence. Destruction. Nobody could possibly survive Wang Xuanming's chaotic punches. 
Has he lost his mind? Yi Kue was horrified. If Wang Xianming had simply taught Shir Feng a lesson and landed the latter in the hospital for several months, the Green God Company wouldn't look too deeply into the matter. At most, it would strengthen the residential area security and give Shir Feng some compensation. However, if Wang Xianming took a life in the upper zone, he would touch the Green God Company's bottom line. At that time, the company would definitely conduct a thorough investigation into the matter until it found the culprit. Once Wang Xianming was caught, even the big shots living in the middle layer wouldn't be able to help him. In fact, he might even drag down Lu Tiendi and Yi Kuei as accomplices. However, before Yi Kuei could recover from his shock, he received yet another jolt. This time, his eyes nearly fell out of their sockets. This was because the woman dressed in a nightgown actually remained and escaped despite facing Wang Xuanming's flurry of punches. She even moved closer and closer to Wang Xianming and eventually planted a palm on his chest. The instant the woman's blow landed, Wang Xianming actually stumbled two steps back and clutched his chest in pain. He also stared at the woman before him with fear in his eyes. Who is she? Why did such a monster appear in Shi Feng's house? Yi Kuei was shocked and confused as he looked at Aqua Rose, who stood in the corridor outside Shi Feng's house. He even rubbed his eyes to make sure he wasn't hallucinating. Wang Xianming, an incredibly powerful Heng Lian Grandmaster, had actually lost to a frail woman. As Yi Kuei gaped in shock, Wang Xianming added to Yi Kuei's confusion by charging forward and attacking Aqua Rose once more. He actually showed no signs of trying to escape from another location. However, Yi Kuei quickly noticed that another woman of extraordinary beauty had walked out of the house. This woman was similarly dressed in a snow-white nightgown and had silky black hair flowing down to her waist. Under the illumination of moonlight, she looked just like a goddess that had descended to the mortal world. Although this woman did not exude an imposing aura, the indifference in her eyes combined with Wang Xuanming's strange behavior allowed Yi Kuei to guess what was going on. Most likely, the woman behind Wang Xianming was a monster as well. Hence, he did not choose to enter the house and break out from another location. After all, if Wang Xianming were to fight inside the more spacious house, he would have to face those two monstrous women simultaneously. No matter how powerful Wang Xianming was, he definitely wouldn't have any opportunity to escape under such circumstances. Hence, he could only choose to fight in the narrow hallway and risk a pincer attack. However, contrary to Wang Xuanming's expectations, Gentle Snow had no intention of double-teaming him. She simply stood aside and quietly looked at the broken door, appearing quite bothered about it. In other words, the broken door seemed much more important to Gentle Snow than Wang Xianming was. On the other side, Aqua Rose treated Wang Xuanming's series of desperate attacks as if they were child's play. Not only did she evade all of them effortlessly, but she also landed another palm strike on Wang Xianming, aggravating his injuries. Their clash continued for four seconds. At this point, Wang Xianming could no longer stand steadily, so weakened that even a Heng Lian Grandmaster could go up against him. Trying to escape in such a condition was a luxury he couldn't afford. Before Wang Xianming could launch another round of attacks against Aqua Rose, the alerted enforcement robots finally arrived at the scene. After distinguishing everyone's identities, the enforcement robots promptly took Wang Xianming into custody. Once arrested by the enforcement robots, even a Heng Lian Grandmaster would have no chance of putting up a struggle. As Yi Kuei watched Wang Xuanming's capture, he noticed Gentle Snow walking out of the house and looking in his direction. Fear seized Yi Kuei's mind, and goosebumps rose all over his body. He instinctively turned around and fled immediately. She shouldn't have seen me. I was so far away, and I even had my aura concealed. Even if she's a monster, she shouldn't have discovered me. Yi Kuei reassured himself this way as he fled. He repeatedly told himself that he was merely imagining things. Only after Yi Kuei had left Yuan Tian City's upper zone did he finally calm down from receiving Gentle Snow's attention. That was too damn scary. How can such a monster exist in this world? Chills crawled down Yi Kuei's back when he recalled Gentle Snow's indifferent gaze. I need to have the young master report this matter to the higher-ups immediately. Those monsters aren't things we can offend. Those two women simply aren't human. As Yi Kuei was fleeing Yuan Tian City's upper zone, Xia Qingying, the base layer's general manager, arrived at Shi Feng's residential area together with several supervisors. Who's the fool who would actually dare assault someone in a residential area? Luo Hanbin frowned as he looked at the broken door before him. It had already been several years since a home assault had happened in Yuan Tian City's upper zone. The previous occasion had greatly angered the Green God Company. Although the victim had sustained only heavy injuries, not only had the offender gotten banished from the upper zone forever, but he was even in prison for 10 years once outside. Now that another occurrence had taken place, even if the Green God Company's executives didn't say anything, the managers of Yuan Tian City's upper zone definitely wouldn't spare the offender. However, when Luo Hanbin entered the house and saw Wang Xianming being held in place by two enforcement robots, his eyes nearly fell out of their sockets. Wang Xianming A peerless genius of Haitian City's upper zone. Wang Xianming was a big shot who was only half a step away from becoming a mental strength master. Even a supervisor like Luo Hanbin had to act politely around him. Meanwhile, with Wang Xuanming's strength, he could rank within the top three of Haitian City's upper zone's base layer. The man even had a mental strength master as his teacher. With all these conditions, he was almost certain to become a permanent resident of the middle layer. Let alone Luo Hanbin, even Xia Qingying was shocked. 
Originally, she had expected the offender to be an ignorant punk. She never imagined that the offender would be a peerless genius of Haitian City's upper zone. She also couldn't help wondering how Shu Feng had apprehended Wang Xianming. With Wang Xuanming's skills, Xia Qingying had only a slight edge over him. She couldn't guarantee she would win if they clashed. And if Wang Xianming focused solely on escaping, even she wouldn't be able to hold him down for seven or eight seconds. Looking at Shifeng sitting on the living room sofa, Xia Qingying blurted out, You sure know how to surprise people. The last time, you broke the mental paths record. Now, you even brought down Haitian cities Wang Xianming. Smiling bitterly, Shifeng said, An accident. This really is an accident. I never thought that a big shot from Haitian City's upper zone would actually take action against me out of the blue. From the time Wang Xianming had broken into the house and until his apprehension, Shifeng hadn't done anything. He had been a spectator all the while. He also never expected an expert like Wang Xianming to attack him. Not wishing to reveal gentle snow and aqua roses matters for the time being, he did not dispel Xia Qingying's misunderstanding. All right, then. Seeing that Shifeng didn't intend to continue speaking, Xia Qingying said, now that Wang Xianming has been arrested, the Green God Company will definitely punish him. Even his teacher won't be able to do anything about it. However, his teacher is incredibly protective of his students. While he might not be able to do anything about Wang Xuanming's punishment, he is sure to pick a fight with you. Although we will strengthen the security of this area, you should still be careful. It's best if you don't leave the residential area for the time being. Even base layer general managers like herself would have a headache dealing with the anger of a mental strength master, let alone Shifeng, who held only grade 1 authority. Thank you for your warning, General Manager Xia, Shifeng said, nodding. Shortly after Xia Qingying's group left with Wang Xianming, word of Wang Xuanming's assault on Shifeng's house spread like wildfire. Even though it was already midnight, everyone in Yuantian City's upper zone still quickly received news of it. Chapter 2849, Hong Xinyuan's Choice In one of Yuantian City's upper zone's mansion districts, Uncle Hong, did something happen? Why did you suddenly call for me? Mushin asked in confusion as she looked at Hong Xin Yuan, who was standing by a French window and looking at the night view outside. She was just about to explore an ancient ruin. She had gathered her subordinates already. If she were lucky, she might discover a tier 4 legacy land or a legacy guidance there. These things were incredibly important for the current Frost Heaven. The War of Worlds would be starting soon. Although her investigation had turned up very little information about the war, she had managed to deduce that they would face players of another world. At that time, the only options left for them would be to conquer or be conquered. It would be different from when players of other worlds entered the main continent. There would be no third option available to them. Hence, Frost Heaven needed to make as many preparations as possible before the War of Worlds began. Naturally, increasing the number of Tier 4 players the guild had was a top priority. Kurue, who stood beside Mushin, was also confused by Hong Xinyuan's summons. She had just fallen asleep, yet before she could get any rest, she was rudely roused out of bed. Hence, she was still incredibly sleepy and wanted nothing more than to crawl back into her bed right now. Take a look for yourselves, Hong Xinyuan said as he passed a document to Mushin and Kurue. The document was none other than a summary of Wang Xinyuan's home assault in the 6th Southern District. How is this possible? Mushin couldn't help doubting her eyes when she read the report. She had heard of Haitian City's upper zones Wang Xianming. An expert of his caliber could definitely rank as the number one or number two expert in the base layer of Yuantian City's upper zone. If such an expert decided to take covert action, even the Boulder Corporation would be powerless. All the corporation could do was have its members take shelter in its mansion temporarily. Nevertheless, Wang Xianming had not only failed in his attack on Shifeng but even gotten apprehended. How could anyone possibly believe this? He was actually that powerful. After reading the report, Kurue was now wide awake. Simultaneously, a hint of confusion had appeared in her eyes. Everything is as the report states. Looking at Mushin's surprised expression, Hong Xin Yuan said, I have to admit that I indeed underestimated Shifeng. It seems that he has kept a lot more secrets than we thought. After pondering on the matter for a moment, Mushin asked, Uncle Hong, do you mean for us to deepen our relationship with Zero Wing? That's right. You already know what's coming in the future. When the war begins, even superpowers will have difficulty surviving. If we wish to survive, thoroughly solidifying our alliance with Zero Wing will undoubtedly be a good choice, Hong Xin Yuan said, nodding. I also plan to sell some of the corporation's phantom potions and life potions to Zero Wing. These should be what Zero Wing lacks the most right now. I understand. I'll contact Zero Wing immediately. Mushin nodded and promptly left the living room. Kurue snapped out of her daze. Looking at Hongxin Yuan, she asked, Uncle Hong, do we need to go to such lengths? If Hongxin Yuan were merely trying to form a strategic alliance with Zero Wing, then she could still accept such a decision. After all, the present strength and potential Zero Wing had displayed far exceeded those of the various superpowers. In fact, Zero Wing might even become an existence rivaling the five great super guilds. The only things the guild lacked now were time and talents. However, Hong Xin Yuan's decision to sell some of the Boulder Corporation's phantom potions and life potions to Zero Wing greatly confused her. These items served as the foundation for the various corporations. Even the successors of major corporations could get their hands on only a limited number of them. You don't understand. 
Wang Xianming isn't someone who can be defeated so easily. The cards and secrets Xiu Feng has hidden are absolutely extraordinary. Shaking his head, Hong Xin Yuan said, deepening our relationship with him now will be beneficial for both the corporation and you two sisters. In reality, apart from Xiu Feng's great potential, another reason behind Hong Xin Yuan's decision to go to such lengths to befriend Xiu Feng was an astonishing piece of information Xia Qingying had leaked to him. Xiu Feng wasn't the person who defeated Wang Xianming. Hong Xin Yuan knew that Wang Xuanming's combat power was only slightly beneath Xia Qingying's. Hence, defeating Wang Xianming was an incredibly challenging proposition. Needless to say, defeating him in just a few seconds would be even more difficult. Only the big shots living in the upper zone's middle layer could defeat Wang Xianming that fast. If the Boulder Corporation could befriend such big shots, it would bring much greater benefits to the corporation than simply silently developing its foundations on the base layer. At the same time, inside a mansion in the distant Haitian city's upper zone. Young master, what should we do? Yi Kue asked in a worried tone as he looked at Lu Tiendi, who had just exited his gaming cabin. Yuan Tian city's upper zone has already apprehended Mr. Wang. If your teacher blames you. Wang Xianming was a bona fide peerless genius. Finding a student like him was difficult, even for the middle layer's big shots. Now that Wang Xianming had been caught conducting a home assault, he would definitely be banished from the upper zone. Without the upper zone's various resources, any further improvements would be utterly impossible for him. After hearing Ikuei's report, Lu Tiendi smiled and said, We don't need to do anything. Although the outcome is different from what I imagined, things are still progressing according to plan. Now, all we need to do is sit back and wait. Wang Xianming had always been their teacher's favorite pupil, receiving the best resources available. Hence, Lu Tiendi had always gotten shortchanged in terms of resources. If not for Lu Xinghua suffering a major failure, his teacher wouldn't have started placing importance on Lu Tiendi at all. Lu Tiendi's original plan had Wang Xianming and Xiu Feng forming a grudge against each other. In his opinion, with Xiu Feng's abilities and potential, Wang Xianming probably couldn't do anything significant to Xiu Feng. Once Wang Xianming failed in his attack, Xiu Feng would definitely retaliate and create a lot of problems for Wang Xianming. Naturally, Wang Xianming wouldn't sit still and would retaliate against Xiu Feng as well. Xiu Feng had exceeded Lu Tiendi's expectations and defeated Wang Xianming. However, this was not bad news for Lu Tiendi, in fact, this was the outcome he hoped to see the most. After all, not only would Wang Xianming get banished from the upper zone now, but Xiu Feng would also earn the ire of their teacher. Once their teacher retaliated, Xiu Feng would most likely be forced to leave the upper zone. In fact, he might even disappear from the world altogether. At that time, Lu Tiendi could plan on taking over Zero Wing. According to plan, Yi Kuei shuddered involuntarily when he saw Lu Tiendi's indifferent smile. He never thought that Lu Tiendi would scheme against even Wang Xianming. Ignoring his butler's reaction, Lu Tiendi said, All right, move along. I still need you to take care of Ji Luorong's group in God's domain. Yes, sir. Yi Kuei responded in a hurry. Although he had long since known that those who stood in Lu Tiendi's way would never have a good ending, he still got frightened when he saw one of Lu Tiendi's schemes coming to fruition. Meanwhile, after Wang Xuanming's assault, Yuan Tian City's upper zone arranged for Xiu Feng's group to live in a better residential unit. Xia Qingying had an enforcement robot stationed near Xiu Feng's new house long term to prevent a similar situation from occurring. As icing on the cake, the Green God Company gifted 10 Phantom Potions and 10 Life Potions to Xiu Feng as compensation. However, Xiu Feng did not feel happy at all in this situation. On the contrary, he even felt slightly pressured. Now that Wang Xianming is in custody, his teacher definitely won't spare me. Even with an enforcement robot guarding the house 24-7, it'll probably be difficult to stop the retaliation of a mental strength master. As Xiu Feng studied the information Xia Qingying supplied him, his head ached. Fu Jiuzhong, Wang Xuanming's teacher, was no ordinary individual. He was an expert that ranked at the top even in the middle layer and wielded incredible authority. He even had influence over several corporations operating in Yuantian City that rivaled the Boulder Corporation in scale. If Fu Jiuzhong began targeting Xiu Feng, Xiu Feng would most likely have difficulty acquiring resources from Yuantian City's base layer. Although it is still a little early, it seems I have no choice but to take on the Divine Dragon's trial. Even now, Xiu Feng still wasn't confident of completing Auerbeck's trial. This was because a Tier 4 Divine Dragon was much stronger than an ordinary Tier 4 Dragon. Even Tier 5 existences were unlikely to be a match for a Tier 4 Divine Dragon. Originally, Xiu Feng had planned to challenge the trial only after further improving his mana body. However, it seemed that he had no choice but to push his plans forward. It was of utmost importance that he completed the Divine Dragon's trial now. This was because only by completing Auerbeck's trial would he become the Divine Dragon's true companion. If that happened, Zero Wing could thoroughly solidify its position on the Western Continent, and the Starlight Fortress could serve a much greater purpose. At that time, Zero Wing would be able to not only recruit talents from the Western Continent in large numbers but also acquire large amounts of Seven Luminaries Crystals. After all, a Heaven Mode regional dungeon produced an astonishing amount of Seven Luminaries Crystals. With the Seven Luminaries Crystals he acquired, he would then be able to exchange for a bunch of Phantom Potions and Life Potions. Only by securing Phantom Potions and Life Potions in bulk could he achieve a breakthrough in his mental strength in the real world and his concentration in God's domain. After returning to his room, Xiu Feng promptly consumed a Phantom Potion and a Life Potion. 
He then lay in his fearless cabin and logged into the game. Chapter 2850, Divine Dragon's Trial Zero Wing City, Zero Wing's Residence After Sher Phone came online, the first thing he did was assign tasks to Liang Jing and Yulan, particularly the distribution of the Tier 3 mana set equipment he had produced. He had made more than 200 of these sets, and he tasked Yulan with secretly gathering a batch of Tier 3 experts who could equip them. Once these experts were geared with the Tier 3 mana set equipment, Zero Wing would gain an additional trump card. Although, the modified Tier 3 mana set equipment wasn't as powerful as the original version, there was only a 15% decrease in the basic attributes it provided. A Tier 3 player equipped with the modified set could still go up against mythic monsters of the same level. In addition, Sherphone passed the Treasure of Fire to Melancholic Smile and had her procure as many mysterious flames as possible. They could offer the Seeds of Flame converted as an award for the Candlelight Trading Firm's forgers and alchemists. By doing so, they could not only increase Candlelight's productivity but also attract more lifestyle players to join the firm. After all, a lifestyle player's promotion was largely influenced by their production success rates. When Melancholic Smile received the Treasure of Fire from Sherphone, she was shocked. Then, uncontrollable excitement welled up inside her. She had always had a passion for mysterious flames. However, incredibly powerful mysterious flames weren't easy to find. And even when the guild did find some, she didn't have the ability to make it her own. Thus, the mysterious flame she currently used was only a tier 2 mysterious flame. No lifestyle player had managed to absorb either of the two tier 3 mysterious flames sitting in the guild warehouse even now. However, the Purification Crown resolved the hurdle preventing lifestyle players from absorbing stronger mysterious flames and could even produce mysterious flames using various types of flames. Melancholic Smile could already envision the swarms of lifestyle players fighting to join the Candlelight Trading Firm. At that time, be it the construction of the Crimson Dragon flying ships or another mobile fortress, Candlelight wouldn't have to worry about lacking talents and manpower. At the same time, with Gentle Snow and Aqua Rose's return, Zero Wing no longer lacked Apex combatants to protect it. Hence, Sherphone tasked Fire Dance with secretly gathering information on the Seven Treasures and collecting them directly, if possible. The Seven Treasures were not only crucial for his quest, but their various supportive functions were simply heaven-defying, providing incredible help to both individuals and guilds. Previously, when players in God's Domain were still low-leveled and weak, the likelihood of them encountering the Seven Treasures was low. However, now that more and more Tier 4 players had begun appearing, the chances of players stumbling over the Seven Treasures were much greater. Not to mention, the present Zero Wing was already far stronger than before. After its recent rapid development, Zero Wing now had more than 50,000 Tier 3 players under its command, a number that rivaled what the various superpowers had. In addition, the number of partners Zero Wing had continued to increase. Recently, Frost Heaven had thoroughly solidified its alliance with Zero Wing, drastically increasing Zero Wing's influence on the Eastern Continent. At this point, Zero Wing could expand its territory already. Hence, his hunt for the Seven Treasures was no longer an impossible task. Moreover, he had to get his hands on the Seven Treasures to elevate Zero Wing's strength further. This was because only by gathering all of the Seven Treasures could he fully utilize their power. In fact, the Seven Treasures could even suppress the Endless Abyss. If Zero Wing could acquire this power, thoroughly making an enemy out of the five great super guilds wouldn't be a problem. It also wouldn't have to fear the invasion of other gods' domains. After Sherphone finished assigning tasks, he promptly teleported to the Starlight Fortress to take on the Divine Dragon's trial so that he could solidify Zero Wing's position on the Western Continent. At that time, even if the world seal broke and the War of Worlds began, Zero Wing would have the ability to defend itself against the attacks of the foreign gods' domain's powers. Western Continent, Starlight Fortress the summoning array at the top of the summoning tower lit up, and Sherphone appeared in the summoning hall a moment later. Standing atop the summoning tower, Sherphone had a full view of the Starlight Fortress's situation. At present, the Starlight Fortress was no longer the same as before. Not only had the number of players visiting the fortress increased massively, but even the weakest among them was a Tier 3. There were even quite a number of Tier 4 experts roaming the streets. After briefly scanning the fortress, Sherphone discovered at least 10 Tier 4 players, nearly outnumbering what Zero Wing City had. If not for the Divine Dragon's presence, even if the Starlight Fortress had Divine Tribe and Netherworld Empire's assistance, it would still be very difficult to keep all these players in check, not to mention the large number of visiting NPCs and NPC forces greedily eyeing the fortress. Yet, due to the Silver Divine Dragon, these players and NPCs had no choice but to lie low. After checking the fortress's situation, Sherphone went to the Summoning Tower's Summoning Altar, which was also the Silver Divine Dragon's resting place. When Sherphone arrived in the spacious Summoning Altar, what greeted him was the sight of a miniature version of the Silver Divine Dragon Auerbeck. The Divine Dragon, which was only around a dozen meters in length, was sleeping quietly in the middle of the room. At this time, Auerbeck had already reached level 164. The aura it released now was on a whole other level. It was also much stronger than the dragon Sherphone had slain in the ancient god's domain. In fact, Sherphone found it quite difficult to stand in the aura Auerbeck exuded. If an ordinary tier 4 player were in his place, they wouldn't even be able to approach the Divine Dragon. Looking at the fully recovered Silver Divine Dragon, Sherphone gained further understanding of Divine Dragons. He had to admit that Divine Dragons truly weren't existence as humans could offend. Despite Auerbeck being only at the Tier 4 Mythic rank, it was still strong enough to defeat ordinary Tier 5 existences. 
As for tier 4 existences, they were nothing but ants in front of a tier 4 divine dragon. Little human, you've come. Our Beck woke up upon sensing Shur Fang's arrival. Looking at Shur Fang with its golden eyes, it said in satisfaction, it seems you have made your preparations to challenge the trial. Yes, esteemed divine dragon, Shur Fang agreed, nodding. Both his mana body and concentration standards had already reached a bottleneck, and it was unlikely he could make a breakthrough within a short time. If he wished to elevate his strength further, the only way to do so would be by obtaining a legendary weapon or equipment. However, this evidently wasn't a feasible plan, as every legendary weapon and equipment required a lot of time and manpower to acquire. Good. Since you're confident in taking on the trial, I will let you challenge it as per our previous agreement. However, let me make this clear. You only have three opportunities. If you fail to pass the trial in three tries, the contract between us will be dissolved, our beck said as it rose from the ground. As for the trial you will be undertaking, it is the trial that has been passed down through generations among the dragon race. Originally, this trial was created for dragons. However, since you wish to become my companion, you will have to complete the Tier 4 Infant Dragons trial at the very minimum. A trial for Tier 4 Infant Dragons. Shurfoam was astonished by Auerbeck's words. Although he had long since known that the Divine Dragons trial wouldn't be simple, it would seem that he had still underestimated it. A Tier 4 Infant Dragon could fight even Tier 5 existences. Yet, he was supposed to face a trial created for Tier 4 Infant Dragons. I will teleport you to the Dragon Temple. Remember, you will not be able to use external tools there. You must rely on your own strength to conquer the trial. If you die within the trial, you will be teleported back here automatically. After saying so, our Beck began chanting an incantation in dragon tongue, generating divine runes around Shurfone one after another. Five seconds later, Shurfone was cocooned in countless golden divine runes. He then transformed into a streak of light and disappeared from the summoning altar, leaving our Beck by itself in the spacious room once more. After briefly getting dazzled by runes, Shurfone gradually recovered his sight and found that he stood before a majestic temple. The temple was tens of thousands of meters tall, and it looked like a huge mountain. Even a dragon would appear tiny in front of this temple, let alone a human. As soon as Shurfone walked up to the thousand meter tall door before him, an ancient and deep voice suddenly rang out in his mind. A human? No, you're not a human. How interesting. Our Beck actually sent you here to take the trial. Along with this voice, the phantom of a gigantic dragon gradually faded into view before Shurfone. This dragon was well over a thousand meters tall, and when it appeared, Shurfone immediately felt stifled. For a moment, he wondered if he was standing before a tier 6 god. It seems that little fellow has a really favorable opinion of you to actually let you take the trial, the dragon said as it looked at your phone. Smiling, it continued, very well. I will abide by the old contract since our Beck has sent you here. You should prepare yourself. You might not be able to pass this trial, but if you do your best, you will still receive great benefits, so make sure to cherish this opportunity. After the dragon finished speaking, your phone found that the view in front of him had changed completely. Now, what was before him wasn't a massive temple but a broken bridge covered in gray mist. Meanwhile, he was currently standing on this broken bridge, and he could vaguely make out land in the distance. The instant the gray mist enveloped him, Shurfone was stupefied. Eternal energy. No. To be precise, its eternal energy condensed into a mist form. The moment the gray mist enveloped Shurfone, his mind felt refreshed like never before. Numerous ideas constantly emerged from the depths of his brain, and he could also view the operating principles of the mana surrounding him with unprecedented clarity. Before Shurfone could recover from his shock, the dragon's deep voice echoed in his mind once more. Repair the broken bridge using mana. So long as you repair one-third of the bridge, you will pass the trial. Your time limit is three days. However, for every 300 meters you progress, the time limit will get extended by an additional day. If you fail to repair one-third of the bridge when your time runs out, you will have failed the trial. When the dragon finished speaking, Shurfone heard rocks breaking off somewhere nearby. Turning toward the sound source, he found that the bridge's broken end was continuously crumbling. At this rate of collapse, let alone three days, the remaining portion of the broken bridge would disappear completely in just a few hours. And once the bridge disappeared, he would plunge into the endless darkness below, 